order for the morning of uh, June 23rd, 2020. Uh, please stand now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible. indivisible. With, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we should kind of do a call roll. Jimenez? Jimenez? Perales? I see he's there. I don't hear a, a here, though. Perales? Yep. Present. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Yamas? Here. Jones? Here. Here. Licardo? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Davis, uh, you please provide an invocation. Thank you. This invocation was written by the Reverend Susan Overland. As the Associate Minister for the Center for Spiritual Living, I'd like to share a recent declaration from my denomination. Centers for Spiritual Living stands with people all around the world who are advocating for justice, equity, inclusion, and peace. We are motivated by our vision of a world that works for everyone, and therefore we affirm with the people of the world that Black lives matter. Not only do black lives matter, but according to our teaching, they are sac sacred. We have confidence that the momentum of support from individuals, along with spiritual and secular organizations, is more than a fleeting moment, but rather the heralding of lasting change. We have confidence that a new era of willingness to engage in the inner work that leads to the end of racism in our world has begun. We have confidence that the unifying cry of our global heart, that Black Lives Matter, has struck a note of urgency in all who hear it. And above all, we have confidence that the power of good that exists in this world is working through us to bring our stated belief in oneness into form in the social, political, judicial, spiritual, and economic realms, and importantly, in our hearts. The recent tragic loss of Black lives in the United States and other countries due to police violence and the myriad inequities that have resurfaced have revealed that our world is still catching up to the vision of a world that works for everyone. We have been called to be brave enough to examine how society can be out of step with its values and how we as individuals can be out of step with our spiritual values. One of our values in Centers for Spiritual Living is love expressing through us as compassion, caring, mutual respect, and kindness. Our organization's purpose is to awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence. What can be more spiritually magnificent than to say a full-hearted yes to this upwelling of affirmation of the sacredness of Black lives? We invite you to stand with Centers for Spiritual Living and the people of the world by affirming with us that Black lives matter so that we may demonstrate the values of our teaching and embrace the emerging universal consciousness of oneness. Dr. Ernest Holmes wrote in Help for Today in 1958, let us therefore light the candle of love, human kindness, forgiveness, and understanding in our soul and let it shine brightly. Let us not peer into the darkness troubled and concerned because, because it is so foreboding, foreboding and unknown. Rather, let us remain steadfast in the radiance of that spiritual light of truth within ourselves. Let us stand guard so that the winds of malice, cross purposes, ignorance, or misunderstanding will not blow out the light. Let us so live each day that the light from our candle of spiritual knowledge will forever be clear and understood not only by ourselves, but by all with whom we come in contact. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Is a new item, extension of proclamation of local emergency related to COVID-19 
it would be a need a two thirds vote to be added under orders of the day. Um, so I ask Nick of the motion to include that. <clears throat> so moved. Motion Second. from Foley, second from Vice Mayor. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza is absent, so I will be skipping her the rest of the meeting. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Camas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, on to the closed session report. Uh, Rick? Yes, Mayor. Uh, we met in closed session this morning. Council met in closed session. Uh, there is no report. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I know the council received a notice on Friday uh, of Rick's uh, long planned uh, retirement. And obviously we'll have much more to say about Rick and his extraordinary service to our city for, for these many years. And I just wanted to say a big thank you, Rick, uh, for, for all that you've done for this community and, and for each of us. I appreciate very much your service. I know we'll have hopefully much more opportunity to, uh, to give you thanks before you send off in August. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we're on to the report of the city manager. Um, of course, have the presentation. Um, I would, again, um, take the chair prerogative to limit speaking time to 15 minutes for each council member. If there is a desire for a contrary limit or no limit at all, please, this would be a good time to make a motion. Uh, Councilmember Pross. I actually just wanted to mention, I think uh, council member Sergio Jimenez messaged me and said he's in the, I think he's a, not a participant or not a panelist at the moment, if he can be added on. Okay, we'll pull him in. Henry, yeah. uh, Henry's working on it now. Hey, this is Tony. I don't see him in attendees. He may have gone to closed session. I'm working on getting him over. Okay, thank you, Tony. Okay, uh, Dave, welcome. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council. Appreciate the opportunity uh, to provide another update. Um, did want to start off, uh, as we do, uh, highlighting some of the great work uh, being done by our staff. Um, and today, wanted to highlight the work of uh, the staff at the uh, Manena San Jose Airport. Um, obviously, very unusual times for an airport, and, and our team's been doing a great job on keeping travelers safe um, as they do essential travel. Um, and really, uh, every team at the airport uh, has been involved with, you know, really changing the way they do work and changing operations to ensure that um, the public and our, our staff are, are safe. Uh, the airport technology team really was responsible for helping uh, all of our employees to be able to, the ones that could uh, work from home um, and really help run the airport from home in some ways. Uh, the facilities and engineering team deployed safety measures throughout the terminals, including doing a lot of deep cleaning, uh, installing plexiglass guards and designing and building um, our own uh, sanitation stations throughout the airport. Uh, the properties team helped maintain uh, relationships and connections with all our partners at the airport. This includes the, the airlines and all the concessionaires. Uh, the planning and development team continued to do the work uh, around moving forward with the master plan that the, uh, the council approved in April. And then the marketing and communications uh, team really did a, a great job of really uh, through social media and other forms, connecting with the public to really instill trust and confidence that our airport is, is safe. And so I uh, really appreciate the work of the team. We have a very short video we're going to show uh, and somebody's gonna help share that with me right now.
So once again, uh, big thanks to our, to our airport team for, for keeping the airport running during this time in a safe manner. Uh, next, I'm gonna hand it over to Kip and Kip is gonna provide a, an update of, of what's happened in the EOC over the last two weeks. If you remember, we didn't give an update last week. Um, also provide an update on, on uh, testing work with the county um, and where we are in terms of looking ahead at uh, the reopening process. Yep. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, City Council, members of the public, Kip Harkness, Director of the Emergency Operations Center, along with Lee Wilcox, my co-director, and representing the approximately 575 people who are actively engaged in emergency operations and response. Uh, we'll give this um, brief report yeah. out on the Emergency Operations Center activities. As always, our work uh, focuses on our roadmap of ensuring compliance with the public health order, continuing our essential city services, supporting those most at risk, and supporting our own people so they can do all of the above. Uh, a couple of highlights, uh, food distribution continues um, as a priority. Uh, overall, we did not have, we are not seeing any major shortages or gaps, which is uh, huge and important. We see an overall 4% decrease actually in the amount of food distributed uh, as demand slows at school sites and senior nutrition sites. Additionally, staff from DOT, PRNS, police, as well as the council offices and the mayor's offices participated in an event with our partners, um, the TAP Foundation, and distributed over 6,000 meals at three locations around San Jose. On the housing front, we've completed design and broken ground at the Rue Ferrari and Evans Lane housing sites. Together, the three housing sites that we're working on represent a total of 228 units with common kitchen, laundry, and other support facilities. So these sites will provide additional short-term shelter to unhoused residents so they can meet statewide and local shelter place orders um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We also, as uh, uh, people know, uh, uh, transitioned out of the uh, trailers and transitioned those residents into uh, uh, motels and other uh, uh, shelter arrangements as appropriate. Um, on the Beautify SJ front and the EOC branch cleanup, we've stood up a, a branch within the Emergency Operations Center that's focusing on, on cleanliness, both around homeless uh, homelessness and campnets, um, and, and as well as uh, the, the protests in downtown, making sure that we're able to keep those areas uh, clean uh, and safe for the people who are there. Uh, and in addition, you'll be hearing later uh, on several items from us um, uh, uh, on the digital inclusion and as well as the extension of the emergency proclamation. Quick update on the county orders. The county orders were updated on the 10th of June. Uh, these orders primarily focus on healthcare providers and to oversimplify, broaden the definition of people who can be tested to um, uh, uh, make sure that all symptomatic people, regardless of um, uh, age, hospitalization status, and others can, can be tested um, and make sure that the healthcare facilities are providing testing essentially for anybody with or without COVID symptoms who are at increased risk. So this mandate from the county is intended to make sure that the existing healthcare providers such as Kaiser and others are pulling their full weight in the testing and that the public testing sites that are stood up that the county is leading and we are supporting on are available primarily then for those who lack healthcare or access to those sorts of facilities. So um, that's the most recent update that went into, uh, issued on June 10th and went into effect on June 15th. So uh, in term, continuing on the theme of testing, uh, as you know, we support the Verily testing at the PAL Stadium, and we have seen the, that testing, those testing numbers rise initially to very promising about 350 a day. And then since the beginning of June, coinciding with the beginning of the protest, we've seen those numbers drop um, and stay lower, more around the 150 uh, a day range. We have a couple of different hypotheses for these. One is uh, perhaps related to the protesting. The other is related to uh, greater availability of other testing sites, including pop-up facilities at La Tropicana and other places that the county has made availability. Um, however, we are doing an enhanced uh, media push to let people know that testing here and in other places is available, it's free, it's asymptomatic, anybody can be tested, and essential workers or people who have been in close contract 
contact or been at the, the protest should go ahead and get themselves tested. But we are concerned that these numbers uh, have dropped. Continuing on on the testing update, we've been in conversations and collaboration with the county around how we support them in their testing mandate. So we provided um, support uh, around messaging to amplify the pop-up locations that they have had, including uh, the one ongoing today, I believe, at the SAP Center. We've promoted testing through first responders, uh, either barely or within their respective health plans. We've provided water and other refreshments at pop-up testing sites when requested. And we're evaluating uh, the ability to support them either through bilingual greeters, expanding some mobile testing, or expanding Verily sites if we can get the number up to a same day walk-in facility. Uh, all of those require us to have some agreements with the county, which we are in conversation with them now about uh, putting those agreements in place. We're also exploring a, a small scale pilot around wastewater testing that might provide useful information on levels of infection in certain neighborhoods or facilities. It's at a very, very preliminary level, um, and uh, we won't know for quite some time whether the data from that pilot will actually be useful as a, as a tool of understanding the progress of the disease. So just to give a sense of what it takes uh, to stand up at the PAL Stadium, in addition to all the good work provided by the Verily folks in the testing, including five on-site uh, medical folks for intake, we are providing traffic uh, through uh, our Department of Transportation staff, about four to five people to ensure the oops, excuse me, safe flow of traffic around that site. And the site operations lead also provided by, by Verily. We're gonna be shifting from city staff, which we will continue for the next two weeks, over to an existing city contract that will take us through about the next 90 days at that site. After that, we will, or during that time, we'll be evaluating our options to see how we might extend it. At this point, the Verily contract with the state expires on the 31st of, of August, and we don't know whether that contract will be extended or not, but we'll be examining our options in the case that that contract is extended so that we can continue to support these important services on the east side of San Jose. One of the things that has also been discussed previously and that we have been evaluating is the possibility for a new site for walk-in same-day tests. Now at the Verily site, you can walk on, but you have to have pre-registered. In order to have same day walk on capacity, you need to have a core of staff available that are um, medically qualified or at least qualified to work under HIPAA regulations and also have the linguistic uh, language abilities to help people register and then get them tested. We believe that while that's possible to do at the PAL Stadium, that would be better done at a site that's more pedestrian friendly and would be better done in collaboration with a community partner. So we have taken the initial steps to put out a potential bid for that. But prior to going out with a bid, we would need uh, clarification and agreement with the county and also direction from the state to Verily to expand. We would then put out the bid to procure a partner, finalize and execute an agreement with that partner and stand up that site. So we are quite a ways out from that. The, the two biggest um, uh, points at this point that are holding us back, one is that we have yet to, to sustain and reach the threshold at the existing site that would allow Verily to expand. And two is that we need a, both agreement with the county and direction from the state to do that expansion once we reach that threshold. But we're doing the research required on what a procurement would look like to provide that if we are able to increase the threshold and both get direction from the state and agreement with the county. We've done some rough estimates of cost, um, and you have a sense here that the weekly cost would be about $25,000. So over a 90-day duration, that's about a $300,000 cost. Part of the reason that we would want to be doing the agreement with the county and clear direction from the state is that would enhance our ability to seek reimbursement from FEMA. It would not guarantee it, but would increase our chances of seeing some of these costs reimbursed. So this would be uh, on an expanded site with a community partner, and this represents the total cost for all of the support that would be needed in addition to the work that is already provided by Verily in their contract with the state. So moving on to a new topic, um, I know all of us are trying to understand and figure out how we're moving back into something resembling normal. We're now officially in what we call stage six in our 10 stage plan. And we have begun to 
reopen a number of city services and we'll be reopening more in the weeks to come. You know about our plans around child care throughout the summer and compliance and, and child recreation in compliance with the orders. And we are evaluating a range of services that we can open up um, and how we can open them up safely. And we'll be doing that in an iterative fashion over the next uh, several weeks and into the summer. So the work of the summer will be both making sure we can do that safely and figuring out the priority of which things are opened up first within our six stages, six, seven, and eight progression, where we now find ourselves squarely in what we call stage six. The framing we have on that is, is this notion that we've found central, which is powered by people. And that we, we, at the heart of it, we need to make sure that our workers who return can do, do so in a way that is safe, healthy, and maintains their well being of the workforce. In order to do that, two wraparound capabilities that we are building is our drive to digital. If you can't hug each other, you can at least hug your computer. Um, and the digital tools that we use have become increasingly more important uh, as meetings like this one demonstrate. And so we need to make sure that as we return to work, we do as much of that work possible remotely, digitally, and safely so that we do not have to, we can minimize the amount of face-to-face -face interactions. Second framing principle around safety is teams. Teams have always been important. They're always core to the work we do. Rarely is anything in the city done by a single individual. It's almost always done as a team. As we move to more digital and more dispersed work groups, we need to pace, place more intentional effort around teams to make sure that they're able to work effectively. And that it's actually more difficult to manage a remote team than it is to manage a team in place. And so we need to be training, skilling, and providing tools and support around not just digital, but also teams as we return to work. And then as you can see in the outer ring, there's a whole host of, of concerns and needed work around engagement, uh, communications, training, data analytics, the tenant improvements, the things you saw with the airport video, everything from the plexiglass to the directional signage, making sure that we're taking into account diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work we do, working with our union partners, continuing to provide personal protective equipment and face coverings, and then new and modified policies that, that are all in alignment with this. Um, got into the weeds a little bit more than we normally do, but I wanted you to understand that this is a body of work uh, led by Kelly Parmalee as the Assistant Director of HR in coordination with our Public Works Department and the EOC that is working through all of these complicated and difficult questions. With that, our work continues. And on behalf of, again, the approximately 575 people fully dedicated to the emergency operations at this point, I want to uh, uh, thank you all who have been part of that work and uh, turn it back over to Dave Sykes, the city manager, and to uh, for any questions or comments that, that uh, you might have as city council and public. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kip, uh, and thank you, team. And Mayor, that concludes our presentation, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Foley. I'm right, sorry, Councilmember Foley, I realize there's some members of the public who would like to speak. You mind if I go to the public first, and I'll come right back to you? By all means. Okay, great. Uh, Tessa? Okay, great. Um, the only way we will ever, uh, you know, we need to fire our electeds. We will, you hear me? Yeah, good. We will never have what we deserve as long as we keep electing bought, corporate owned, billionaire puppets to represent us at every level of our government. They simply won't. We should be joyfully living our lives instead of getting shot at in streets, begging for what we need. We've, we, we need to vote for representatives who share our values. We wouldn't have to be fighting them to do the right thing, vote green. And the issue that I'm having the most problem with is your airport. To say that you're supporting the airport, and you're going to make it safe, and we're spending money to get people back into the airport. The airport is why we got pandemic. That is why the, the research has shown that the flying from Europe to New York and then New York across our country is what caused the pandemic to spread in two days. And we are not addressing that. We are expanding our airport to make money. It's all about economic growth, to get that money from the federal government. And that is wrong. We are not supposed to be doing that. We need to always be addressing our four crises, which are climate, ecological collapse, pandemic, pollution, and housing. And, you, and, and expanding the airport has nothing to do with that. And every, I really appreciated uh, the issue of digitizing our community and making sure we go that way.
but the issue of the airport is not where we need to go. In terms of climate crisis, the research is showing now, we have six months to turn things around is what the research is showing right now. And going back to business as usual is the worst thing we can do. We've made the strides. The reason why we made the strides is under COVID-19 is because we stopped flying, we stopped driving, we stopped the movement of goods, and we've got to keep that going so that we can live on planet Earth because our, ex our extinction is in the balance right now. Thank you. Uh, Modo? G. Hi, um, I was calling about two different things. Uh, one is the loss of the trailers. Um, it's just sketchy as hell that the trailers, that the people are evicted from the trailers was with less than a week's notice. And it happens on the same day that the summer camp opens at Happy Hollow. Um, there's just so many questions about this whole thing that make it just seem shady. And no matter how many times it's explained in media or by housing, it just, none of it seems to add up. And what does add up is that it was supposed to be housing for at least 90 people. And now it turned out to be, I think, 37 people. And now they're in hotels and that these trailers are just sitting there being unused. So I do hope that maybe there's an effort to maybe let the county take over the trailers um, it's curious that the people at the Bascom Owl were told at the end of May that the trailers were fine um, and that there was no problem with them. Um, and the only problems were that the developer for Parkside uh, really wanted the Parkside shelter shut down as soon as possible so that they could develop and that Happy Hollow just wanted the trailers gone as soon as possible so that they could open. And voila, the trailers are going to disappear. Um, so it's just curious. Suddenly the trailers were fine in the end of May and now they're not fine. My other thing that I want to point out is Beautify SJ. Sure, you know, it's called a different name, but it sure looks like sweeps to the people who end up having nothing left after Beautify SJ comes through. Because the people who just had this happen yesterday are saying that it was a sweep, that they have nothing left. So I'm curious if somebody could get back to me. Most people know who I am and they know my email please get back to me and explain to me how it's not a sweep to the people who have nothing left. Thanks, bye. Blair? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking public comment at this time. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to remind that uh, in our new era of COVID-19, uh, back in mid-March, uh, there was a council meeting, uh, one of the early virtual council meetings that uh, Councilperson Perales, uh, he made a really interesting, nice point that, you know, if we work well, you know, we can use the ideas of equity to basically shape a major part of, of how our future budget's gonna work for the next couple of years. And it just really brought to my mind just really good ideas about how we can think about equity and uh, the budget with the COVID-19 uh, issues. and how we think and direct our, our, ourselves, it's important at this time. And it's possible we can work towards good policy ideas. In that same meeting, um, Deb Davis mentioned that, that uh, Mayor Licardo is actually gonna try to work COVID-19 budget ideas towards deficit reduction ideas, which in itself is awesome. <laughs> it's incredible, uh, really good, uh, I guess, fiscal responsibility and just responsibility to, to be able to work and think in those terms. And uh, it gave me a lot of hope uh, in how we, how we can be working. So I wish you luck uh, in those efforts. Um, you know, with, with the, the work of digital inclusion at this time, uh, you know, really, you know, it's important stuff. Please consider in bridging the digital divide, how there can be accountability and to really watch what we're, we're doing with technology at this time and um my other my other point is can you explain at some time in the meeting today when we can expect to hear item uh 8.1 uh, so i can be prepared and at what time uh yeah and i guess that's about it for myself thank you uh i'm sorry i'm having difficulty finding the participants so um 
There we go. Uh, the person who is has the phone number ending 7235, again, 7235. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Mary Blanco and I'm a business representative for Operating Engineers Local 3. I represent a bargaining unit of 750 trade employees. I am here today to ask that the city extend administrative leave for high-risk individuals. I have been able to identify approximately 20 employees in this bargaining unit who fall into this category. Ending administrative leave for these individuals will force these members to return to work and risk being exposed to COVID-19. The CDC has identified high-risk individuals as people over the age of 65 or having a serious medical condition such as heart disease, diabetes, asthma, and other conditions. Here's a sample of the employees the city would be bringing back. Member A is 68 years old, 20 years with the city, has diabetes and hypertension. Member B is 78 years old, 19 years with the city, hypertension and asthma. Member C, 48 years, 30 years with the city, asthma and diabetes. Member D, 64 years old, five years with the city, he takes Humira, a medication that suppresses his immune system. I hope I can appeal to your compassionate side when asking you to extend administrative leave for high-risk individuals. But there is also a practical side. What is the cost of several weeks in ICU? That is a likely scenario for high-risk individuals. How would that affect the city's medical premiums? I am asking that you extend administrative leave for high-risk individuals citywide. It is a small number, and I don't think this is a big ask, and doing so could prevent a tragedy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Patrick? Hi, you hear me all right? Welcome. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thanks for recognizing me. My name's Pat Rostock. I live in District 2. Uh, I was unsure when best to make my comment because it's already been discussed at this meeting, albeit in a closed session. I'm certain that the members of the council are more than aware of the calls for sweeping police reform all over the nation and particularly loudly in the Bay Area. One of the most significant barriers to the type of transformational changes that are being demanded is the contractual relationship between cities and their police unions. I, I, I'm sorry, we're, that's, not, that's not on the... It's not on this item, and I'm not sure it's on this agenda. You're certainly welcome to speak in public comment, but right now we're just focused on the same Andrews report. Fair enough. Uh, thank you. Um, Devin? Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. This is the first time I'm attending a city council meeting, so I hope it's not the last, and I appreciate the time to talk. Um, as I don't know if this is relevant to the item on the table, but concerning COVID and the reopening of business, I'm very sympathetic and understanding that especially the small and medium sized businesses need to open that these are, you know, folks whose livelihood depend on the, the, the success of their business, restaurants, um, retail, etc. What I am not hearing is any plans to enforce or any plans to really advocate the continuing use of social distancing, the six foot rule and masks in public. If you go out today, it's a free for all. You go to downtown Willow Glen, you go to downtown San Jose, you go to any place that has a high congregation of restaurants and retail, especially those small medium sized businesses, you will see people ignoring the social distancing, ignoring the markers put down, and masks are either nowhere to be seen, up around their head, around their neck, in their hands. Um, it's highly problematic. So I feel if we are going to take steps to open back up, which I look forward to and everyone looks forward to, we need to make sure that we are diligent and safe when doing so. Otherwise, we are going to have a major step backwards and all the places that we are wanting to see open and running again are going to be closed. And personally, they cannot take another downturn. They cannot take another close. So if we cannot also do anything to enforce and also get the chief of police and sheriff's department to help us enforce these whether it be the same as a speeding ticket or the same as a seat belt violation um i i can't hear you i don't know if you're talking to me sam um but uh right i i think that that's something that needs to be addressed and taken into serious consideration thank you sir matt 
Hi, uh, my name is Matt Mason. I'm the union rep for IFPTE Local 21. And I'm just one to speak uh, in support of Mary Blanco and the other city employees who've been um, utilizing the administrative leave policy um, uh, for the uh, hardships that they are um, going through right now. I think we're only down to a couple of dozen folks who are in situations where um, for one reason or another, mostly either health conditions or extreme childcare hardships, uh, we've been working with department heads and other supervisors to find accommodations. These folks want to come back to work. They want to work. Some of them are in situations that they're having to make very difficult choices between putting themselves or their family at risks or coming back to work um, or burning through their earned time. We've been trying to work with the city manager's office and we hope to continue to do so to find the accommodations for these folks. But I just wanted to remind or ask the council and the city manager's office again um, to please uh, work on extending the administrative leave for a period of time while we work with them and their departments for the um, very small amount of employees who are in these extreme uh, circumstances so we can find accommodations so they can return to some level of work safely um, and avoid um, either injuring themselves or spreading COVID uh, to others. Thank you very much. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending uh, 7742. Yes, this is item 3.1. Hello, yes. Mayor and City Council members. My name is David Day, and I've worked for the city for over 30 years, uh, 25 of them full time. I'm a gardener with PRNS. I'm talking to you today to ask for you extend administrative leave for city employees that are considered high risk. Additionally, um, the numbers of people going to the hospital lately has gone up 16%. ICU patients are up 11%. I last checked, there was more than 170,000 confirmed coronavirus cases in California, with more than 5,500 fatalities reported. Over the most recent weekend alone, 3,574 people were hospitalized Saturday statewide. The Golden State also reported the most new cases in a single day, 4,515 since the pandemic started. Governor Newsom says we might be in reverse of opening businesses and going back to stage one. Uh, because of my high risk status, I was placed on administrative leave in March. I've been informed that the administrative leave will be terminated and the end of this at the end of this month. Um, the terminated, the administrative leave will force me to choose between my health, uh, possibly my life, ability to pay my bills. I am 48. I have diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, and it's making me and my family higher risk for suffering complications of the coronavirus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the, the caller with the phone number 5140. Yeah, can you guys hear me over there? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I just wanna know when you're gonna stop enforcing the mask policy at public parks. Chief Garcia said he wasn't going to uh, enforce this and the park police are, are out citing people for thousand dollar fines with a mask. I find that unacceptable. And the park police are not under uh, the control of San Jose PD, they should be, and they're not. And I also want to know why the public pools aren't going to be open and they need to be open with the heat that we have. There's no excuse why the pools can't be open. And I also want to give a shout out to the employees who picked up uh, some illegally dumped tires in my neighborhood. I called uh, the uh, 311. They were able to arrange it because the 311 app is no good. Um, it doesn't work. I've, I used to use it when it was my San Jose. It doesn't work anymore. I recommend people to call 311 or other phone numbers. And the staff that answers is working from home, doing a, a really, a really great job. And uh, I, I just, I can't say enough about these parks and these, and these fascistic park police. Uh, and I also believe you got to free the uh, picnic tables. Get the crime tape off the picnic tables. It's disgusting. Thank you. Uh, the phone number ending in 2768, welcome. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. My name is uh, Ruben Carrillo, and I have worked for the City of uh, San Jose since September 2007 as a maintenance worker one, and I am part-time benefited. I am here today to ask that you extend administrative leave for city employees that are considered high risk. I've been on administrative leave since uh, March, and I've been informed that uh, the leave will be terminated at the end of June. Um, I am 65 years of age, and my wife is also um, a senior citizen, and uh, we're both Hispanic and um, in a high-risk category. So uh, that makes us more susceptible for suffering the complications of the coronavirus. And as someone stated earlier, uh, very few people are wearing masks uh, anymore and we're going to be working um, when we return to work in uh, the heart of downtown san jose and with the homeless and everybody out there that's uh, really even more of a high risk for us so i'm asking you that uh, you would uh, seriously consider extending it thank you very much thank you sir thank you for your service Okay, returning to council for questions, and before we do, um, uh, Dave, if I could just ask if, you know, if someone on your team could just uh, notify, I think there's going to be a fair number of questions about administrative leave and high-risk employees, and if, if there's someone who could respond to some of those concerns and questions, and also on the issue of trailers, um, not asking now, I know we'll get into the conversation, but I, just, I know if no one else asks, I'll be asking, so just to ask if maybe folks could be um, uh, made available. Uh, uh, certainly, and I, I can, if you like, I can start on the administrative leave now, okay. if you'd like. Sure. Um, and, um, Jennifer can kind of jump in. So um, as, as you all know, we, we um, offered administrative leave from the very beginning um, to uh, really all of our employees that we were unable to kind of uh, uh, have a plan for working. Obviously, over time, uh, we've been able to integrate the safety measures and the work from home provisions and, and many other measures in terms of our operations. So we've actually been able to bring a, a great deal of the workforce back into um, the work environment that may not always be, you know, in, in a, um, a location at, at City Hall, for example, or it could be, you know, uh, working from home. Um, so we've been able to uh, really, uh, I think, get to a point where there's just um, um, a few number of employees that remain on administrative leave. And really, there's been three, I think, reasons for that. Um, certainly, you heard today um, from some of the employees that are in the high risk category. Um, and we've also been focusing on another group of employees that have child care issues. And then I think there's a third group of employees that um, we've not been able to kind of marry up any work for them. Um, and so, as I said, this is a pretty small number of employees in each group. Um, on the child care issue, I think we're working on and, and are offering uh, child care options to our employees um, and also looking at uh, how we can provide child care options for children with special needs uh, to make sure that we're covering all those bases. Um, we had a, a really productive meeting with the unions on, on Friday and kind of worked through some of those, those details on kind of how do we narrow this down? And certainly we don't want anyone coming to work in an unsafe environment. And so all, all of the operations that we have in place for our workforce um, uh, they're doing those operations in a safe uh, uh, manner. And certainly if they see safety issues, um, they, they know they need to bring those forward so we can address them. And, you know, we had a lot of learning to do, especially in the beginning. And, you know, I appreciate Mary's comments and, and Mary shared some stories with me uh, from kind of early on in the process where, you know, we, we, you know, we, we took us a while to kind of figure some things out. But I, I do think that, um, you know, as Kip mentioned earlier, the safety of our employees is the number one concern for us, and, and we have an environment that we're very open to hearing from our employees if they see anything unsafe. You know, I think, I think the issue of the high-risk employees presents, you know, um, 
uh, some challenges for us to be able to kind of marry up work uh, for employees in the high risk category. Um, you know, at this point, it, it's, we, we uh, are, have not um, mandated that any employee come back to work. Um, and so um, really what we've been going through is a set of process to see if we can find work for those employees that uh, feel the need to stay at home. Um, I think we agreed with the unions. We, we can't offer administrative leave for, uh, uh, you know, on, on an undetermined amount of time. We're going to have to figure out a way to, to, to allow all of our workforce uh, to be able to, um, to do their work um, in a way that's safe. So we're still working through some of those issues um, at this point um, and still kind of factoring in all the input that we're getting from from the unions um, on this. And, um, you know, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to work all of that out. Thanks, Dave. Councilmember Fulton? I think you're still muted, Councilmember Fulton. Whoops. How's that? <laughs> you're, you're good now. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for the report. I, I really appreciate these uh, weekly updates on the EOC and our COVID response. I have some questions, but before I do, I want to first thank uh, Chris Rogers with TAP Together Assisting People and uh, Kendrick Bourne with the San Francisco 49ers through his foundation, Bourne Blessed Foundation, who don't uh, generously donated approximately 6,000 boxes of produce last Saturday that was distributed at Cal Stadium and other locations. I am grateful for the work that uh, initiated through my chief of staff, Scott Hughes, but through Chris Rogers and then through the mayor's office and the EOC that we were able to coordinate that distribution and uh, distribute really a huge amount of produce to folks living in that neighborhood. So I am truly grateful for that. I thank you to Kendrick Bourne's foundation and to Chris Rogers and to all the staff at PRNS and my office and also council member Esparza and Carrasco's offices who were involved. Additionally, the mayor was there handing out boxes along with myself and council member Esparza. It was truly an uplifting opportunity to distribute food in an area that is hard hit by COVID. And it was, uh, it just felt so good to finally get out and do something really positive and uh, successful for our community. So thank you for all that were involved in that. I think many of us stayed longer than we thought because it was such a rewarding experience, really the level of diversity there and the music that was playing, it was just an awesome, tremendous event. So thank you all who were involved in that. Um, just a few questions uh, that mirror some of the questions that were asked by the public, but one in relation to food distribution. Kip, I noticed that the school districts are no longer distributing, so who, or, or that's what I had heard. So who is taking over the distribution from the school districts, since that was a big portion of the heavy lift? I, I think they're shifting to summer food mode, which means that some will and some won't. So I, I don't know if, if Angel is on the phone, uh, on the phone, on the Zoom and can add in more detail. Um, doesn't, not sure that he is queued up here today. So let me uh, let me follow up with you. Follow up with that question uh, and see yeah. if we can get Angel on board very quickly. I believe I believe we're shifting to summer feeding mode. So some of the schools will continue to be summer feeding sites uh, throughout the summer. Is is typically how it works, and we're okay. building on that infrastructure. Are we still distributing? 2.6 million meals or has that decreased? It's decreased by 4%. So we're still in the 2.6 million range because I think it was up to 2.8 million before. So it's, it's uh, but we've seen a slight decrease in the last week. Is that a decrease in the demand then or just availability? We've seen no gaps in meeting the need. So we believe that uh, it may be a shift uh, of a few different things, but we do not believe at this point that it represents uh, a gap between the, the need uh, supply and demand. We'll keep a tight eye on that, but at this point we have no indications of people facing food insecurity that aren't able to get food. Wonderful, well, that's good to know. So that even though our 
distribution numbers made decreasing that people still have access to the food they need. We're not, we're not turning anyone away without getting the food they need. Correct. Wonderful. That's, that's wonderful to hear. With regards to our community centers, I know they're all closed uh, and I've had conversations with you, Dave, on the uh, community centers, but uh, several people had questions about the pools. I know this, can you give us some background on when we might expect or what is the trigger for opening up our community centers and pools? Dave, do you want me to take that at first? Yeah. So many of our community centers and pools are going to be, are used currently for uh, two uses, which will continue throughout the summer. One is a number of them that are still serving for expanded sheltering uh, needs for the unhoused residents. And then the second, which I, I believe two weeks ago, a week ago, I'm losing track of time. Uh, we provided an update on uh, child recreation and summer programs. So because of the need to pod uh, children in a smaller group and the need to have um, a dedicated staff who do not rotate out, we will be using many of the remaining community facilities and libraries to provide that summer recreation and child care over the course of the summer. So the reopening up of community centers and libraries as, as, uh, as community centers and libraries is precluded at this moment by both of those uses. So until we demobilize the sheltering facilities and until we're out of the summer uh, child recreation business, we won't have any extra capacity to really open up many city services around the um, uh, uh, around the question of pools we did not anticipate the reopening of pools and so we do not have the staff hired to run the aquatics programs that we would normally have at this time and have instead been placing our effort from a parks and rec standpoint um, uh, into the large-scale feeding operation uh, we have a couple of hundred people who are deployed with the feeding operation um, and and also a large number who are deployed with the sheltering operation. The vast majority of those comes from our parks and recreation staff who would be otherwise staffing those. And, and again, uh, I was caught a little bit by surprise by the opening of the pools. And so we had not anticipated that function would be opened as soon as it was. And so we're not in a position right now to be opening those pools for recreational swimming. And it, those who know more about this might might add more color, but that's top line where I understand that we're at. Okay, so specifically about the pools, I had heard that it was manpower related. Is it possible that we could hire lifeguards? Uh, I mean, I would imagine there's young people who are certified as lifeguards out there looking for work. Is there is that the only thing standing in our way from opening the pools? Uh, no, the other, there's a lot of, you know, these, um, the way I would describe it is it's, it's about a stack rank prioritization of what we can do. So the answer is yes, we could open the pools and we could provide staffing, but at this point it falls behind uh, a number of priorities. For example, uh, figuring out the questions that the city manager was just talking about on administrative leave. That's a top priority of making sure that we can get people reassigned. Other top priorities are content continuation of the feeding. Um, efforts and the the shift of those feeding efforts over time, the the homeless sheltering. So it's it's possible to do it, but at this point, that would require us to stop doing something else or reprioritize. And so I think at this point, um, given how late we are in the season, that the the recommendation is that we not try to take on that additional responsibility, given how many other things those staff um, that are managing it are already doing. Because essentially, we have staff who are running EOC operations, helping re-stand up the, the summer child care, and also thinking about you know refitting City Hall and the return to work. And so we we don't really have the leadership bandwidth necessarily to do that unless we reprioritize. Okay. And council member, if I could just add, and I think Kip, you know, I, I think, you know, all of those uh, reasons that Kip just gave, I think are completely valid. Um, I do know that the, the, the rules for opening pools have a tremendous amount of limitations involved with them. And so it might be worthwhile if we look at some of those just to kind of, of the council understand there were some real, even if all those issues that Kip described went away, um, as I understood it, some of the, the, the kind of the rules and requirements around pool opening really made 
uh, you know, programming pretty challenging. And I see Cicerelli, John is on the yeah. line, but I think there's, there's, there's a whole set of rules that look, that would really mean that we probably wouldn't be able to offer the normal services that we would offer. Uh, and the budget. I just been reminded that we did in fact suspend a budget. So John, uh, you can give us some more, some more depth and details. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Councilmember Foley. John Cicerelli, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. Two things. One, yes, we let go of the budget as a cost savings this year with all the uncertainty that we had, but there is a little bit of hope. We do have some operators, some vendors um, who are interested in operating the pools. So at no expense to the city, they, they may be able to open two or three of these pools. So we're working through some negotiations with them right now, but as Dave talked about, the, the opening is pretty strict and what you can do is fairly strict. It's not like all the kids jump in and have free time in the pool. It's not gonna be that kind of an activity. It's more gonna be for exercise, um, but we are trying to figure that out with a vendor. It, it's unlikely we'll get vendors to open all of our pools, but we may get them to open some of our pools. Okay, I just wanna put in a plug for Camden Community Center for activating that pool when you're looking at uh, potentially a guinea pig pool to open up. The, the, the difficulty with the pools is messaging to our community that many of them really depend on that as a form of exercise. And I know that Campbell has opened up their pools very strictly as it relates to exercise, 18 or older, so it's not for recreational use at all. It, John, as you said, it's it's more for uh, getting some a workout in. Uh, but how we message that, anything you can do to help us with messaging, because our community is a little frustrated that uh, they're not, is this my time that I have left? <laughs> that, that they're not able to access their pool. So since I only have four more minutes, I'm gonna move on to my issues, um, not issues, just questions. So thank you for the information about the pools. The other question I had was about the extended leave. Is there a process for someone to appeal the extended leave uh, provision as it relates to them? Does the contract allow for that? So council member, just to um, remind you, so we, we offered uh, administrative leave really at the, the manager's discretion. Um, and we offered, it was really ba basically a blanket um, admin leave for everybody. Um, what we're now talking about is really refining that. And I think we're well beyond the kind of the blanket uh, approach. And, and obviously we're, we're dealing with fairness issues to the whole workforce, those that are are working. Um, and so we're kind of balancing those things out. But as I said, the, the, the discussion with the unions was very pr productive as we're Jennifer's team working on it. And we're starting to kind of narrowing it down to these now very small buckets. Okay. And how do we move from kind of a, a, a blanket kind of approach to specific approaches to address specific needs? And that's kind of what we're working through right now. And so it's not a, an item that we, it's, it's, it's part of kind of the contract negotiations or anything like that. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then finally, the last uh, question I have has to do with the Alfresco program. That's a wonderful program, by the way. You see restaurants who have popped up their outside uh, facilities in tremendous uh, ways and are very creative and open and it's wonderful to actually go out and have a meal outdoors. It feels good to get out of the house. But some of them are complaining, or I would say frustrated, about not being able to serve alcohol and how they uh, are able to navigate that through ABC. Is there anything we can do to assist them in that regard? You know, Councilmember Foley, I can provide an update just to save you time because I know you'll have other questions. I'm happy to provide an update to the council. Uh, oh, okay, actually, that was my last one. Oh, okay. I didn't <laughs> want to with my response. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I understand that that is uh, that issue is frankly stuck between the county and the state right now, uh, and we've been working diligently. I know Blage and a lot of folks on the city side, Kelly Clown and our team. Uh, I've been trying to unstick it. Um, the The county, I understand, is uh, going to announce, well, is going to tell the Board of Supervisors something today that will tell them whether or not they're able to resolve it. If not, I've been told by the, the Board uh, President, uh, 
uh, Supervisor Chavez that she will essentially uh, urge a vote to uh, get through this logjam. And I won't bore you with all the details, but it has to do with the, the difference between the state requirements that the county move into the second, the extended second phase of opening and the county is not able to do that or not willing. And it, it's a, um, frankly, a complex issue I don't pretend to fully understand. Uh, but we have reached out to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and trying to get his staff on board and uh, they're trying to ensure their uniform rules statewide. And so it is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. You know, don't, don't get me wrong, our restaurants are very thrilled that they can open up to some level, but of course, alcohol sales help increase their profitability at this time. And so anything we can do to help. Yeah. Thank you. That's the end of my, re my questioning. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member uh, uh, Carrasco. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I, I'd like to ask a few questions regarding the testing uh, and specifically Vera Lee. Uh, this is probably uh, uh, addressed to Kip. Kip, if we could go back to your presentation. Um, and I, I, I couldn't tell you which slide it is, but it was, uh, it had the, the little graphs, the little bar graphs. Yep, getting there. Can you turn just, to that? Uh, Oops, uh, yes I can, just one second. I just yeah, uh, thank you. touched the wrong thing here. All right. Oops, sorry, just a second. I was at the end of the slide deck. <laughs> Technical issues, error, user error. Just one second, council member. Don't run out my clock, Kip. I'm sorry, it was not intentional. There we go. Okay, got it. Run off the clock. There we go. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm concerned because I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, it it takes a magic crystal ball to figure out why those uh, numbers are going down. They're going down around June second. Is where where I'm what I'm looking at. Right. And I don't know what that necessarily coincides with, but um, but uh, you know, are the hours still the same, nine to three? Yeah, the the hours haven't changed. The the format of operation hasn't changed. So we have the same question. So, so let's let let me let me stop you there. So let's recap. The format is still registration online. Correct. Correct. Uh, Nine to three. I believe that's correct, yes. And no on-site registration or same day registration. Correct. And there is, it's primarily auto-oriented. You can walk onto the site, though it's not primarily focused for that if you've pre-registered. So it's okay. primarily auto-oriented, pre-registered online traffic only. Correct. And when and when I look at the days when they were at capacity, I only see really four days when they were reaching capacity. Yeah, correct. So, so those four days are really the, the, uh, the outliers, uh, not the norm. Correct. We saw the trend line go up and then we see the trend line go down. So that's not, to me, that's not really a trend. The trend to me is really everything else. And this is the outlier. So I'm, I'm trying to get to hmm. this. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, uh, that this has been, uh, in my opinion, uh, just a real issue at PAL when PAL really should be at capacity every single day. So before I, before I get there though, let, let's talk about James Lick. Has James Lick been at capacity? I, I don't know. Okay. We don't have the numbers for James Lick? Uh, no, I, I, city has not is not directly run that site or support it. So the, the county has those numbers and I don't happen to have them uh, available to me. Okay, could could we get those numbers next time you do the presentation? I know that we're we're not directly related to them, but I think it would be real helpful to just look at the difference and see if uh, if what they're doing is different than what we're doing, and whether that makes a difference. And what about the county, the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds? How are they doing? I don't know. Uh, and and it's run by by Vera Lee as well, right? Correct, and that one is um, supported operationally by the county. So I can request the numbers from the county for the various sites, yeah. if, I, if that I, would be useful. 
I'd like to see that. So, so my concern is the following: is that um, that palace is uh, in the middle of an area that is of huge concern to to all of us, to many of us, and uh, and we've done a lot to promote it. But nine to five doesn't work for a community that has been filled uh, and is read. Uh, it's is a is a home to. Uh, many of our essential workers, which means that our essential workers have not stopped working. And nine to five makes it nearly impossible for our essential workers to get there. And, uh, and when I was there, I didn't see a lot of my essential workers in line to, uh, to go and get tested. In fact, I saw a lot of folks that were coming out of the area, which is fine, perfectly fine as long as we're getting people tested. But uh, as, Dr., as Dr. Marty said, you know, we can have 4,000 uh, tests uh, done, but if we're not getting them laser beam focused on the, in the areas that are most affected, it, you know, uh, what good is that, right? So again, my, the biggest issue that I've had from the very beginning is that nine to five makes it, I mean, nine to three makes it nearly impossible for the working class person or the essential worker to get in there and get tested. It's unfriendly schedule for the individual who really does need to get the test done. Uh, you know, 7 a.m. would be much better uh, to 7 p.m., right? And if we needed to gut the mid, uh, that mid-day uh, uh, hour, I'd gut it. I would do 7 to 10. I would do 3 to 7. That's what I would do and, we, and see whether or not that works. But, um, but I don't have control over that. And then the other is I tried to, to uh, register for a, I, I had my entire, my entire team tested because we're out there a lot more often now. And so I've been tested now three times uh, and I could not, my, my uh, Francis was able to get tested at PAL. It took her four days to get a test result. Um, I could not uh, get registered at PAL no matter what I tried to do. Um, they kept telling me that I could get registered okay, through a different, um, a different email. And I tried doing it with a different email. Then it kept uh, uh, rerouting me to a Gmail. I hate using Gmail, but it kept rerouting me to my son's email. It kept rerouting me to my ex-husband's email. And then I had to create a, uh, another Gmail account uh, it did everything that I wanted to do. Then it rerouted me to an experimental uh, paid website. And I just could not get out of that no matter how much I tried. Then I, we did it through another. Anyway, you get the point. At the end of the day, I was never able to register through PAL. So you can only imagine my frustration. And, and uh, if I'm frustrated, imagine other folks who have a limited language abilities or, uh, or, or just uh, are in the same kind of predicament that I'm in who have limited computer abilities um, who are just gonna give up. So I've just been very frustrated with this site and I'm not sure how to take care of this, uh, these uh, ongoing barriers, but if we don't have same day on-site registration, we're never going to see the capacity uh, that we're hoping to, and we're not going to to meet the goals that we'd like to meet. But uh, in addition to that, I, I just don't think that it's culturally, um, I don't think it's culturally uh, adequate uh, in terms of messaging or in terms of, uh, of the kind of uh, service that it provides. So here's the question I have. What do we need to do to expand the hours? I know I keep asking this every single week, so I'm gonna ask you again. What do we need to do to expand the hours? Don't tell me that we need to meet capacity because we're just not, we're not gonna meet capacity. So let's, let's give up on that question. So beyond meeting capacity, what do we need to do to expand the hours, get on site, same day registration, beyond the same criteria that you've been telling me every, every week, I wanna go beyond that. What do I need to do to get that so that we can meet, I wanna work backwards so that we can meet capacity. How do I expand the hours? How do I get on site same day registration? 
the first thing, thank you, council member. Um, the first thing that we'd have to do is we would have to get uh, agreement with the county um, to include us in and direct us to uh, working with Verily. We do not have a legal formal relationship with Verily, which is, puts us in a difficult position because we cannot direct them to do anything. Um, and we've simply been providing uh, traffic operations at the, si and the site and the traffic operations for them to provide their operations. We can certainly have a discussion about shifting the hours um, and, and seeing if those hours would work. We could put forward uh, an, an RF or a bid to provide the additional services that would be required to do the same day. We estimate that that's about five or six people that we would need to hire. We do not have the people who have those capabilities in-house, um, nor do we have a funding source identified. And without an agreement with the county, we do not have a reimbursement path forward. So we can, um, so in order to move forward, the first step would be to get a, an agreement with the county um, between directing us to be in coordination with Verily. The next step would be for us, if, if we desired to put out a bid for a contractor or a community group that could provide the same day registration. Um, previously, we had thought that that would be an additional site. We can do that at this site. There is nothing precluding that, though it is more auto-oriented use than a walk-up oriented use. But in order to do that, we need to put uh, those services out for bid um, and identify a funding source. Okay, so here's an idea. So what if we, it, it's a crazy notion, I get it, but what if we were to let this contract expire or we were to terminate this contract and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and use one of our community care clinics instead? We could, so, a, a slight clarification, we don't have any contract with Verily, so we could certainly cease the operations at any time because we're providing the site for them. So we could stop providing the site. We could, and, and this is the, um, let me see if I can move my slide to the, to the right one here. Um, if we were to do a community partner, that would be this path, agreement with the county, procuring a partner, um, uh, finalizing and executing an agreement and standing up the site. Can you share the screen again? We're not able to see it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I stopped sharing. In a, let me let me drag it back for you here. Sorry. So, in order to stand up a community partner with somebody, this is with Verily as the backup partner. We could do the same and have somebody provide the testing, but that would be uh, require. Uh, if we were to do this with Verily, would require both an agreement with the county and direction from the state for Verily to expand, a procurement process for a partner, finalizing and executing that agreement, and then standing up the site. If we were to do that without Verily as a partner, we would need to broaden that um, the procurement process to include the medical testing, um, and then we'd also have to identify a funding source. Without the medical testing, which for us is provided through the state contract with no cost to the city, we estimate that the daily cost, or excuse me, the weekly costs to do that are about 25,000. So if you add in medical testing on top of the, the 25,000 for operations of the site, it would be 25,000 a week plus whatever that number is. I don't have an estimate for that. So the path forward would be to do a procurement, to find that partner, and then to, to begin to stand that site up in operation. Uh, did you say this is the cost to the city? Uh, this is the cost to the city Estimated cost to the city per week, $25,000 a yeah. week, if we have Verily as a medical provider, um, if we hire a community partner to work with them at a new site. If it's a new site without Verily, this cost will go up. Okay, but but the community don't the community care clinics have uh, an ability to pull down funding themselves to provide this kind of service? There are different funding sources for this and different community clinics have opened with different funding sources. For example, Antioch uh, the Church has, Roots has an operation going where they're providing uh, free walk up same day testing to folks very much in the model that you're talking about. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the model that we would look at. They have obviously have been able to tap into a funding source. So if, if we were to put out an RFP, uh, part of that would be to reach out to folks like Roots who are already doing this and seeing if they could expand to other locations. But I'm not familiar with all of the sources of funding that are available or not available to testing. That's part of why we would hire a partner um, who knew this work to see what was available. So I, 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 I would imagine um, 
even if they are able to get reimbursements for the test, there is likely a pass through on costs for the staffing that they're going to want to pass through to us. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I think it's worth having a conversation with our community care clinics to see what is their what is in their purview, what is uh, uh, what is their capacity currently, what can they draw upon? I don't know what the the answers are to that. I know that they sit on my. Uh, 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 health equity task force. This is what they're talking about is uh, being part of, of these solutions and being put to work uh, and, uh, and addressing these issues. They want to uh, do some of these pop-ups, but maybe giving them an opportunity to be, uh, have a more uh, stable solution. I think it's worth a conversation, Kip. My, my frustration is uh, is expecting to be at capacity when we're not offering the community uh, opportunities for them to participate uh, with all these barriers. And my community is one that uh, has to be at work. They, they can't stay home. They're essential workers, but we have to get them to work in a, in a safe way because we know that they're going to be the hardest hit. They've been the hardest hit, and uh, and and uh, and they're going to open up their businesses. They're going to go back to work one way or the other. And so I have a, a, a responsibility to get them to work in the safest way possible. I don't think it's one or the other uh, that they either they stay home or they go back to work uh, and they do it in an unsafe manner. I think that they they slowly go back to work, but they go back to work in the safest way possible. And what we know is testing, testing, testing. And, uh, and if you don't test once, you're gonna test, you know, uh, the recommendation at this point is at least twice a month. And, uh, but, but we're setting up barriers where, you know, they, it, it's so complicated for them to test at PAL, which should be the easiest way for them to test. And right now people are getting through that line in less than three minutes. That's how many folks are waiting in line, there's absolutely nobody waiting in line. In three minutes, you can get from one end to the the uh, to the end um, to get tested. So anyway, so that's so um, I, I like to set up a, a a call or or set something up so that you can have a conversation and see if there's other options for us so that we can get folks uh, uh, back to work, but in a safe. Uh, in the safest way possible, and, and testing is going to be the, one of the one of the first critical steps. Uh, and and if Vera Lee isn't willing to play ball, if they're not willing to take down those barriers, I don't know what other. I really don't know what other choice we have. They're sitting there with an empty parking lot. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Two concrete things that I've taken out of this um, uh, at the top of my list are really doing a, what I call a plus minus delta. What's working, what's not, what do we need to do differently? Uh, specifically on the PAL site with Verily um, to, to examine the questions that you've raised of hours and participation. And then the other one very concretely is requesting the overall numbers from, from the county. On the question of what we can do, again, I would just say there are a number of things we can do. We believe in order for us to have the best chance to qualify for FEMA reimbursement, we need to do this in coordination with the county. So we've, I've reached out, had good conversations with Marty, Dr. Marty finster scheib around this, but there are a couple of, of, of barriers that we need to overcome in terms of agreements with the county on how we work together so that we maximize our chance of reimbursement and not put the, the general fund unnecessarily at risk. So yeah. I, I appreciate very much your your comments and your continued advocacy for this very important group to receive testing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kip. I'm going to beg my uh, my colleagues indulgence for a moment. I, I think this issue is so important. I want to jump in here as well. If I could throw in some more questions. Yeah. Kip, as I'm going through my head about this, about why we're not able to drive up numbers at this site and, and the county's numbers are, are going up pretty well. I mean, they're not uh, we'd like to see them north of 4,000, but they're typically around between three and 3,500, uh, 3,000, 3,500 for many days. And, and so I am concerned that we're not seeing the numbers here. And, and so in my mind, I can think of four reasons why we're not seeing it. One is, as Councilman Carrasco said, the hours are just inaccessible for a population that clearly needs to work. Um, secondly, fear. Uh, because people need to work, they may be very concerned about getting tested because then they will be told they cannot work. 
Uh, third is a lack of access, again, because the digital divide, as Councilman Frosco has certainly urged. And, and the fourth is that there may be other walk-in options, um, whether it's a James Lick or Fairgrounds or Eastside Clinic and East, or East Santa Clara Street, any of the other sites that we know are operated by the county, state, or others. And so let me just go in reverse. Do we know anything about whether any of those other sites actually have walk-in options that maybe are satisfying the need? I just don't know. We know that some of the pop-ups in particular have done walk-in. Uh, so there was a pop-up at La Tropicana that was um, just had a had a great turnout. We provided a lot of water uh, for that one, so we kind of have some sense of, of how good the turnout was. And we know that the county has been we've been amplifying the county messaging on those pop-up sites. And we I, our anecdotal evidence is that they've gotten a lot of traffic. I don't have the exact numbers, but I yeah. do know that there are some there are far more alternatives for people to get tested than there were when we opened the PAL site um, two months ago. And so again, I think all- Mayor, Mayor, I know that Overfeld, they've been having uh, from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m., 1 to 7 p.m., walk-ups. No, no appointments, no registration, they just walk up. And uh, Supervisor Chavez has sent me the numbers for those walk-ups. Some of them are up to 450 a day. Right. So yes, I mean, on the good news side, there are clearly are more alternatives that people are able to take advantage of. So I think, right. uh, you know, those four options that you lay out are all hypotheses as ours. Is the hours a barrier, fear of testing positive and not having something to do with that, the digital divide, and then the walk-up option. All, all four are, are part of our hypothesis as well. Okay. And, so, and they have it on weekends. We don't have it on weekends. Right, hours and weekends. Got it. So, so then with regard to the walk-in options, um, is that something that this, the county, actually, I, I know there's a lot of information on the county website. It may already be publicly available. I'm assuming actually it all is. So I haven't enough at the site to understand how many of those sites are walk-in already. Um, but maybe that's, we'll take a look on our end and, and see if that is a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Just in terms of the, the fear that people have about getting tested. Um, I, I know that, of course, we, you know, Councilmember Esparza and, and other colleagues pushed very hard to get in place uh, a paid leave um, mandate from the city. And, and we've approved it, of course, and I don't know how much we've communicated it and it may or may not matter to address the fear issue because you know employers may or may not follow it. But I wonder to what extent have we tried um, in our communication efforts with the county? I know obviously we don't control what they're saying, but have we tried to encourage messaging that would include, hey, in the city of San Jose, everyone's got two weeks mandatory paid sick leave. You know, it's a good question. I don't believe that we've incorporated that messaging in there. We've worked tightly with the county and Jackie um, morales Ferrand, our housing director, has worked with Key Lee, who is point on the county on this. They, everybody who tests positive is walked through, uh, followed up with the county and walked through a script, which includes questions about their need for support or housing. But I don't believe we have uh, done proactive messaging around the paid city leave either through that mechanism or as part of our overall media uh, push around testing. So um, somebody might be texting me to correct me at this moment, but um, uh, that's my understanding. Yeah, we'd be happy certainly to partner with, um, with Rosario and, and the team, the team manager's office to see if we can really try to get that word out, particularly in communities where we know that's gonna be a real barrier. Um, and then with regard to the inaccessibility hours, totally recognize it's not our contract with Verily. We really don't have any control over this, but, but I know we are in communication with Verily. I've talked to them as well. And if it were not a matter of expanding the hours, but simply a matter of shifting them, does that change the equation at all? If we go instead of from nine to three to from say five to, to 10? Well, that's sort of the, the line of thinking I was. What's the it, 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 um, sometimes breaking up the hours is as logical as it is is difficult because you've got that long break and people people's yeah, working condition yeah. changes. Yeah. But I, I very, barely to their credit has been very responsive to our engagement despite the lack of a contract with them. So I don't want to put everything off on the lack of the contractual arrangement. So uh, part of what I would ask them is is what are the options in terms of either splitting 
um, as uh, Council Member Carrasco sh suggested, and or shifting the hours, including looking at more evening hours or more morning hours or, and or the weekend. So I, we can bring that into our discussions with them and see, I don't know what's easy, hard or impossible for them, uh, but we can bring all of those options to the table and try to get a better understanding. Great, thank you. And then with regard to the walk-in access, you described the $1.2 million in costs. If we were to staff or actually, I, I guess, pay a CBO to staff it, could you help me understand better what that looks like? I, I mean, because I, I actually relate some of these numbers to the county and, and you know, they seem like their eyes bulged out a little. And I, I didn't quite understand what all that meant in terms of FTEs and why we need so many people. And I, obviously, I'm not knowing anything, I would just think, hey, you just put a person out there who has a, an Apple iPad and they sign them up, but what more is involved in all that? Well, so it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I think there's a, you know, the part of the reason we need to put it out for bid is we, we don't necessarily know ourselves. This is not our core line of business. And so uh, part of what we would wanna do is refine this in coordination with the county because we may be under asking or over asking. But what we've got here is, you know, you, you'd need to provide uh, medical testing personnel. So five, five-ish people ranging from doctor to nurses to physician's assistants. You'd need uh, people to manage traffic flow if you still also had a traffic uh, a, a part of it. You'd need people to manage the walk-up registration, which would include both people with language competency and a certain level of, of certification so that they can do the HIPAA compliant work, the HIPAA being the, the healthcare regulations. You need to provide security at the site and then any operations at the site. So again, it's an estimate. It's not a hard number, but once you all add all of that together, we think that that's about $25,000 a week including the, if you will, the rental of the facility built into that. Um, those numbers may be high and we'd love to see lower numbers than that, but, but what we don't like to do is set up expectations that we can do it cheaper than we can. But until we go out to bid, we wouldn't know what the actual appetite or the actual cost would be. The, the county's running the Overfelt site, right? So yes. They, they may be able to provide us some numbers. Right. And the, they're providing, they, in the different facilities, they have, they actually have a lot of staff who have these capabilities. Yeah. And so they're able to assign their own staff, which right. the costs will probably actually be higher than what I'm quoting, but they are absorbed already within the budget. We, yeah. we, we generally don't have staff and the few staff that we do that meet these criteria are already deployed on other things in the EOC that we would not be able to reassign them from. Okay. Or would not prioritize the reassignment from at this moment. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then on the issue of the, the trailers, um, I, I'm, you know, I spent a lot of time talking with Jim Orpal and uh, who, is, who really explained to me what the real challenges are about being able to continue to use the trailers and the extraordinary costs there. Uh, and they certainly were not given to us in pristine condition, I know that. Um, might it be helpful in the next, uh, since I guess next week is our last week before the break, uh, Dave, maybe just to have someone as a gym or, or anyone else. I know we're still working through some of those issues and we're hoping that there may be some options for using them in various ways and maybe to give everybody some time to work that out. Could we, could we just have an update on the trailers and what we're doing with them you know, by next week? Yes, yeah, that actually fits well with what we've uh, kind of already contemplated in terms of bringing forward next week. So I think that'll work. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Councilman Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Actually, I wanted to see if Dave or somebody can expand on on that. Uh, their regards to the the, the trailers. Um, I think for me specifically, right, it, it was um, it was sort of a, a, a bit of news that uh, I was not expecting, and I think that was the, the biggest shock was just um, the the shift that that we did. Um, I also was expecting these trailers to be in use for for quite some time. And, uh, you know, not having a discussion at the council, uh, not having that be more um, transparent was certainly a major issue for me. So I wanted to see if you can, you know, how do we, how do we remedy that? How do we have a better explanation? How do we actually uh, describe that better for the community? And, and it sounds like maybe you're, you're saying we need to wait on that. Well, certainly we can attempt to ask and answer any specific questions, council member, you have right now. I think we would contemplated bringing uh, more uh, detail forward next week. Um, so but, uh, available for any questions. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm happy to, 
to wait until next week to to understand it better. Um, I think that that would be my focus. If you can answer those questions as well next week in regards to why, you know, why was this decision made without um, more transparency or more, or more counsel input? Um, certainly want to know what the real challenges were. It sounds like the mayor have had may have had some conversations with Jim on that uh, or yourself um, to understand why this decision was made. Um, you know, if we can have a rundown of where these individuals have all gone now, uh, if they've been rehoused in other locations, um, you know, I think that that's uh, the most concerning part is that that transparency and then what is actually happening to these individuals, given that this was um, something that we were all uh, proud to be able to, you know, to offer up to our, our homeless community members. And now uh, that opportunity is, is, is no longer there. So certainly that's... Uh, uh, you know, if that's the discussion we'll have next week, then I'm happy to have that next week. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Council Member. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, there, as I I've, I've keep saying, the, uh, the challenges we have in, in terms of kind of this process, uh, the reopening process, and, and I'll just be honest with you, you know, kind of being in half emergency mode, but maybe half not. So we are still in emergency mode in many ways, exercising our emergency powers and have felt very uh, important that it, we, we do come and report out to the council every week on, on where we're at on things, uh, but very much still in the mode of having to make decisions uh, on a daily basis to, to, to address what we're seeing. But um, want to be able to provide you all with, with the information uh, that, that we had that drove the decision making. Um, and obviously we went into uh, the, the trailer mode um, you know, kind of uh, having to catch up with what we were presented with in terms of an opportunity. I tried to make the best of that opportunity and, and found ourselves faced with a lot of challenges um, in operating um, the trailers. So we want to be able to share all that information with you um, and, and bring that back next week. Okay, and actually speaking about that on, on updating us on a weekly basis, uh, we're going to enter our July break. And I'm curious how we may be able to receive updates, uh, how we're gonna to continue to receive them during July on things like food distribution, contact tracing, uh, testing, uh, specifically, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the conversation that, that was just had with uh, Councilmember Carrasco, uh, giving right feedback um, and advice on some of the testing hours, the, in, uh, the inefficiencies of uh, the testing site there at the Powell Stadium. Um, we're not gonna have that opportunity for the entire month of July. So how are we gonna be able to, to one, receive updates and then two, um, have that, that uh, exchange back and forth to be able to continue to provide some updates um, that, that we may have from, or feedback we may have. Um, so council members certainly open to, to options. Uh, we can um, look at, you know, certainly we'll still be running as a city um, during uh, the, the, the month of July, um, you know, I, I will be honest with you. Um, I, I have, uh, I would say, come close to mandating that some of our staff take some time off in July, um, but we will be up and running. And so, you know, we can look at some options for how we would provide updates. Certainly, um, um, we certainly will have all our normal modes of communication available to us that we can do that. Um, you know, if you're looking for an interactive opportunity, that would need to be, I think, a special council meeting. Um, and certainly, if we, that's always available to us, is certainly if, if the council or even if the administration feels like, hey, there's a need for us to, to, to get together and make some decisions. I don't think we should be against that, um, right, mid-July or something, um, if, if need be. But what I would like uh, at, at a, a minimum would be a response from you next week on um, how you do plan on keeping us uh, updated in regards to these, these main topics around food distribution, contact tracing, testing, the sites themselves. And, uh, uh, you know, certainly understand that we have the ability to communicate via phone or text or email. Um, to provide some of our info and updates, uh, but we're not going to have the information you're going to have. And I think rather than, you know, uh, on a one-off basis, uh, have the council members, you know, try to, to ask the proper question or, or ask for certain details. Um, if we had a, a weekly um, summary, you know, from, from your office on some of these main topics, 
that could help. Um, so, but I'd like to see what your what your plan is, uh, and if you can let us know that next Tuesday, um, I would appreciate that. Yeah, and then, absolutely. We can we can have that plan firmed up by next week. Thank you. And, and then uh, the you know I think that the the last major topic for myself is in regards to just the the homeless crisis, um, which was a priority prior to uh, this pandemic. Uh, but I think it's just been exasperated. I, I had really hoped that we would see some of these temporary solutions make a dent in um, the, the homeless population and, and be able to actually help get some people off of the streets um, and into shelter. And I think we, you know, we saw by the numbers that we were able to house quite a bit of uh, individuals, but it certainly hasn't made an apparent dent. Uh, we have large numbers of encampments, a uh, large number of people that are uh, out still on the street suffering. And, and this, is, this is our opportunity, right, to take advantage of a crisis and uh, leniency in, in policies and procedure to try and get some of these solutions across. And I appreciate uh, the update you sent actually earlier today in regards to the, um, you know, the, the, the tiny home sites that we, we approved, recognize, right, that's gonna take a little bit of time, but they're, they're moving ahead. Uh, and I think we'll see some of the fruits of, of our labors uh, as we move forward. But we need an opportunity, right, I think, to make uh, a difference more immediately. And that was uh, some of these opportunities like the hotel motel conversions, what we saw with the South Pole site, um, the, the RV, the, the you know, RVs that we, we're now talking about that clearly, right, they, they, they look like they were going to be a quick solution, and then now they're, they're being disbanded. So I haven't seen anything that has been really uh, impressive that says, okay, in a, in a, in a crisis, in these opportune uh, times, uh, we can really be able to, to reach out um, and, and create some, some creative solutions for our homeless population, and not just on the city's end, but also on the county's end. Um, and I haven't seen that. In fact, you know, what I think we do see is we see uh, the problem being exasperated, and, and we have a lot more people we know that are on the brink of homelessness because of this pandemic. Um, and what I'm really fearful of is that we get uh, to you know our next uh, homeless census, and, and we see that the numbers have only grown by the thousands yet again, and so th that's just you know it's troubling to me. It was a priority before the pandemic. Uh, certainly, as we've gone into the pandemic, we've been focused on some of these other needs. Um, but I think that, that this uh, this main concern of homelessness needs to continue to rise to the top uh, of priorities, uh, and even more so now during this pandemic. And and that. Uh, also, again, falls into line of, of how we coordinate and are working better with the county. Uh, I've been pushing on this issue for a number of years, and I know, Dave, your office and specifically Lee have been supportive of that, um, working more collaboratively with our own, within our own city departments, uh, cross departments, you know, with uh, those that are, that are dealing with uh, homelessness, which is almost every single department in the city. Um, but where we haven't had much success is in that partnership uh, with the county and knowing that right the resources to address this issue are are not all uh, residing within the city of San Jose. Um, we need to be able to do that better. Uh, I was looking forward to the opportunity of the task force that Supervisor Dave Cortez had uh, said that, that they wanted to start. That process has been delayed because of COVID. I don't think that should be delayed any further personally and, and we'll be making that request to supervisors uh, that, they, that they actually initiate that. Uh, rather than delay that any further, um, because again, I do think that this this pandemic has only exasperated our our homeless problems. Uh, and hope that that right that my colleagues uh, can join in in that encouragement as well as as this being a, a priority issue and and an issue that the full uh, council and the full board of supervisors need to be addressing um, as a crisis uh, as the crisis that it is. And so certainly uh, that is you know that's a, a major concern and will continue to be a major concern for me. Uh, I know I just spoke with um, actually the, the developers there at the, um, the, the project on park um, and, and, and for, for them, they have been waiting patiently. I know that we had uh, Sean Cartwright speak to that and I actually asked them to continue to, to be patient and that we have no interest right in, in uh, speeding up a uh, you know, removal of, of individuals there and that anybody that is there uh, we want to make sure that they they have a, a place to to locate to, whether it be another one of our our sites uh, like South Hall, before we we just move to to shut that down uh, in the name of development. And the developer there uh, is aware of that; they've been aware of that, and uh, they're cooperative in, in that regard. So I do appreciate that. 
Uh, I'm not so certain again what what has happened, and I don't know how much ties into the opening of of uh, Happy Hollow's summer camp program. Hopefully, that was not part of the case, but we can talk about that uh, next Tuesday. And um, and just want to uh, reiterate some of those those points and appreciate staff uh, being being open uh, to that. I know that you've gone out there now trying to focus on the, the cleanups. Um, there's a lot of trash uh, that's in and around, uh, and we still run into issues where, as uh, individuals in the community are reporting the, uh, the illegal dumping of, of trash, and in some cases, uh, it's actually just piles being created by uh, individuals that are in encampments nearby. And uh, we, we run into these gray areas where, um, you know, I know that sometimes there's two sides of the story. Well, is, is it is somebody claiming it as their own personal property or is it actually a pile of trash that, that you know, individuals that are homeless are collecting those piles, right, with the hopes that they're going to get picked up by city staff. Um, but we see so many of them right now throughout the community. And I think we do need to, to do a better job. And I recognize, uh, I think uh, also there was an email from Jim Orpole earlier that spoke to that on the efforts of being able to go out uh, not with the purpose of necessarily abating, but with the purpose of, of making sure the right-of-ways are clear and uh, specifically that we can get this trash picked up um, and, and issuing trash bags to those in our encampments so that they can also help, right, and pile up uh, the trash that they may have and we can get out there and clean it up. Uh, but we, we just need to do uh, a, a lot better job of that. Um, and, and I know that there, it sounds like there's maybe an effort uh, underway hopefully within the next six to eight weeks to actually go out and, and robustly do all of that and, and if city staff wanted to speak to address to that or any of the other items that i brought up i'd be happy to with my last uh, two minutes for staff to respond dave i'm happy to to jump in and give some explanation on some of those items if, you, if you'd like me to that's great thank you jim sure just, just a couple just going back to the trailers I, I did send a communication to the mayor and council on june 15th and i described and the reasons why we did close down the trailer site. Um, it was a challenge for the residents. It was probably the main reasons. Elderly with underlying health conditions, the stairs, the distances, a lot of things were very challenging to the residents. So that was probably the main thing, but there certainly were maintenance and safety related challenges as well. And we, we laid them out, albeit briefly, in that email communication to the mayor and council on June 15th. So we can certainly get into more details on that, but I wanted to describe that and also make it clear that every single individual that was in the trailers were offered and accepted a location in a county lease motel. So that was fundamental to our housing department's efforts uh, in making the decision to close it down. We did not think it was the best uh, location for the people in those, and we did find locations and all were transported to those locations. And I think that's the primary kind of critical issue up front, uh, but we'll have more detail on that next week. Um, as it relates to kind of conditions around encampments, uh, we certainly acknowledge it's a very difficult issue. We stood up an EOC branch to address that, a multi-department branch. We'll be investing the coronavirus relief funds that are aimed at dealing with the um, shelter in place encampment, uh, you know, no more abatement uh, approach. And we're gonna utilize that funding to try and create much better sanitary conditions at encampments. We'll have a full presentation on that this week. Uh, an example, council member Prowls was the Guadalupe uh, River Trail, the, the concerns there. So I think that's a kind of an example of how we're initiating that effort. And we're gonna use that approach uh, in some respects in other locations really to try and address this, but the team is kind of looking at all the locations, places, and data, uh, working with housing uh, and the homeless outreach team to do this in a way that is safe and thoughtful from a COVID standpoint, but also tries to create sanitary conditions in and around the encampments and, and does it in, a, in an appropriate way. So that's something we will definitely have more information for you on next week. Uh, I did send an email just uh, this morning on that matter as well to the mayor and council. So you do have that uh, that you can certainly use to communicate with any uh, residents or constituents that you need to communicate with. Thank you. Th thank you, Jim. I'll, I'll just end it by saying I hope that we can pick back our, our efforts on working collaboratively, uh, more collaboratively with the county on this issue. Thanks. You bet. Thank you. Uh, council member, yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Kip, I wanted to go back to your presentation earlier. You are talking about wastewater treatment uh, kind of uh, getting around in the muck, as it were. Um, I, I read somewhere that I think Yale University did a, a sample of s similar to this in, in New Haven, Connecticut, where they were looking at um, solid waste samples and then actually kind of projecting that, you know, in the next seven days, this is what we can expect in terms of uh, COVID uh, related cases. And I'm curious to know what we're testing for. And is it the similar thing or something different? So basically what we're, what we're exploring on a pilot basis is the ability to test wastewater, which is that which you flush down um, at various locations and see what that tells us about the presence or absence of coronavirus in the population that's upstream, if you will. And so we actually did an earlier pilot on this. Um, the results we got were uh, really hard to calibrate. The good news is we have a really strong team at our wastewater treatment plant that includes a woman, Payal, who has her PhD uh, in, in a, a subject directly related to this. And her main professor in the University of Arizona is actually an expert on coronavirus. So to dramatically simplify uh, what I've learned from her, the, the um, testing around this is not yet what I would call calibrated, which is obviously if I take a nasal swab and I run it through a PCR test, that's got to be calibrated in one way. If I take a water sample, the matrix of the water sample is different than what I'm seeing in my nose. And so how I calibrate that and, and what I know that I'm getting back is very different. So long story short, we believe it's going to take us a while before we know whether the test, what the test results are telling us, if, if anything. But the hope for idea, which we will learn over the course of the pilot, is that we might be able to sample at certain places, say, for example, downstream of a particular neighborhood that's at high risk or downstream of a uh, skilled nursing facility. And we would be able, whether people took tests or not, to see if the prevalence of COVID-19 is increasing or decreasing in that area. But all of that would require us to test out the methodology. And there's a great deal of science that needs to be done in order for that information to be useful. And that information would be fed back in primarily to our public health colleagues in the county to help them understand, uh, in addition to the testing data, what might be going on in neighborhoods. All of it at an extremely preliminary stage and much more to be done, but we're in collaboration and supporting the county's efforts on this at this point. So, so right now we're just basically calibrating the methodology and working at the kinks. We're not trying to solve for any problem or, or even assuming that we can put forth an estimation of any sort. No, it's, it's piloting to see if we, could, uh, if we could use this to sample select geographies and have a, have a good sense of it. In order to be able to do that, we need to work through the methodology, test that out, and see if that's giving us valid results. And that's, that's the phase that we're at, very early stage. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, moving on with the, the question of, of testing, I, I, I'm not sure whether the, the protests are going to keep on going. They're, they're kind of ebbing and flowing. I suspect that we'll see more of them uh, over the break. Uh, but uh, it occurred to me that uh, we should probably have one of those mobile testing sites in front of City Hall for the protesters. We keep telling everyone, you know, if you're out there protesting, get tested. Um, we should try our best to make it easy for, for folks who are out there. Um, have we been able to talk to the county at all on that? We've discussed the issue of the protesters. They are very much encouraging anybody who's involved uh, on the protest um, to, to get tested, and we've been helping push that message out. We have not actively discussed the idea of a pop-up site uh, on City Hall, but we can, we can certainly raise that with them. Yeah, I've talked to Supervisor Chavez. She seems interested as well, so we could make it happen. I, again, I, I don't know the protest schedule, but I suspect we'll see more of that, although it's, it's ebbing and flowing right now. Um, on, also on the topic of, of test pop-up testing, uh, this week, you can go to Andrew Hill uh, High School Cafeteria and the SAP Center uh, for testing without any registration. Um, it's uh, 10 to 4 at Andrew Hill High School and 1 to 7 p.m. at the SAP Center this week, and then Saturday it's 9 to 3. Um, but I also want to continue on the line that uh, Councilmember Carrasco was speaking of. If, if we're saying that, and we all recognize that the east side is, is being hit harder than other parts of the city, um, and, and we are, we're hypothesizing that there are all these barriers, which I'm sure they're all true to, to some extent, but I want to ask the more basic question, beyond just you know, putting this on our, our YouTube channel or our, our Facebook page and, and Twitter account, 
what kind of grassroots outreach are we doing to the community? And I'm, I'm sure that Councilmember Carrasco's office, she said her team's out there, but every time we send out a newsletter from any office, our reach is not 100,000 residents, right? Every time we put out a Facebook post, our reach is not 100,000 residents. So I guess, you know, to support her office um, and all the East Side Councilmember offices, what, what, what is the city doing to directly get the messaging out in language and, and whatnot to people? Because maybe they just don't know. Uh, yes, council member, thank you for the question. So let me just pull up um, some of my notes here just to make sure that I'm... So um, from an emergency public information office perspective, we're regularly posting about testing on social media channels in multiple languages. We are attaching graphics. We've recently moved from only promoting the Verily site to promoting the county's website, www.sccfreetest.org. So residents can find the nearest location. Our messaging has been including the fact that it's free, that you can go with or without symptoms, that anyone can be tested regardless of immigration status or insurance, and that essential workers or people in close contact with the public should be tested at least once a month. We're also amplifying the county's pop-up sites on our social media and include that information in the week's flash report. We also have shared the county's virtual tour of testing site on our social channels. Um, information on testing, including the Verily site, is also available at the Virtual Local Assistance Center in the Health and Wellness section. So that's that's been the bulk of our effort, uh, has been through uh, media and social media to amplify those messages and get the, the messages out in multiple languages through those channels. Sure, okay, and I guess that's kind of my point, right? Uh, I mean, if we're having this discussion about digital divide and, and digital inclusion, some people don't have Twitter or Facebook, they're not gonna see it. Um, if, if we recognize as a city that, that there are certain areas that are mostly impacted, um, there should be more of a sustained, you know, canvassing type effort to, to get the word out. And maybe not even canvassing, but at least direct mailer of, of some sort. I know months ago at the beginning of this, there was a discussion with Kim where each council office got a, a list uh, through the city of, of you know businesses and residences um, in our districts, and, and maybe we should be making use of that somehow. I, I know it's costly to send out a postcard notice, but but I guess my overall point is, I'm I'm certain that all the barriers that Councilmember Crossville mentioned in terms of the time and in terms of fear for taking time off work and, and all that, they are all true. But I also think there's potentially this this issue of people still not knowing even too much into this that there is free testing in the county. I personally, I. I I know that I actively seek out Vietnamese messaging from the city. I go and I check every week for, for Vietnamese videos on our YouTube channel. Um, and, and sometimes I'm the only one who's viewed it. Um, and I help push it out, of course. But, but I guess my point is uh, people still aren't accustomed to going to the city of San Jose for messaging in Vietnamese or in Spanish uh, because we do it infrequently. I mean, we're doing it much more regularly now, and, and kudos to us for doing it during COVID. Uh, but it's still a re relatively new phenomenon. So, so people aren't accustomed to coming to us for, for multilingual information yet. Um, to the extent that we believe the East Side is being particularly hit, we need to probably step up more direct messaging and, and outreach um, and maybe spend some money on that. But um, I just put that out there for you. Thank you, Council Member. All right, I'll, I'll yield. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rennes? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so my questions, and I'm actually going to start where uh, um, Council Member Dip left off because I also had some suggestions um, for the testing and I want to thank uh, Council Member Carrasco for continuing to bring this up because this is part of the solution in terms of identifying the number of folks um, so that they can um, act on that those results um, and continue to be safe and healthy and so one of the items that I was thinking about, and I'm glad um, Council Member Dip, you brought that up, that I think we still need to continue to campaign around this. Um, and I think our campaigns have been um, independent of one another, not necessarily um, uh, do, uh, sending out messages at the same time with the same content to the same type of groups. I think we do need a more coordinated effort, even among ourselves, and then uh, joint efforts with the county. I was thinking of some of the um, ways that are uh, pretty effective for our communities, especially our uh, most vulnerable communities. And um, our Bro Todas program is usually a way that people receive information and it has been very effective. It's a way that that our community-based organizations have shown that they can organize our community 
and um, it does take a, a little more time, but I think these systems have already been set up and I think we should rely on some of the systems that have been effective for our community um, in the past and continue to um, build on those. Um, as well as um, I was thinking about, and I, we, we've done this for a coat drive every year, we have a coat drive and we partner with Eastridge and there's different um, stores that partner up with us. And sometimes we have this uh, $5 credit for, well, now Sears is closed, but at that time it was Sears and, and the year before it was another store. Um, and $5 is very minimal in terms of a credit, um, but it encourages somebody to maybe come to, to the line and donate or come to the line and test. Um, and that, those, those $5, I know that they've been shown when you give that, those kinds of small stipends that it really increases the amount that people are going to spend at that store. So if you have a $5 credit, you usually are gonna spend 20, $25. And you know, it helps our economic recovery at the same time it, it uh, incentivizes people to go to the sites. And so I wonder if there's anything that we can use within um, maybe our flu distribution uh, money, since I heard you say earlier that uh, those uh, that demand has been reduced, or if there's a, an opportunity for us to uh, just connect with, you know, Target or uh, whatever Safeway, some uh, some other store that is able to to do this and see the benefit of of maybe giving away a five dollar credit in order to get a fifty dollar purchase at their store. Um, or somehow maybe split the cost there between the city and, and that store. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the ideas that I had about this. Um, I think that, that when I continue to talk to people, especially at the um, places where I go uh, to purchase food um, and I ask this, the, the question, have you gotten tested? Most people have said, no, they haven't because they don't have time. Um, or because even if they did, what would they do? They live with a, um, a roommate. And so it seems hopeless. Um, but I think it's, it also um, um, offers an opportunity for us to continue to target some of the essential service worker workplaces. We know where those are. And so we, we know that our work isn't done just yet with those folks who are out there working every day and exposing themselves with the rest of the public. And so I think we have a target there as well that we could use in, um, in being more um, fine point um, with, with the, uh, in, in pointing those folks out and targeting those folks with messaging outside of just um, the rest of our community that we see that is getting um, um, higher rates of infection for COVID. So that is one piece. The, the other piece is um, how are we, I heard from some of the comments earlier that uh, we still have restrictions on tables and I know pools and, and then there's fines for, for our mask. And so I wanted to ask what the update was on that. And along with what council member Perales was already talking about with receiving some updates, how are we going to get some updates and how are we going to be informed of how we're adapting to the new county's allowances or restrictions based on how things fare. Um, and lastly, I need, a, I would like to have an update on the infection in the construction sites that, um, that I know that there was a flare out in. So those are the items that I wanted to just put out there and uh, get a response back from staff. I'm, I'm council member. Thank you. I, I I was tracking along on the campaign piece, but I the, you with the first question you had, there was a combination around the masks and the parks uh, and the uh, the swimming, and I'm not sure I, I completely understood the 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 request. So I wanted to make sure I I understood it. Yes, thank you so much, Kip. I wanted some clarification in terms of when will we be allowed? When will community be allowed ah. to? tables at the parks because we are um, allowing folks I think uh, I think a maximum of four or six who belong in the same household to congregate at parks and as such they might be able to use the bench at their own uh, risk um, uh, nowadays everybody brings some type of clean, uh, uh, cleaner antibacterial 
cleaner with them. I know that I travel with it in my car. I'm sure that everybody else does as well. And so I wonder if that is going to be, there's going to be some allowance for that. And then um, the fines, are we really fining as many people as, as maybe some of the, uh, one of the speakers has, have shared? Thank you for the clarification. Let me see if I can get uh, John Cicerelli back on with us because I think he's best placed to, to answer those. Um, I'm here. Ah, there he is. Boom. Yep. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, you Council sir. Member. Um, so um, I, I want to um, distinguish between two different amenities and parks. One is a park bench and one is a picnic table. People are allowed to use a park bench. They're not allowed to use a picnic table. Um, and that's per the county health orders. And they're pretty specific about that. So when that caller says, we'll take down all this yellow tape, we put up that tape to tell people don't use this space. Same thing like you probably see it on the playgrounds and things like that. So um, we're kind of tied. We don't, we haven't, we're not issuing thousand dollar fines for people um, that are in parks or using a park picnic table incorrectly. Most people are very compliant when a ranger approaches and says, hey, you can't use the picnic table. You're going to have to move. Um, that gentleman in particular who was talking, I'm actually familiar with, um, he, he, uh, he did get cited for drinking alcohol in the park, which is not legal under any circumstance. So I think he's a little upset and feeling targeted. Um, but, um, you know, we're not, we don't have the time or the bandwidth to run around to all the parks and police them. We know people use the picnic tables because our maintenance staff will show up in the morning and see all the tapes gone and there's some trash left behind and, and uh, it's obvious people were using the picnic tables. You know, we'd love for the picnic tables to be open. Um, as soon as the county lets us open them, believe me, we'll stop putting tape on them because it's a, it's a lot of time and effort to keep trying to re-sign them and re-tape them. So, um, you know, the family unit thing, we are able to allow, um, you might be start seeing in some of our sports fields, some summer camps that are doing sports camps. Um, and so just like we do summer camps, they have to keep the kids in groups of 12 or fewer. They have to stay in that stable group for three weeks before they can move on to another group. So we are allowing uh, any, any groups, sports groups that submit to us plans that show that they can do this in compliance with the county orders. We're allowing them to rent field space. So we are starting to see some organized sports activity now you can't take those 12 kids and play them against another 12 kids in soccer or something like that. So they're not, the only games that they could play would be within that subset of 12. There's no crossover. Um, mm -hmm. And so we realize this is confusing. We're sort of in that confusing part of, of this whole reopening where we're still holding back in some areas, but letting go in other areas. And so we do, we do get people, they see other folks on the field and they're thinking, well, are they allowed to do that? Or are they not allowed to do that? So we understand there's some confusion right now and that's I think that's just par for the course for this stage of the game we're in right here in this transitional stage so I hope that helps clarify some of that for you. It does it, it does help John um, although one would argue that if you're on a park bench you might as well be allowed on a picnic table I mean it's not too far stretched like there's surfaces that you would touch um, and I think both are or a park bench usually is more porous than than the other but but you know that that comes from the county, so I won't argue that. Um, I appreciate that. I think um, it, maybe uh, clarifying that that for our folks who are um, found uh, violating the mask rule, that there isn't really that fine. Um, but I, I I appreciate you clarifying that there might have been an, uh, some other type of fine that was connected to that gentleman's call, other than the mask. And so I'm gonna. Let that one go, um, and then I, I, and thank you, John, for that. And, and by the way, how are the classes going so far? So far, so good. You know, we had the first week uh, last week, and you know, little kids. It's you know, it's tough to keep them away from each other. Um, you know, they all want to group together and clump together, and um, it's tough, especially some of the smaller ones. You know, the guidance changed. The state changed the guidance very recently and said everybody's got to wear a face mask, including our young kids. So. You know, keeping masks in them can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes, but overall, in fact, some of the parents, you know, they don't walk in with masks on too. So we're having to remind them, hey, you got to, when you're dropping the kid off, you got to keep your mask on too. So I think we're getting there. I think a lot of kids are loving the fact that they can get out of the house and hang out with friends and, you know, they have a lot of energy around that. So our staff is certainly enjoying the time, but, 
you know, it, it's tricky to manage this in this way. So it's, it's sort of a constant supervision and checking and making sure that people are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing, that the staff is doing what they're supposed to be doing and, um, you know, who enters the room and who doesn't enter the room. So all those logistics are challenging, but we're there um, and people are really enjoying it. Good, I'm glad to hear, John. Um, I think the last piece, Kip, is um, the testing piece. Yeah, and, and my, you know, my biggest takeaway um, from your point and the point of several others is, I think if I were to frame it, and please correct me if I don't have this right, but I think what you are, what you're seeking is what I would call a campaign, right? And, and as you say, a coordinated campaign. And that includes both the social media, the, the mass media, but also ground game and direct and targeted marketing. And so um, if I've, if I've, if I've got that right from my listening, I think one of the things that I want to take back to the team is what would it take to do a coordinated campaign, coordinated both with the county and then with, with some of our community providers, realizing that um, there is an existing network out there that we can tap into. You know, I, I think this is clear, but just to, to, to underline it, we have struggled with the ground game partially because how do we do the ground game and keep people safe right so that obviously that doesn't apply to direct mailing but the normal ways that we would do you know again going back to my community organizers days of, of knock and talks or knock and listens and things like that are, are different now and so one of the things we'd want to do is obviously want to make sure we understand how to do and make use of promotoras and other techniques in a way that's safe for, for them as well as the people receiving the message but if bottom line i think the request is to what would it take to do a campaign that is informed and appropriate for the community. And that would incentivize folks to get to the testing site. Correct. Um, Thank you. And actually the last one was, um, how are we going to be informed or, counties, or how are we gonna adapt since a lot of folks may be taking some time off during July? I'm guessing that even if some of you who are working actively in the EOC, there be uh, of course, somebody who will substitute you and who will adopt uh, to the new allowances or restrictions as we see uh, testing results change. Yeah, and as the city manager said, we'll we'll come back to uh, next week with a, a more detailed sense of how what the plan and the cadence will be. We will be continuously running the emergency operations center. We will be continuously running our communications function. And we will figure out and present to you next week a plan for how we keep you in and the larger community in sync during the time where the council meetings are not taking place on a regular basis. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to provide a, a quick response to the concerns Councilmember Perales raised around homelessness, at least one of, I know there's a lot more to talk about, particularly next week. Um, I think many of you know the state budget is now apparently uh, going to be off for a vote on Friday, and the final outlines appear to enable about $550 million of CARES Act money for construction, uh, primarily for capital uses, obviously has to be used before December 31st. Um, and the governor originally wanted that for motel purchases only. We have a broader set of things we could be using it for. Um, our share of that obviously will depend on how we align with those objectives. But to the extent that folks are aware of those motels out there, either we're leasing now or that we could be buying, um, this is exactly what that funding is for. And the state really wants to accelerate the acquisition of those motels, obviously to our great advantage in expanding our supply of housing for, for homeless. So I just wanna encourage my colleagues, uh, you know where those motels are in your districts. Uh, perhaps the ones that are a bit run down that we could rehabilitate quickly um, and uh, obviously uh, for critical need. Uh, secondly, we were successful in lobbying and I really want to thank Scott Green on my team and certainly Bennett Chang and everybody else who's been pushing with us with the, the Big City Mayors Coalition, which we've been spending a lot of time on this year because I'm chairing it. And we, we, we managed to get about a $300 million carve out of the general fund for additional homelessness. About 130 of that million of that will be distributed directly to the 13 largest cities. We're not sure exactly what that number means to us yet. I think it's around 10 or 11 million in San Jose. But again, this will give us additional opportunity. And, and I mention all this because I think what we're seeing now between Housing Public Works and what Jim Warball has been leading is a really promising model for us in terms of building emergency and transitional housing very quickly. 
Uh, we're seeing projects that are getting built in four months or they will be built in four months uh, from very beginning to the finish. That would ordinarily take us four years or more. And um, you know, more than 300 folks are gonna get housed in just these first three projects. Obviously, we want to find more sites. And so again, to all my colleagues, uh, who I know are all concerned about homelessness and the crisis, we do have an opportunity here, and that is we have some emergency money, and if we can have the sites, we can build quickly under these emergency orders. So uh, I just want to leave everybody with that. We're now at the, the well beyond the one o'clock hour, so why don't we take a break here? Um, we will resume at two o'clock with the remainder of our council meeting. Thanks, everybody.
Good. We will resume our meeting where we left off. Uh, we had just concluded the report of the city manager. So that brings us to item 3.3, the approval of various budget actions for the fiscal year. And I guess just to make sure we're all here, I'll ask Tony to, to call roll. I know we have some big votes coming up and we'll need a quorum. Jimenez? Morales? Uh, here, and uh, Sergio and I are actually headed up the elevator now, so he is here as well. Yep. Present. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Here. Bully? Here. Amos? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo? Present. Okay, we've got uh, eight present and two coming up on an elevator that will be present in a matter of seconds. So I think that will give us enough for the quorum. We are, um, we're on 3.3 as I mentioned. Uh, there's no presentation on this item. Um, and I can no problem with the screen here still. Okay, here we go. We have several members of the public would like to speak, Tessa? Tessa, you're uh, you're still muted. Tessa, you're still on mute. We're not able to hear you. There you no. Nope. Tessa, you're still on mute. Okay, uh, Ann Grabowski, welcome, Ann. Hey, Mayor. Um, I don't know who raised my hand, but it wasn't me. So enjoy. The okay. <laughs> All right, Ann, thanks. <laughs> I suspect you're on a future presentation. You just got thrown into the uh, forum. Okay, uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, I'd like a little rebuttal on the uh, park ranger. He, uh, he definitely targeted people that day. Some people were breaking the law. So sure, I'm sorry, this item is actually the uh, various budget actions, item 3.3. Uh, Blair? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, to get going here. I hope we can all meet halfway how the words reform and reallocate can offer beginning good examples of the terms defund and demilitarize and what still needs to be considered for the city budget this next year. I feel this place, uh, from this place, important concepts can then be more openly talked about and better developed here in San Jose. Good civil rights, civil protections, open communication, and the community meeting process are important ideas of peace, good reasoning, good democratic practices, and positive long-term community sustainability. This is what technology accountability and good open public policy bases itself on, and where technology surveillance, data collection, and police hardware often gets its inspiration and innovation as well. There simply can be many ways to work to de demilitarize, refocus and reallocate technology and surveillance use in San Jose, including how good open public policy ideas should be treated as equals in the digital inclusion future. And that as most want to help bridge the digital divide, I hope we are all learning to trust that responsible minimal use practices can often cover about as much as oversaturation of technology in local neighborhoods and that uh, SJ local government can learn to support these sorts of questions and efforts of health and safety from everyday community and of themselves. To conclude, this sort of work also simply needs the good efforts of advocacy and people of the community. I feel these ideas can speak to the very heart of defunding and demilitarization itself within San Jose at this time. Check out the ACLU ideas about accountability and openness to help create your own ideas at this time as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Tessa, I know we had some challenges getting you on last time. Uh, there okay. You. Okay, good. Thank you so much. So what is the topic right now? Uh, this is the approval of various budget actions for the next fiscal year. Okay, great. Thank you. And that would be something that'd be helpful if we had in our digital democracy, more articulation of where we are at on the budget. That could be even a, another screen that would be helpful or something that you know, you could put in front of yourselves just to help the communication 
uh, with this democracy virtual. Uh, okay, so the budget. All right, great. Well, one of the issues that I have with that budget is in regards to the um, issue of the um, uh, the race and equity position, the 1.5 million for uh, racial equity um, and for four employees at 1.5 million. I think that that is not a great solution to solving our racial inequities. Um, we really need to be applying that to our community infrastructure, um, that it's make more but bureaucracy doesn't solve the problem of racial inequities. The big racial inequity we have right now is the issue of pollution and how it's affecting our low income neighborhoods as well as COVID-19. I see the research shows that pollution is a precursor and makes um, uh, COVID-19 worse. And that's why our low income workers uh, and low income neighborhoods are being affected because those are the areas in San Jose as it's clearly, clearly been documented through the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that those areas, the east side of San Jose is highly impacted with pollution. And so we need to reduce our pollution now and work on that as an equity versus um, giving more bureaucracy. Because even having the bureaucracy of BACnet, we still have not solved our pollution problems. So to create more bureaucracy is not going to solve our equity issues. And one th way to start is in addressing our pollution, you know, creating safer, walkable, bikeable neighborhoods now. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140, my apologies, I believe that you were cut off earlier. Yeah, I'd like to say that any kind of budget that you're going to pass, defund the park police, defund San Jose PD and their traffic division, and put, put more money into trying to open up the pools and help out these businesses that are downtown that, that are closed. I mean, it, this looked like there was an epidemic down there before the epidemic. What's it going to look like now and after this epidemic? It, it looks like a ghost town down there. This city needs to get, get their act together. And they, need, they need to prioritize their budget better for, to, make the, to make the city better. And there's a lot of potholes that need to be filled. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of other infrastructure issues that, that need to be fixed. And you guys are going to need to get on PG&E because the, the summer is starting and you're going to see a lot of problems with, with PG&E. And I haven't heard anything about your microgrids or canceling the gas stoves. I mean, you know, you guys, you guys prioritize on, on things that are not worth it. And uh, once again, Park Police is one of them. And when that, when that subject comes up again, I will be calling again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roland? Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor. I actually want to speak on, on a budget item that is on consent. Should I wait for the consent calendar or speak now? I, I'm sorry, you want to speak on which item? It's, it's uh, 2.32 on consent. Did you skip the oh, consent? Yeah, you skipped consent. We're going to come back to consent. Sorry, Roland. We're going straight to the budget actions because of a, a need to get those wrapped up today. Okay. okay. Let, let me come back later then, okay? okay we'll come back to consent and in three items. We just got to get through 3.3, 3.4, and 3.6. Thanks. Uh, Patrick? Patrick? You're still muted. There we go. You hear me now? Yep. Okay, I'm taking my cues from Blair uh, because he, he touched on, uh, on police issues as well, um, and I understand that's going to be a significant chunk of general fund allocations going forward. Um, so I did, I did want to say that I, I you know, the city last signed a union contract with the SJPOA on February 12th of 2017 and went into effect five days later on February 17th, 2017. Uh, that contract expires on June 30th, one week from today. I'm not suggesting that the city take any steps which subvert the collective bargaining process, the NLRB, the California Public Safety Officers Procedural Bill of Rights Act. I just urge the council to push for a delay in the execution of any multi-year agreement with the SJPOA until the public can be better informed regarding the exact nature of the agreement and the input of stakeholders can be more carefully considered than it has been up until now. I've been proud of San Jose as a diverse and tolerant city. 
since I moved here from Miami in 2016, but I've been disheartened over the past month to learn that despite the wonderful on-paper policies around things like de-escalation and bias training, justice outcomes here remain racially disparate. And I find myself increasingly wary of in incrementalist reform as a fix. I'm certain the members of the council can recall various reported stories by local and national news agencies over the course of the last month and understand where I'm getting this idea from. Uh, it's early in the process and many cities are doing the necessary work of reimagining public safety in specific terms, which takes time. What I'm suggesting is that we don't want to do is hamstring the reform efforts by locking the city into another multi-year contract with POA before that process takes place. Uh, I'm not an expert in any of this. I may have some of the wrong info regarding specifics, but before I uh, finish, I did want to touch on one last point. Uh, the agenda item regarding negotiation with the POA was moved to a closed session that took place before the city council meeting at 9.30 this morning. Under section 54957.6 of the California government code, legislative bodies of local agencies may hold closed sessions regarding uh, labor negotiations, but uh, I'm saying may not shall. It's not a requirement of the statute. We don't need to violate any sort of confidentiality in negotiations, but people need to be brought into the, uh, into the conversation regarding this. Thank you. Motive G. Welcome. Hi. Um, so actually, it's funny that I should follow up that guy. Part of the reason I was calling was about the POA. I want to remind folks that the POA, July 16th, 2016, put out a press release uh, questioning the legitimacy of the Black Lives Matter movement. And they actually ended it with the line, the hypocrisy must stop for a dialogue to start. Would you like to speak to the budget? And I'm reminding you of that because I believe that we should keep that in mind when we do I any negotiations. And with the budget, I think that we should take money away from, uh, we should not have the uh, SJPD responding to any calls that involve um, overdoses, any calls that respond, that respond to homelessness, any calls that respond to anything that is not a uh, physical threat and a nonviolent action and have the people who are trained in that, social services, uh, medics, respond to those calls and increase the money. So take the money away from SJPD for those nonviolent uh, calls and move the money to social services and our paramedics. And that's the budget call but I'm going to remind you that uh, black lives do matter and the SJPOA needs to apologize. All right, we're uh, coming back to council now on item 3.3. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Tony, let's, oh, council member Ernest. Council member Ernest, you're still on mute. Oh, I'm so sorry, and I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, I wanted to um, include my um, my memo, um, and this is regarding the sexual assault um, funding that was um, uh, taken from the original amount um, that you that you um, approved last year, Mayor. And I think this is an effort to balance um, some of their. Um, uh, internal budgeting, the police department's internal budgeting. And so what I'm asking for is that um, in September, once this is all um, looked at once again, and if there's any remaining balances um, in September that we prioritize uh, returning back that funding to sexual assault, there's still uh, plenty of uh, training to do for our police departments. And so training has to uh, correspond to the trends and patterns of the city. And one of those trends is that we have a lot of, um, of those assaults uh, relating to children under the age of 12. And so the training also needs to take that into consideration. And so I'm hoping that we can make sure that there's funding available um, to address those in the future. And um, I hope that we can, uh, my, my, uh, Colleagues can agree that this is a priority that you've already accepted and approved and, and hope that we can restore this funding um, in September um, if, if the end balances 
uh, allow us in the final reconciliation of all of this in the fiscal year uh, 1920. Um, um, and I know that that's a lot of ifs, um, but just in case, uh, it, that if is a positive, I would like for us to consider um, a sexual assault uh, funding to be restored. Maybe if I could make a suggestion for the maker of the motion, if we could ask, given that this is really a focus on the end of funding balance that I think we'll be considering in September, if we could have a deferral of council member Arenas's uh, recommendation when until, what is that, the second or third week of September, typically, when we have that in front of us. Um, Mayor, this is Jim, Jim, Jim Shannon, uh, City's Budget Director. Normally, the council uh, approval of the annual re report is the second meeting in October. Okay. Yes. Would it be possible that then that we would take this up as soon as we have all those balances in front of us the second week of October? Sure. I'll make the motion, um, uh, Mayor, and I'll include that. Um, and I'm fine with, with moving that to that, um, that timeline. Actually, there is a motion already. Actually, I already made the uh, motion to Council Member Arias, but I'll, I will include the modification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. I Great. Thank you. And that's okay with the second resume? Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. On the motion then, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Carlos? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item point three is the adoption of the annual appropriation ordinance and annual funding sources resolution for the next fiscal year. And the resolution is establishing the appropriation limit. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, I know, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I, I know that uh, yourselves are really trying to use the word uh, reform uh, for police issues at this time. Um, you know, I, I'm liking the word reallocation a lot. And for yourselves to be able, I hope you can still really consider that there, there still can be time and how you know certain funds uh, geared towards the police can be reallocated, and I think that that can be an important step to still be thinking about this summer uh, and what we can do. And uh, good luck in your efforts to do that. Thank you. Thank you. On the motion, Tony. Jimenez. Yes. Prowlis. Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe. Aye. Davis. Aye. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, then uh, to wrap up our budget work, 3.6 um, City Tuesday 2020 tax and revenue anticipation notes. This is, of course, for the upcoming budget year, so we can pre fund our pension retirement funds. There's no presentation. Uh, and we have no no comments from the public. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Tony? Menez? Yes. Morales? Aye. Diep? Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Yes. Thank you. We'll pass it unanimous. Uh, so we're on to the consent calendar. Uh, are there items that the council would like to pull from the consent calendar? I have uh, item 2.6, Councilmember Davis would like to pull. Uh, Councilmember Camus would like to pull 2.2, which is the final adoption of ordinances. I'd like to pull 2.13, which is uh, the workforce we owe annual report. Uh, we have two members of the public who'd like to speak, so we'll go to them now. Roland? Thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, there, there, there is a short email from me uh, in your packet under this item. And what I want to do is 
obviously I want you to approve um, this appropriation, but I want to bring your attention that the, if you going to elevate the tracks at Diridon, the Union Pacific the the line is definitely the long pole in the tent. That needs to be resolved before you finally come into lifting the tracks. Because if you cannot make the Rasola the Rasola line work, and, and by the way, I'm not seeing my countdown, um, you know, this is not gonna happen. So I've worked on this uh, extensively, I think it was the entire month of May, and uh, we believe we found a solution which involves uh, basically uh, taking the light rail down into a tunnel. Uh, that's gonna give us four uh, great separations. Um, let me just see at uh, Lincoln, also Ray, Suno, and, and DuPont, and then the uh, Union Pacific line uh, comes down. So what I'd like to do is to attract your attention to an RFP, which is very, very, very similar to these kinds of, of constraints to San Francisco, is known as the Pennsylvania Avenue Extension. And if you look at this RFP, you have got a pretty good template of the kind of RFP that you would have to um, issue to resolve this issue, you know, detailed advanced uh, engineering in um, in San Jose. So anyway, I, I bring this to your atten attention now. The amount is the same, it's $1 million, and maybe you may want to be spending that money on that RFP instead of anything else you might be spending on the uh, money with the VTA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Blair. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, to speak to four items on the consent calendar today, I hope the VTA good efforts toward the Green New Deal and uh, to re-examine overall Measure B funding can be thought of well in the work around uh, the San Jose Airport and the city of Santa Clara at this time. I hope the intention of the MTC, now more involved in the Deardon Station planning, is to help with a more open shared process for all Bay Area CHSR options. There are some interesting East Bay mass transit and public transit connection ideas in bringing CHR and BART to the Tracy area. This can also have uh, less housing displacement issues between San Jose, the peninsula and SF. With urban village issues, a good luck with also continuing very low, extremely low and mixed income housing ideas. These are simply our good practices and roadmap toward a well-reasoned sustainability, social equity, and even ideas of a more positive local community energy future with renewables in the next few years. And a thank you city government for considering more underground wiring options at this time. I hope city government wants to facilitate how all of us can be more involved in the massive push of broadband technology uh, by the federal government at this time. Remember, minimal use practices can, can probably accomplish about as much as the oversaturation of technology in local neighborhoods at this time. Uh, with my remaining 30 seconds, I would like uh, to quickly offer, uh, you quickly passed item 3.5, and uh, that was Measure, T, Measure E uh, tax oversight funding. Measure T uh, also has uh, a tax oversight board, and if there's ways the Measure T tax oversight board can, can get more involved with public accountability with the technology issues of Measure T, I hope that can be thought of. And if not, uh, how can we develop an oversight board for Measure T issues uh, with technology? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Okay, returning to council, uh, items 2.2, 2.6, and 2.13 have been pulled. Is there a motion on the remainder? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, if anyone could unmute yourselves. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed to those consent items passing? I hearing nothing, they all pass unanimously. We'll go to 2.2, Councilman McCann. Yeah, Mayor, I only wanted 2.2A, uh, not 2.2B. Um, I, I, I try to interrupt because uh, I wanted 2.2B on the consent because um, I'm, I'm in favor of that one. Um, I just wanted to register a no vote on 2.2A. Okay. So uh, perhaps we'll take, um, why don't you make a motion on 2.2B, which you will vote for, is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Make a motion to approve 2.2B. Okay. <laughs> Second. 
All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. 2.2a. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 2.2a. Nay. One, one no. Okay, that passes nine to one. Uh, and then item uh, 2.6 is uh, the council liaison to the retirement board report and our council liaison, one of our two is uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Um, and I have uh, Councilmember Foley's report as well. She, she and I kind of put this together together. So um, <laughs> this is also from Prabhu, Palani, who is the CIO for the Retirement Services, both Police and Fire Board and the Federated Board. Um, he just wants to update the council. Um, council Member Foley had Police and Fire a few, couple of weeks ago, and then we had our Federated meeting last Thursday. And um, because of all of the market volatility over the last few months, um, he wants to make sure that there's an update for the council. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of read out some of the highlights here. He does wanna reiterate that the boards have been cautious about how the pension portfolios are managed and reflected in you know, having lowered the discount rate ahead of many other California pension plans. Um, as you know, many years ago and continuing to do so and adopting a relatively conservative asset allocation, mostly due to the maturity of our plans and the relatively large share of our annual pension fund contributions as part of the city's budget, as well as our low, our low funded status on both, both plans. Um, so as a result, our boards have walked a fine line between boosting return expectations while minimizing volatility there was a steep decline, as we've already discussed multiple times here um, in the market that occurred in the first quarter of 2020. And of course, that was primarily driven by um, COVID-19 and the, the um, resulting shutdowns of economic activity. And he also says, while our plans were not immune to the downturn in markets and no portfolio with any kind of market exposure has been, um, our plans performed better than median public pension plans in Q1 of 2020 for police and fire. That uh, return was a negative 10.5% uh, and for federated a negative 10.87% with the peer median return being negative 12.6%. So both our plans finished in the top quartile of all our peer public plans, which are um, having assets greater than $1 billion. So they're aware that <laughs> that's not great, um, but they did look at as equity market levels kept dropping through the end of March, the investment committees and boards took into consideration our long-term time horizon and the relative attractiveness of risk assets and actually modified asset allocations to to increase our exposure to growth assets. So for um, police and fire, the old, ex the old asset allocation for growth was 63% and they moved it to 70%. For um, federated, that was, it was 61% and they moved to 75%. Um, and again, that is um, taking into, into consideration our long-term time exposure and the fact that when the entire market goes down, there are um, good buys to be had, not in things like travel, obviously, that are more uncertain, but just the fact that the whole market goes down and there are still some strong companies. Um, and then the in increase in our growth assets coincided with a sharp rally in the equity market in April and May. So for the month of April, police and fire returned a positive 4.8%. Um, all but erasing the negative returns for the fiscal year to date, 1920. And um, the same for Federated, it was 5.64%. So um, both positive in, um, in the month of April. And let's see. 
A couple final points. Trustees realize that our revised asset allocation may lead to enhanced volatility going forward, but that such volatility needs to be viewed against the backdrop of an increase in return expectations and that there is no silver bullet to improving our funded status. Our long-term orientation, closely monitoring our portfolios and our ability to act swiftly while keeping in mind the unique challenges faced by our sponsor, that's us as the city being the sponsor, is the prudent way to tackle the asset side of our pension challenges. So I just wanted to um, submit that to my, to my colleagues for, um, for consideration and for discussion. So uh, I will move to point six. Second. Second. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Uh, Councilman Davis, the motion. Councilman Davis, can I just ask for clarification? Sure. The number you read to us about the drop in the market and the, each of the two plans, the 10.5 and 10.8 percent, is that for a quarter or for a, a month? Or that's for the the first quarter, so January, February, March. Okay, and so there we had the ability to compare to other plans because it was an entire quarter. I'm assuming that the one month returns that you had would not. Okay. Right. They haven't. Okay. I, I, I have to admit, I'm, you know, I understand nobody likes losing money, um, but I have to say I'm still a little disappointed. Um, you know, our peer plans are down 12%. We're down somewhere between 10 and a half, 10.8%, almost 11. And we've given up a lot of returns over the last half decade because we were theoretically choosing mm -hmm market we we're choosing a market allocation that would theoretically insulate us significantly from downturns and what we got was an 11 percent reduction rather than a 12 percent which doesn't feel like a bargain yeah, we, we saved almost uh almost a full percentage point yeah increase but the other um the other thing to note was that the change in asset allocations did help recover some of that. So for the year to date, you know, the year ends, the fiscal year ends, as, as we all know, um, next week, they are thinking that we will be down a lot less than a lot of other plans. So okay. we won't make our market our assumed rate of return, um, but we'll be a lot closer to it than yep. everybody else. All right. Well, we'll, you know, we'll wait till we hear and learn more. Um, I just know that it was much more than 1% gap between our returns and everybody else's in the good times. <laughs> yes, and that's a point that um, num a number of board members made at Federated. I can't speak for police and fire. Um, and that was part of the reason why there was um, more discussion about uh, being, willing to, being willing to take on a little bit more risk because we haven't seen, we didn't see the insulation that we were hoping for. Yeah. Okay. And I would say the same conversation occurred at Police and Fire Retirement Board. That's why they moved the asset allocation in mid-March or early March to take advantage of what they felt would be um, a market that they could uh, recover some of those losses. And, and it turned out their decisions were wise because through April or through the last report we had, their uh, the market turned around and their numbers were a little bit more positive. So uh, we have a meeting in a couple in a week or so. So we'll find out what the next uh, list of numbers are and how we're doing statistically in relation to our plan, but then in relation to everyone else's. Okay. Well, I look forward to having a conversation with the with the investment team and uh, Roberto and everybody when when they uh, come to us uh, next. Um, I have no opinion about the market timing. I'm, I'm glad they, they're making money, but I know market timing is usually not a great strategy. If, if they're in, great. Um, but um, we'll, I guess we'll learn more in the months ahead. So okay. just to be clear, they weren't trying to, they're not trying to time the market in the sense that I think you might mean, Mayor. They're, they're taking advantage of, of the fact that all the, the entire market went down and they're buying companies that they've been watching for a long time. So assets that they've been looking at for a long time and became value priced as a result of the whole market going down. They're not trying to time the market like buy, whatever, buy everything low and sell everything high. It's more like we do, we do a lot more buy and hold than, than I think you mean. Yeah, fair point.
fair point. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't think we need a motion on that, right? We just accept, we just have the report, right, Rick? That's correct. You can either accept the report by motion or just, you don't, you don't need a motion. You gotta, you can do it either way. Well, we appreciate the motion or the, uh, the report. Um, okay, then on the um, uh, 3 point, uh, 2.13 rather is the WIOA annual report this is the workforce. Um, boy, uh, Jeff, you'll have to remind me what WIOA stands for. <laughs> workforce Investment. Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act. Innovation and Opportunity, that's what it is. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that everyone's trying to um, hustle in a, in a really challenging moment here to help a lot of folks be able to get paychecks right now, Jeff, and, and I appreciate what, what you and the rest of the team are doing. If, if you could tell me just a little bit more about the Slingshot 2.0. I know there's this regional effort to try to create more non-traditional apprenticeships. And uh, is, is, is that ready to launch anytime soon? Right, good. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. This is Jeff Ruster, Assistant Director for the Office of Economic Development. Mayor, if it's okay with you, I would really like Monique Melchor, who's on, on, the, on this call. Um, to kind of share with you. She's been fantastic. She's done a great job of leading uh, Work the Future during these very tumultuous times. And she's yeah. been kind of right in the center of the Slingshot Grant. So Monique, if you could just give us a real quick overview of that. Great, thank you. Hey, Monique. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Monique Melchor, Division Manager for Work the Future. Uh, 2.0 is actually um, winding down a little bit. And that was to work on um, uh, apprenticeship with partners and to examine the apprenticeships that were in the region. It's a, actually a regional effort. Um, we're now going to be heading into 3.0, which is really exciting. 2.0 is just a starting point for us to see at the regional level what was available, what we could do, um, and then COVID kind of put a stop to that. So our next phase is really important. The RPU partners are actually going to be re-examining apprenticeship and other learn and learn, and learn opportunities in light of COVID. Um, this will include understanding employers' post-fires priorities and capacities through interviews with uh, both talent acquisition to understand evolving talent and skills demand. So this is really taking a, a different approach because of COVID. Unfortunately, we've kind of had to do a 160, um, but we'll still be looking at um, the depth of employer commitments to uh, this non-traditional hiring. We really want to make sure that it's something that's still going to be happening. Um, so we're going to be working with uh, the region, which includes ourselves, San Francisco, Nova, and San Benito County, to really look, a, look at a strategic approach to apprenticeships throughout the area. Yeah, I'm providing some time. Okay. Monique, can I also ask, and, and first, thank you to you and your team for all the work you've done for several years um, on the San Jose Works effort. Um, I know you've had to cut the group down quite a bit this summer. I think you're serving about 175 kids. Correct. Are those, are those teams actually getting on site anywhere? Or are they somehow doing stuff from home? About half of them are on site, and then half of them are doing remote work. Um, yeah. We are waiting on some centers to reopen um, so that they can, of course, safety is paramount. So we're making sure that they have all the safety equipment necessary to do the jobs, but it's about half. And then we'll continue with another two cohorts to make up the 375 that we usually do in a year. But we're just waiting for COVID to make sure that it's going to be safe moving forward. We didn't want to offer all the services in light of what's happening in right. the environment. So it was, and it was a little difficult with employers to make sure that they had positions available. Okay, thank you. And, and then finally, Father, you or Jeff, I, just in terms of the volume that you're dealing with, people who are uh, needing help at this point, um, can you tell us a little bit about your capacity and 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 how it's going just managing the, the, the number of folks who are, are needing some kind of career? The, for, for the most part in the beginning of COVID, what we were really actualizing was a lot of employers who were laying off individuals and they were actually furloughing them. So it wasn't an actual layoff. There were hundreds of companies that were coming to us, letting us know that these individuals were gonna be impacted. So our team went out actually remotely provided webinars to individuals to let them know about the services that we had to offer. Because they're furloughed, they weren't technically laid off. Um, now it's starting to get to the point where individuals are laying, or companies are laying off some of the individuals. And then the biggest rush, uh, again, for us was UI, unemployment insurance for individuals who are wanting to make sure that they had uh, the capacity to get the UI, 
get in, in through the call centers who were overwhelmed um, and unfortunately it put a lot of strain on um, our partner EDD employment development uh, department um, and we tried to work with them to make sure that our clients were being as served as quickly as possible. They still do have a backlog, they anticipate a backlog, but we're trying to work with them as much as possible. Okay. Thanks. And the mayor, as you probably are aware, I mean, people are getting $600 more in terms of UI benefits than they otherwise would. Those ex extra benefits, those extra $600 extend through the end of July. Um, when they end in July, if they end in July, if there's not a stimulus package that would carry those on further, we do expect to see a lot of people walking in through our doors. We um, will be bringing to council in September um, some additional funding that we did receive from the state, some dislocated worker funding, which will augment our ability to serve those workers. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Monique. Thanks for all your- My pleasure. Uh, okay, uh, Tessa? Hello. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, I was noticing in looking at that work the future that there was a lot of training for green jobs. And I think that that's, we need to really be supporting people, not businesses. And that what we're doing in terms of really um, emphasizing, even in your budget, that was a concern that Raul Perala has put in that he wanted extra money for small businesses. That is a problem. We need to be supporting people. And the thing is, we need to be supporting fossil fuel free jobs. We have to change. This is what all the science is telling us, that we need radical change. So yes, I was happy to see in that workforce development when I just purviewed what they were doing, or whatever the word is, and scanned what they were doing, that they are training people in green jobs. That's great. And so we need, this is the type of work that we need to be doing is training um, people to do the green jobs that we need to do to rejigger our economy to be fossil fuel free. And any anything that leads us towards that is something that we need to support. And this helping of businesses um, is not the way we need to be going. We need to be helping the individuals. And the main thing we need to be doing is helping individuals to think about their other ways of earning money and surviving that isn't based on fossil fuels and or, or a lifestyle that is consumptive. Even, even the restaurant industry, we need to be going back to, like my husband says, a, a fierce independence. And we need to be making our own food and you know doing that. The, the life of the, um, what is it called? Um, the, the, the bourgeoisie, which is you know, eating out. This is where we have to be dealing with the people and how we're going to survive without fossil fuels. And that means, you know, really creating uh, a lifestyles that are, you know, self-sufficient and rug fiercely independent and self-sufficient. Thank you. All right, uh, on this item, uh, is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. We're now done with the consent calendar. Uh, we'll move on to item 3.5, which is the Housing and Community Development Commission Real Property Transfer Tax Community Oversight Committee. There's no presentation. Move approval. Second. Motion from Council Member Foley, uh, second from Vice Mayor Tessin. Well, great, housing. Yeah, well, that's one of the things I've been really working on. Do I get my 2.0 down? Oh, I don't see my, my time. Do you have that up, uh, Mayor? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, the housing issue um, is very important in our, as we transition off of, you know, COVID-19, as is, is the leader in how we're supposed to be living our lives. And the thing is, we need to be living our lives in a stay at home fashion. That's where housing is so important, it needs to be the emphasis. And that's where what we're dealing with in our neighborhood on, on Stockton Avenue and Sheely, our block is about housing and the general plan and that we need to really quickly change our general plan, just like we've had to do a lot of other issues that quickly change things we need to be changing uh, rapidly 
our, our direction and our focus to being towards our crises as our main focus. And that's why we need to be changing our general plan towards housing. And the issue in our neighborhood is that we want to get housing in our community that supports our, um, you know, our, our historic neighborhoods that we live in on the Garden Alameda and therefore creating um, a place for housing. So we need to, we need to have uh, methodologies that move us away from our old um, Neanderthal general plan that was all about jobs and about um, e income generation for our city and our city uh, coffers um, towards the, to the people. And that means changing it to back to the general plan in our neighborhood, which was housing on the west side of Stockton Avenue. And it turns out that there's these beautiful homes that are, on, that are destined to be demolished on Autumn Street that we want moved to our community that are historic homes. And then on top of it, to address another issue, we want at least one of these homes to be given as reparations to a black family. So we are always addressing many of our issues. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. This is Blair Beekman. Um, yeah, this is the item that uh, I spent my last 30 seconds of consent calendar uh, speech on. Um, 3.5, uh, this is Measure E, tax oversight. That uh, to, to add, you know, maybe there's a way current Measure T tax oversight issues can work together with Measure E issues. Uh, just an idea, and then that can allow space and room for Measure T to be a public oversight for uh, all the technology that is used for uh, Measure T issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew? Yes, Matthew Reed, Silicon Valley at home. I'll, I'll be brief. I'm glad you're moving quickly on this one. Um, we're very pleased to see the progress. This is uh, been quite an undertaking for a lot of you and a lot of us for a while. We think that the move to make the Housing Community Development Commission the Oversight Board is a, a great one, that it, it acknowledges where there's capacity uh, currently existing in the city. Um, and we just look forward to moving forward and working with the commission and with the council um, and with the housing department um, see great projects built and progress made in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for your work and that of Leslie and the rest of your team at the Silicon Valley at Home and uh, helping to manage, well, actually to managing this campaign and, and really uh, and, and helping to lead it. It's, uh, it was uh, very, uh, ended up being a very close battle and we're grateful that the voters of, of our city stepped up uh, recognizing this affordable housing crisis that we're all in. So thank you to the voters. Um, now we're back to the council on the motion. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Davis? Arenas? Yes. Um, Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, just wanted to note for the record, Davis and Esparza both absent. All right, item uh, 3.7 is the streamlining public easement vacation process. Um, this is Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, uh, Mayor and City Council. We don't have a presentation, but we're available to answer any questions. Move Thanks. approval. Thank you. Motion from Councilmember Foley. Matt, just a quick question. I understand, so we're not going to council when we're vacating uh, some easements. Can you help me understand when we are coming to council? <laughs> sure. Um, to qualify for a summary vacation, there's three items that need to have occurred. One is the property has never been used. Um, the second is it hasn't been used in the last five years or it's excess property. Um, so typically this would be property that would be um, maybe part of a new development um, and maybe the city for some reason owned, had the easement, but, the pro but it never was or isn't necessary for the roadway or the sidewalk construction in the future. Another example is property um, that is on someone's private residential home 
um, where there's a setback, e old setback easement um, that that was never that is excess and never used and not of the public interest. And so those are summary vacations. So those are the ones we are recommending not bringing to the city council. Um, any um, anything where we would be vacating an easement um, that is has been used in the last five years by the public um, and is 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 not considered excess, we would be coming to the city council. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, Matt. All right, on the motion, Tony? Menes? Yes. Prowess? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Arenas? Yes. Bully? Aye. Chemist? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, item 3.8 is the annual development in lieu fee report. Thank you, Mayor City Council. This is Matt Kano again, Director of Public Works. We do not have a presentation for this either, but we are ready to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, there's one member of the public like to speak, Tessa. Okay, thank you very much. I got my 2.0 almost up. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I lose some minutes. Okay, you got to work on that. All right, sweetie. So get that up as soon as we can. Thank you. Anyway, getting back to in lieu, we need to definitely be getting a lot more from corporations. The way the system is supposed to work is government over corporations um, and um, the individual over government and the environment overall. And so with that in, in, in mind, our in lieu fees need to be really improved because we're really falling behind on our infrastructure and the impacts of, of the development that you are rapidly you know, approving in our communities. And we really need a lot of um, in lieu fees in terms of our infrastructure. And that really hasn't been articulated and the council members haven't been representing us in terms of all these developments that even the most recent with the SAG community, the, the, these community activists were like screaming about the way the, the buildings are being built and how tall they are. And, and so, but it's, it's also just in general that you're not really communicating us, with us about development and what we need in our community to mitigate it. <laughs> and there's no plans for, for traffic calming and traffic um, you know, mitigations and stopping the traffic, stopping the house, the um, the building of of the buildings that should have no auto infrastructure. You know, we need to change that, but that's another story. But in terms of in lieu, <laughs> we really need to be really getting more from these developments in terms of the impacts on our community, and we're not doing that. And so we need, especially, to be looking at the bicycle and walking infrastructure to make our streets safe for the um, for our community and the impacts that is happening from development. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Robert Geary. Yeah, Robert Geary here. Um, yeah, in regarding the in, in lieu fees, um, I think that one of the things that has created a problem is that uh, many of the developers have chosen to not be inclusive in uh, having uh, people of uh, extremely low income in particular uh, move into their facilities, into their uh, complexes. And so they would rather pay a fee than, than to integrate their, their, uh, their developments. And I think that that is a real disservice to people. And it's another way of uh, redlining. It's another way of doing that. And those, those fees need to be so steep that they have to think about it very, very hard, much harder than they do now, where they can just say, well, we're just going to pay the money and, and then, you know, not have to do what we're trying to do. And I understand that the money goes towards developing um, more of, a, of, I would say, like public housing or, or low cost housing. But at the same time, we're not developing that fast enough and there's not enough of it. And as long as people can get out of doing that, then again, people are buying their way out of integration. And, and they're able to segregate themselves and, it, and we're just encouraging that. And in light of the, uh, uh, the, the mood that's going on in the country right now, I think we need to rethink how we do things 
and and try to be more inclusive and involve more people in in our everyday society and not put them aside and kick them to the curb and and decide that well they're they're just not worth it or we don't want to spend them we don't want to see them we don't want to have them near us to keep them away and and I'm willing to pay money to to not have that happen so I think um, in Luffy's if we decide to continue with that uh, terrible program I think that it should be so costly to them that they would have to uh, actually reconsider their in lieu fee altogether. Thank you. All right, coming back to council. Um, Matt, I just have, I'm sorry, Blair, go ahead. Blair? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you very much for being able to take me at this time. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, reiterate or, or thank uh, Robert Aguirre's uh, statements. Uh, you know, we we're part, there, there was a very good movement happening uh, pre COVID 19 of extremely low, very low, and mixed income housing ideas. And I hope that doesn't get lost as we're becoming more isolated at this time. And uh, Robert Aguirre, I think, offered some really good ideas how we can work on that. And that's the kind of stuff we have to work on together at this time. Uh, I also appreciated the comments from Tessa, and uh, this was an interesting public comment item. Thank you. Thank you. All right, coming back to council. Um, Matt, I, I, you know, I'm always struck whenever I look at this report every year, at the end of it, there's this long list of these little accounts <laughs> of 10,000, some cases 50, $100,000 here and there, all paid by folks who are doing some work that if they have a frontage and they pay in the 20B fund and the money sits there. And, and I'm always trying to figure out, like I never actually see undergrounding happen. At least it never feels like we do, right? Because we're it's always happening somewhere else in the city than whatever you happen to be thinking about. And and so this year I decided, okay, I'm gonna figure out how many 20B and 20A projects we have going right now. And I can't say I know the difference between 20A and 20B, but I know that had something to do with undergrounding and putting money into accounts and hoping the undergrounding will happen. So I looked at the 20B program in the budget for this coming year, and it looks like for the developer assisted capital program, it's $1.37 million worth of projects this year. And, and I know, I, I didn't count them all up, but I'm guessing you've got, I don't know, $20, $30 million worth of money sitting there in all those little funds. Can you help me understand why we can't, just aggregate and get more projects moving rather than having all the money sit there? Um, thank you for your question, Mayor Licardo. And the biggest difference between 20A and 20B is 20A is delivered by PG&E and, and 20B is delivered by us. Oh, um, right. And we, um, we can't, the good news about the undergrounding program is we, unlike most of the items in there, most of the items in the in-lieu fee program, we cannot consolidate. We have to use them in the area they were collected or for the purpose they were collected for. Um, for the undergrounding fees, we actually do have the ability and we do consolidate. Um, as long as we collect the fee in an undergrounding district, we can um, move that to a project. And so for example, earlier on today's council agenda in the consent calendar, we awarded uh, Delmas Park um, undergrounding. And that's, that was consisted of fees that were collected throughout the city. Um, we actually had an item, um, have an item on the, I just grabbed it, an item on the work plan for the underground, oh, another consent calendar item 229 that shows actually how we program that those monies out and, and the projects that we're working on. Um, and McKee Road um, is another one um, that we're moving forward with, uh, Monterey Road, Lincoln Avenue and Meridian. And so so there's some other projects we are moving forward with. They do move very slow um, and it is a tr frustrating, tough program. Um, as part of the audit um, that was completed in the past year, um, it was pointed out by the auditor that sometimes we need to be a little more re realistic in our annual reports about the fact that the amount of money we collect really can't accomplish everything we need it, need to be done. And so, sorry, I, don't, I think, I don't know if I directly answered your question there, but. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I guess um, if, if I were just to focus for a moment, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm not reading it correctly, but it, 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 
if you look at the end of the report and list all the twenty dollars like my usual account. Are those actual dollars or is that just accounting numbers that we have in place and we may have used that money in some other undergrounding project and we're just keeping that in an account or, 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 or is it actual dollars that are sitting there that we can say if we add them all up, we've got that much money. Um, I'll have to follow up with you to get that. Um, this is the amount. So this is that you're looking at the table. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the correct table. Exhibit A. Um, uh, Exhibit A, correct, of the of the report. I can't see I'm looking at it at this moment, but I just remember reading. Oh, okay. It. Yeah. So we have an exhibit A that shows um, all the undergrounding fees, and there's the projects that have been completed to date. Um, it shows how much we've collected and what project it's actually gone to. Yeah. Um, so those track the actual collections and um, and how much they've paid, and then um, and then there's a project cost which is much greater because that's typically the pro the actual capital project that they went to. Right. And I understand it only indicates that maybe we have 4% of the money for a particular project. So obviously that's not gonna happen for a long, long time. And I guess I'm wondering, as we look at all those numbers, do we, do we think those are placeholder accounting dollars or are they real dollars? And you're, that's something you need to probably check on. Is that so right? I'll say the total fees paid are real dollars. Um, and, um, but how much we actually have left in the account, um, I can follow back up with um, an information to Marin City Council just to be clear on that. Okay, that's fine. I, I was just wondering what we were looking at. If it was real dollars, then be one of those moments where you say, hey, we got you know 16% unemployment. Wouldn't this be a great time for us to go use every dollar we got and get people out there um, undergrounding? Um, okay, well, thank you for, for taking a look at it. Uh, okay. A motion, I believe. Are you ready for the vote? Yes. Sorry, you faded out a little bit. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Bully? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 3.9 is the COVID digital inclusion expenditure plan. And we do have a presentation here. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and members of the council. I'm Jill Bourne, your city librarian. And, um, but here I'm also in my role as director of the digital inclusion branch of the EOC. So on behalf of our extended team, I'm very pleased to be here today to talk with you about our recommended expenditure plan for addressing the digital access needs of our residents, especially our students, that has been made even more urgent by the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. The commitment to supporting the needs of our students is directly in alignment with the education policy which was adopted by this council. Our approach in this work has been to reinforce the city's commitment to prioritizing the educational development and support of students and their families, and specifically to do so in a manner that ensures that equity, diversity, and inclusion is at the forefront of our decision-making. Next. Both in the COVID crisis and increasingly during what we might have thought of as normal times, the lack of access to digital connectivity tools and related resources has a number of negative effects on our residents, including isolating our residents from critical services in a variety of areas, inhibiting community and participation in society, disrupting education and our students' progress in learning, and exacerbating existing social and economic inequities across the board. In development of this broader strategy, the team has discussed elements with city council on three different occasions. The first priority in our proposed approach was to focus on connecting our residents to broadband access. The first project we propose investing into completion is the Access Eastside Community Wi-Fi Network. Next. Following previous council directions, staff have worked closely with the Eastside Union High School District to develop a proposed joint funding strategy for the full build out of all attendance areas. The proposal includes a city commitment of $4.25 million 
of which 2 million would be community development block grants, 1.75 million would contribute to full funding of Independence, Oak Grove and Andrew Hill High School attendance areas. 500,000 would be allocated to ensure that each attendance area has enough access nodes to provide a robust quality connection that is needed for distance learning and other uses. Eastside Union and their partners and the Eastside Alliance are contributing other funds, including the remainder of the technology bonds that Eastside passed several years ago. If this funding plan is approved, the next step with the project will be to involve consideration of the CDBG funding commitment, which is agendized for June 30th, then issuance of an RFP for the remaining service area work. Within the RFP process, the city will seek bids that expedite the timeline of each attendance area implementation, and we will be able to report back to you at that time. Moving on, as we've discussed with council before, the opportunity to provide outdoor Wi-Fi for residents at city facilities not only increases to expand space support and programs for all ages, while ensuring public health through social distancing. The sites listed on the slide and in the staff report were selected based on factors included in the priority index, which prioritizes geographic areas of the city that are lacking in digital access, that have higher populations of children K to 12, and lower socioeconomic status, and other factors including facilities with greatest use and other considerations. The total cost of this proposed stage is $457,000. For several weeks, our team worked with major telecommunications companies to consider possible solutions to our massive connectivity need for students. We also engaged Santa Clara County Office of Education Superintendent Dr. Dewan in discussions whenever appropriate. Having received responses from three providers, our team's analysis found that the proposal from AT&T included the high most effective speeds for distancing and the best value data plan overall as well as the best potential expedited timeframe to meet our needs. Next. A comparison of the different provider programs is provided here and in the staff report. At the highest level, the differences that elevate the AT&T proposal are that the speed and quality is more appropriate for supporting distance learning, which may require streaming and live video on multiple devices at once. And that the commitment to a time frame that we need for our residents and to provide significant direct support to expedite implementation. So for, to facilitate this partnership, the staff recommends allocating up to $3.43 million for 11,000 hotspots and service at no cost to residents or schools for a period of one year and authorizing city manager to negotiate and execute an agreement within those parameters. And next, if approved, staff will work quickly to work out the details on this agreement with a target rollout in time for the new school year. The general plan is to work with their county office of education to continue coordinating with the schools to identify households in need, manage distribution, and report back on usage. This plan offers the city the opportunity to respond quickly to ensure connectivity prior to the next school year while we do the work of expanding other infrastructure options such as community Wi-Fi, small cell distribution, and others. This plan is really exciting for us also because we will likely have enough hotspots to also develop programs to distribute to other unconnected non-student households. And since we will have one year of service that is free to students, Staff will work with the county office during that year, also developing a continuity plan for families after the first year. Moving on, lastly, we recommend set aside a portion of funding to support the refurbishment of devices that are donated through the device drive programs. When devices are donated, they are assessed by an expert partner, the tech exchange, and refurbished for a fee. Then we work with the county office to match those devices with the needs identified by schools. The proposed cost of $100,000 will support the refurbishment of at least 400 devices, which is anticipated to be expended between now and early in the new school year. So in summary, this slide shows the proposed priority projects in order. The community Wi-Fi partnership with Eastside Union, outdoor Wi-Fi at libraries and community centers with adjacent parks, 
hotspot data plans for students and residents, additional access nodes to ensure a robust effectiveness of the Access Eastside Community Wi-Fi, and refurbishment of donated devices. Please note that the amount for the community Wi-Fi includes the, pro the proposed two million from the community development block grants. So our proposed commitment to Eastside Wi-Fi again is 1.75 million plus 500,000 for the additional nodes for a total of 2.25 million. So next, moving on to next steps. If approved, the next steps would include a return to council in August with an update on the status of these activities. We would also anticipate a full update to the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee in September. And I wanted to take a moment um, before I wrap up to acknowledge an extended team responsible for a significant body of work that led to large scale actionable solutions in a relatively short period of time for long nights, working every weekend, and an unflinching commitment to this extremely important work. The Digital Inclusion Branch team is listed to the left. First, Anger is the Assistant Director of the Digital Inclusion Branch, um, and I'm certain she was a Jedi in a past life. <laughs> but also in our team are Carla, Samantha, Lauren, Adrian, Rajani, Lizzie, Kirsten, Bobby, and Abby have each done an incredible job. The whole digital inclusion team wants to thank other colleagues who made this proposal possible in record time. Jim and Claudia from Budget, Danielle and Diana from City Attorney's Office, Rob and Ed from IT, Harsh, Tracy, and Matt from Public Works GIS team, HAP, and Nicole and Nolan from PRNS. So with that, we thank you for your time. And we are here for your questions, and I think Kip wanted to wrap it up. Yeah, just to reiterate, uh, I, I, I imagine from your perspective that, you know, as you council members bring these items to us, it can often be frustrating because it takes us some time. But I think this is a really good example of where um, the council really helped to clarify what the problem is and, and the swim lane that they wanted the city to be in around connectivity. We were able to take that problem and hand it off to an amazing team, which you just heard from and seen the members of, give them the time to understand the, what the solution sets were, reach out to partners and bring together a, a plan with partners and resources to meet those expectations that you set out for us. And I'm, I'm really proud of Jill and her leadership and the team and what we're bringing to you today. I really think it's a trifecta around an aggressive build out of the Wi-Fi in East Side in the areas that have the, the, the most need and the densest student body that can benefit the most from public Wi-Fi, uh, a, a, an accelerated and novel approach to using uh, public spaces for a broader area of Wi-Fi as we have uh, the need to continue to socially distance. And finally, and the part that I'm uh, most proud of is our ability to move forward with an innovative partnership with AT&T, which by the time school starts, if approved, would get 11,000 devices into the hands of the students who need them most. And I think one of the details that got lost or gets uh, maybe glossed over that I wanna geek out on for just a moment is that these are not, these are not slow speed hotspots. These are state of the art, high speed, multiple line, um, unlimited data so that you can have multiple devices, as many as 15 devices running off of one of these hotspots at true high speed broadband capability. So we're solving for not only the students, but the related family issues as well. So you, you put a big challenge to us uh, a number of weeks ago, and many of you were, were uh, all of you really, were vocal and persistent in this. And I believe that uh, Jill and her team have delivered on the challenge. So we await um, your questions, uh, feedback, and direction with pride. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that presentation, Jill. And thanks to you and to Kip and the entire uh, Muncie Operations uh, digital inclusion team, uh, you had an enormous challenge that was put in front of you and I think you've exceeded expectations, uh, that any reasonable expectations in terms of our ability uh, to execute on what has been a very difficult challenge for us, which is um, something we've been working on for many years. Of course, we're going to continue working on it, which is uh, bridging this digital divide and we're, we're taking a, a very significant step forward with all of this work and I'm just very grateful to you, to all the partners who really stepped up in a big way. Uh, certainly appreciate Dr. Duan and, and uh, all the, the partners in the school districts 
uh, certainly Eastside Union High School District in particular for their very big investment in infrastructure. Uh, and uh, of course, Sonny McPeak and um, Charlene Tatis and, and CETF and all the folks who've been working with us for many years now uh, to get us to this point. And I also want to thank members of my own team uh, and the Mayor's Office of Technology Innovation, uh, Purva Pasricha, uh, Pasricha uh, Kailana Mueller Shaw, uh, who just left us, as did uh, not too long ago, uh, uh, Shereen Santosham, who really got us uh, heading down this way three or four years ago uh, when she really uh, started pushing hard and seeing how we could start to align uh, our efforts in this way. I really want to thank uh, Dolan Beckall as well for his very early efforts in, in negotiating deals, which were critical in helping us have resources to get started in this effort. Um, and I, um, I should also thank, uh, we have several donors I know we'll be announcing soon, but uh, more than a million dollars in contributions from private sector uh, contributors, and we're grateful for, for their support as well and we'll be announcing their uh, gifts soon enough. So thank you uh, to everyone for coming together for this important partnership. We've got a lot more work to do, but I think we're off to an amazing start. Uh, Bonnie, welcome. Hi, I'm Bonnie Mace from the Evergreen School District. And I really wanna speak in support of the staff recommendation and the superb work of Jill and her team. So thanks to mayor and council for your generous support for bringing broadband access to underserved communities in San Jose. You know, this lack of internet access in many communities has been so difficult for so many years, but I feel like this is really a time of great challenge, but also a time of great opportunity. And it's particularly important as we move forward to create the sustainable partnerships and the strong funding strategy between the San Jose, the County Office of Education, the school districts and internet providers, because this is a challenge that will be for a long time in the future. And we wouldn't want to see the funding just for a year or two. So access to digital connectivity is an essential service, as we know, for residents and students. And we really need to quicken the pace so that when schools reopen in the fall, all the students in the city of San Jose will have strong internet service. I know in my community, there are many families with very poor internet connectivity, and these students have really struggled in the last few months during distance learning. And we're likely to have some distance learning um, when school starts again. It's gonna be for the foreseeable future. So thanks again for looking at both the short-term hotspot and long-term infrastructure solutions and really um, look forward to working with you guys in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, to speak to, uh, while most can agree with the need to bridge the digital divide and with some ideas of digital inclusion, the ideas of more open and responsible surveillance and data collection practices and overall minimal use policies simply has to become a more regular dialogue in the future of tech in San Jose. These are the ideas of more open and transparent local democratic practices and, and accountability and that are meant to ask how to leave 20 years of US continual war and its shock doctrine, disaster capitalism practices. Good tech accountability practices at the local level at this time can help open up many important concepts, including human rights, civil protections, health and safety concerns, and the initial idealism of equity and equality. To practice and teach ideas of good public policy and civil protections is relatively low cost to a city budget, yet it gives lifelong lessons in community and good democratic practices. These are the vibrant, good-minded examples of innovation, sustainability, and peace that should be able to walk hand in hand with the future of technology needs of a community. Yet current San Jose digital inclusion and its technology ideas continually eschew and exclude the language and good purpose of good open public practices. Digital inclusion is continuously, continually excluding how tech accountability can be some of the most interesting and innovative ideas of local community democracy and long-term sustainability at this time. As we are all asking at this time, how to better address the ideas of peace or open democracy and long-term community sustainability. I hope uh, if I have any time remaining, I have 17 seconds. I hope uh, with, with all the ideas of uh, reform, at this time and demilitarization, I hope we can consider how digital conclusion, digital inclusion can consider the ideas of, of what demilitarization and, and reallocation of funding can really mean in San Jose at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leon. 
Hello, Leon speaking. Yes, Chair, Leon. Member, Chair member of council, uh, council, good afternoon. Thank you for your chance to speak on this item. My name is Leon, T-Mobile's government account manager involved with this project. Be before you consider this item before you, I'd like to bring forward a couple of points based on my review of the staff report. The first point being AT&T's download speed at 1,200 megabits per second and upload speed of 150 megabits per second represented on page 17 uh, under attachment C is unobtainable based on 4G LTE specification. Based on my 13 years in the wireless communication, I would like to, uh, I would like to say that the represented speed are not achievable using 4G technology stated on page seven on the staff report that which will be used for, the, for this uh, project. T-Mobile does not have two price model for speed. Our, our, our price for the hotspot devices have the highest speed available. The, the second point is the annual cost of this project to the city of San Jose based on T-Mobile's proposal is inaccurate. It is supposed to be two mil, actually it, it is accurate at $2,2440. Um, uh, and lastly, since the council uh, council member doesn't have the T-Mobile actual proposal before them, uh, T-Mobile would also like to include uh, that all of our program comes with SIPA compliant uh, at, at zero cost to ensure that the connectivity on the hotspot comply with Children's Internet Pro uh, Protection Act. Um, with the cost to the to the city for T-Mobile's proposal at uh, two million two thousand four hundred forty, that's about one point four million dollars savings for the city of San Jose compared to AT&T's proposal, which can help sustain this eleven thousand hotspot program for two years, not just one. So, based on this information, I would respectfully uh, request to have this item continue so that T-Mobile can have a chance to address some of this issue. Thank you for your consideration, and I appreciate the chance to bring this concern before you today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dahlia, welcome. Myself, sorry, I'm like, I'm trying to learn this whole thing. Uh, good evening, city council members and guests. My name is Dahlia Borrego and I work for one of the high schools of Eastside as a parent specialist. My position gives me a great opportunity to interact with students and their families. Let me first commend the city of San Jose for devoting general resources for the bringing and for bringing them together. We appreciate seeing the monetary commitment for the long-term infrastructure as part of the proposal being presented. While we appreciate all the effort being put into this, we need to keep working on quickening the timeline for the long-term infrastructure. Let's move forward quicker. <laughs> we need to solve an immediate problem. Three to four years is too long. Just to give you one example of the immediate need. I have a family with a special ed student. Uh, during the shelter in place, we provided the family with a hotspot, but due to the guardian's lack of knowledge and technology, even with reading instructions or staffs on the phone, he was unable to use this device to help her son get access to the Wi-Fi and the classes that were available to him through the distance learning. The guardian, after um, several days of trying, uh, she finally gave up and she said, "Ms. Borrego, you cannot tell me I did not try. Her son lost almost three months of distance learning teaching. I feel very sad and disappointed that there was nothing else that we could have done for this family. And like this, I have many more stories. Again, I am very thankful for the hotspots, but even as an immediate solution, we do not, they do not work for everyone and are not re reliable on many ways that are sustainable for our students. One way that we can speed up the timeline is by getting the bidding process started to have multiple vendors working on multiple schools at the same time. Again, please focus on the long-term infrastructure now. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Tessa? Tessa, you're on mute. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, OK, good. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, tell you, Mayor Ricardo, that's important is you say our full names. This way, people can follow us on Facebook or whatever. Just saying Tessa doesn't help. So Tessa Woodman C is my name. Okay, and that would be good for every every participant. Tessa, you only listed your first name, but huh? You what? Only listed your first name. What'd you say? You only your first name is listed. Oh really? Oh okay. Well, we'll have to work on that. So we have a lot of things to work on in our digital democracy, and that's what I'm. I want to talk about mostly is our digital democracy because that is the the um, reasoning for all of our education is to be more part of our democracy 
And so we need to um, increase our participation in our democracy as the, you know, where these children who are going to get their digital access have to start participating. And what you're, you're doing now is very critical to encourage a digital democracy, digital inclusion. And that includes never giving up on the Zooming of our, of our council members. We never, meetings, we never go back to the old way of driving to City Hall, parking in our parking lots, flying in, driving in, all that stuff. We need to still keep doing it digitally. That's very, very important that we never go back. And that needs to be our mantra in general for all of the things that we've learned from, from COVID-19 is that we don't, we stay home, we stop driving, we stop flying and, and those things. But getting back to digital democracy, one thing that's really critical is that we have our public comment in the beginning of the meetings because this goes on throughout all of the meetings that I go to, my SAG, my, my you know, general plan meeting, the, gener the public needs to be first because we set the agenda. We the people, this is what, this is addressing one of our crises, which was racial inequities. We set the agenda, we the people, okay? So public comment needs to be in the beginning of all meetings. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, Jeffrey Buchanan on behalf of Working Partnerships USA, uh, would like to encourage the Council to support the Mayor, the medalist from Mayor Licardo and Council Member Arena. i uh, particularly like to thank the staff for all this important work that's happened uh, in recent months in trying to continue the work I know that's been ongoing for some time around digital inclusion. Um, in regards to the proposal in front of you, uh, would like to encourage support for the uh, proposal from AT&T. Certainly understand that negotiations are ongoing. Uh, we've appreciated the opportunity to be able to, since the beginning of this emergency, be in conversation with our brothers and sisters at uh, CWA and trying to think about ways in which uh, AT&T, a good union employer, could get involved in supporting the city of San Jose's efforts. So great to see that some of those negotiations are moving forward. Uh, appreciate the, the focus on both hotspots now and infrastructure in the long term. I think as other uh, others had mentioned, uh, trying to figure out ways if we can expedite uh, some of the planned infrastructure projects around the community Wi-Fi uh, with Eastside Union High School District. Uh, I think we're concerned as working partnerships that not only is it just students, but certainly uh, for those who have lost jobs, the internet is so important. When, whether or not it's, it's getting access to EDD benefits or trying to find a new job, uh, access to internet, uh, the data is pretty clear. If you have it, it, it makes both of those tasks that much easier. And in looking at uh, who have been the callers who've been trying to access help through uh, Santa Clara County uh, COVID Assistance Network, it's a lot of the same zip codes where uh, Eastside Union High School District resides. And so these projects, uh, if they're able to move forward quicker, could help families to be able to recover uh, from the economic impacts of COVID. And so really encourage trying to think about that. Uh, additionally, while the Wi-Fi is certainly needed right now in the short term, in the long term, I hope we continue this uh, commitment to infrastructure. If you look at the costs year on year, once you get into year two or three of this kind of uh, hot spots and data plans uh, uh, type of uh, economics, it, it becomes much more expensive than the infrastructure-based approach. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Lorena Chavez, welcome. Hi, Lorena Chavez with Isa Union High School District. Um, thank you, Mayor Licardo, City Council, um, and everybody working on this project for moving this um, proposal forward. It's taken a lot of work. We know, uh, we appreciate it a lot. Um, we really appreciate seeing the monetary commitment for the long-term infrastructure as part of the official proposal being presented. Um, with that, I wanna ask that we work to quicken the timeline for this long-term infrastructure. We need to move quicker to solve um, this immediate problem. The proposal being presented today suggests that we wait years, years, um, for us to move forward for that. that that's too long. I'd like to remind you that we've been engaging with the city for six plus years, and we've had a strong beginning of this conversation um, or re-engagement in this conversation since COVID hit. Let's work together to continue having that strong conversation and moving quicker. I know somebody else mentioned that um, a way to do this is by speeding up the bidding process to have multiple vendors. Please seriously consider that. We really appreciate hotspots. We really appreciate the funding and a key thing is missing here. It is the timeline. Our families need us now. Please work with us so that we can get this to our families, meaning long-term infrastructure now. Thank you. Thank you. 
I see. Um, the phone number ending in one three six seven uh, to that person. Yes, this is Lillian in uh, District Six. Um, you know, the gentleman that called in about T-Mobile uh, and the bidding war between AT&T and T-Mobile, he did bring up something of interest. He talked about the Internet Protection Act. When you're dealing with students in a classroom, teachers can usually monitor students and what they're on um, and their sites. Uh, the librarian talked about having um, uh, Wi-Fi in areas such as parks, which is a public space. I would like to know how you can monitor, especially students or young students, um, and their sites. If T-Mobile is stating that they have a way to do that, uh, AT&T should up their game. And in order to get this expedited and do it quickly, you could have what is considered fairly a bidding war. But that Internet Protection Act and monitoring students, especially the younger students, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we just lost. No, she just lost. Okay. Uh, if you Lillian, if you happen to get back on, we can take you. Um, Trustee Frank Beal, welcome. Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council, thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Uh, I'm currently serving as the president of the uh, governing board of the Mount Pleasant Elementary School District, uh, which is affected by this particular proposal. Uh, but previously I served for 12 years as a trustee on the Eastside Union High School District and was active in uh, pro uh, providing the, uh, the bond, uh, supporting the bond issue, which provides the funding uh, for this particular project that you're moving forward with today. I wanna say I'm very excited about the progress that has been made over the years and that, uh, that we are now available in the middle of a crisis to move forward very rapidly in implementing a much wider program throughout the east side. Uh, I support the staff recommendation that's been put before you today and uh, hope that you'll be able to move as rapidly as possible in implementing it. I do wanna make it clear though that the bulk of the money in this particular project is coming from uh, property owners on the east side through a bond issue. And so I hope there's no concern from anyone else in the city in saying, well, somehow this is being subsidized. Quite frankly, the city of the east side has stepped up and has provided the bulk of the money uh, in order to provide these services for our students on the east side. But there's also a benefit just to folks that are not students on the east side. And that's where it's important that the city uh, contribute its, its, its fair share. We appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, we think it's an excellent project and uh, hope to continue working for you, with you in the future as we move forward on these issues. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Christina Arsene? Good afternoon, my name is Christina Arismith. I am a teacher in San Jose Unified and a trustee at Campbell Union High School District. Um, first, I'd like to echo some of the other comments. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for moving this work forward and for all of the collaboration that has been taking place. Um, this investment is so necessary, um, not just for students, but all of our residents. Um, and I'm glad that you are willing to take it on. I'm also very happy to see the level of collaboration among the city and the district, along with many other entities, because I think it, it demonstrates the type of shared responsibility that is necessary to confront a problem as big as this. Uh, as we continue this work, I ask that it is being expedited. We're already behind. Our students and families cannot wait. School is starting in just about 50 days and students need the devices and the hotspots now. Um, every day that our residents spend without internet as a basic need that they have is a day that the gap is growing. Um, every day that somebody is not able to access telemedicine is a day where something that could be preventative becomes much more costly in the long term. It's another day that somebody is not able to get benefits. Um, every day that passes is a day that that gap is widening. So making the investment is the first step. And again, so thankful that that is happening. Um, ensuring that it happens as soon as possible is what's required next. Again, this is a way to proactively be providing the services that are available for our community members, but making sure that they actually have access to them. I also want to make sure that we are continuing to keep in mind the long-term infrastructure beyond just the Eastside project, um, but definitely starting there because it's already in the works. Thank you for continuing to prioritize the urgency of this critical and basic need for all of the residents of San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, welcome. 
Yes, Rob DeGuerre. Uh, I'd like to point out that not only on the east side, but we uh, I live on the west side, and uh, I think even Johnny Camus has commented about how poor his internet connection is there. Uh, we need to expand the uh, internet connection throughout the city, and I understand the, the need and the desire to get things going and the source of funding for the east side. And, and more power to you, I think that's great, but I think we also need to expand this program to other parts of the city that uh, are also being affected, but maybe not in the large numbers like what's happening on the east side. Nothing away from the east side. I think the east side should be taken care of, no problem. But I also wanna point out that a number of people that are living outdoors depend on Wi-Fi for their connection. They, most of them uh, don't have much of a data plan if they have one at all and they have little, limited access to the internet as a result of uh, libraries being shut down and a lot of the other public spaces where people would normally be able to connect are uh, unavailable to them. And I, I understand that it's gonna take time to do this, but I also remember one time we were having a meeting and I think it was with Google about putting in uh, fiber throughout the city. And I don't know what's happened with that. And I don't know what areas have been concentrated, but I know that there are a lot of areas in the city that could use something like fiber and that could also be brought into the public schools and, and to the areas that, that were outlined in, in the presentation to bring higher speed, not just this limited speed that they're talking about uh, 1.5 megabits per second, but uh, provide much higher uh, connectivity so people can actually do things like streaming, which is gonna become more, much more important in, into the future as um, learning from home and access from home becomes more and more uh, important. And so we need to consider that. Another thing I would say is we need to go back to these same contracts that I have, I have no access to and make sure that the people that we're trying to serve are actually getting served. And that if we need to increase the number of nodes in a particular area because there's more students or more people in that area that are demanding that connectivity that we can include them in that process through some sort of feedback loop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Nguyen. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, as a school board member of the Campbell Union School District, which serves a large part of West San Jose, uh, it's important to make sure that our families in under-resourced under uh, neighborhoods have access to the internet, especially since education has moved to distance online learning because of COVID-19. I also coach Lincoln High School's mock trial program, and some of my students have to call into the online class to participate. That means that they miss out in visual learning of complex concepts. Um, that makes their growth and development even harder. Now imagine a second grader trying to learn and focus over the telephone uh, without visuals. And that's assuming that they even call in. So I appreciate the city's efforts to close the digital divide um, and encourage faster implementation throughout the city so the achievement gap excuse me, the achievement gap doesn't grow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee George Sanchez, welcome. George, uh, your, uh, your device is still muted right now. We're not able to hear you yet. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hi, <laughs> thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, well, good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and city council members. My name is George Sanchez. Currently, I serve as board president for the Franklin McKinley School District. We, we are extremely concerned about the situation involving internet access for all students in our city. This is especially true in light of the changing educational landscape that we find ourselves in. Uh, failure to access the internet will become very much a hardship for our students and their ability to complete their school assignments in a timely manner. My main concern is that our students will fall further behind without proper internet access, and we see case studies already pointing uh, this out. Uh, at this time, uh, we don't have the luxury of time since the new school year will be with us very shortly, uh, and I would say most schools start uh, the new school year um, in August. Uh, I was very glad to hear this report and thank everyone who worked on it. I urge you uh, to move quickly and support our kids with necessary infrastructure for them to be successful students and become part of the future labor force for Silicon Valley. Uh, thanks to everyone for your time and attention to this critical area. Thank you. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending uh, 5140, welcome. Yes, I live in District 9, 
and we have very poor internet service because we're like one mile away from fiber optic. And that's a major problem for, for everybody. I, don't, I just don't think it's people of low income. Uh, we pay a lot of money on our cell phone and our uh, landline, our, our landline package, if you will, for, for, for internet access. It's still not very good. So I think that the city needs to go speak with, you know, these companies just for the whole city, not just for people who, who are under privileges, you know, the people who are paying are, are getting, getting ripped off even more. And if people are having a hard time with internet access, they may want to go to a plan where they can hotspot off of their, off of their cell phone, maybe educate the public on that. Cause everybody does have a cell phone and there are low income packages that are being promoted by AT and T I see them on TV all the time. You have to be low income, but they give you unlimited access for like $10 a month. So I think those, those plans are out there, but in general, the infrastructure, at least in D9 from, from the pub, from a public utility and, and the uh, internet are, are very poor. And uh, they, yeah, I just get a lot of excuses from, from everybody. And I think that you guys have the political power and pressure to put on these companies to provide proper service for everybody. That's it. Thank you. Scott Larkin. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Scott Largin. I interesting hearing a lot of the feedback from the community as far as uh, you know access to Wi-Fi, access to the internet. Uh, in a previous life, I owned an electronics business. I had hotspots. I had the, you know the BlackBerry, all the latest and greatest, you know, unlimited data plans, and never really had to worry about anything. Um, over the last three or four years, it has been a fight to have access to Wi-Fi. Um, I just blow past my data plan on my phone. I'm trying to utilize apps and services through our county and city um, that require a more advanced phone, require more internet access. And even attending these meetings, it's the same case. Um, the homeless community at the moment right now, um, you know, they just don't have access to pretty much anything. We cut off not only the internet, we cut off the water for them. So. I, I'm just worried that people are not paying attention to things like that. When COVID hit, and including these riots, the homeless community just got hosed. And it sounds like we're doing the same thing to the east side community. They all get COVID. They all don't get internet access. They get a horrible representation from our criminal justice system. They get horrible access to service through our family court system. Um, it's just they get hosed, hosed, hosed. And, and these are the people that pretty much help build Silicon Valley. Our east side Mexican community just gets chucked to the back of the bus. They, it's just so sad. And these are good, hardworking Americans that need to be able to access the internet. They need services and they need their voices to be heard. And the one gal that went on there, she's right about public comment. It needs to be in the beginning of these meetings. You need to stop ripping up speaker cards, Ricardo, and you need to give the American public the right to criticize your pathetic leadership in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Albert Gonzalez, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Ricardo and uh, council members. Just wanna say and applaud you really on uh, the work you're doing here and thanks staff there for uh, working on this. I know that uh, with uh, my knowledge and uh, work with uh, the East Side and Trustee Beal as far as uh, the work that's been done, there's a lot of work that's been done, but. Uh, as some of the folks mentioned, um, time is of the essence. And how we uh, try to expedite this, I think, is is uh, is probably going to be challenging, but at the same time, it is needed with these uh, uncertain times and uh, distance learning. Uh, obviously, uh, speed and internet access is something that uh, our most needed, our most uh, under-resourced students uh, need, and uh, sometimes find find it challenging uh, with hotspots and some of these uh, interim measures to to meet their needs, but. Uh, as you work forward to uh, to work with partners, whether it's AT and T or whoever you've chosen, there it's, it's AT and T now. But um, to leverage not only those partnerships, but to make sure that they provide the uh, quality access that the students need, not only for education but also for uh, tele telemedicine and some of the other things that uh, you know the families there on the east side and throughout the city of San Jose uh, require. Um, you know, representing the north part of San Jose in El Viso and uh, some of the mobile home parks and your or enclaves that have uh, risen there in North San Jose. That's always been a, a challenge, but uh, 
um, it's something that we definitely need to make sure that they have the uh, the access. I can tell you, working up there in North San Jose, access to some of those providers are not the, is not the best, even if you have a hotspot. So definitely leverage and make sure you keep an eye on on our partners to make sure that they're uh, providing that quality uh, internet access that's needed. Um, definitely, uh, as far as expediting, anything that can be done to expedite it would be beneficial to the students, provide the education opportunities that our students need. And just a couple of points at the state level, though, there's a Senate Bill 1130 from, uh, not, not related to me, but Gonzalez, that uh, is working with, uh, is, is on the table right now to work with uh, PUC to provide uh, communities that are under-resourced with better uh, broadband connectivity. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mishi? Oh, hello. Uh, hello, Mayor, City Council members. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I appreciate the long hours that you all work and the time that you put in. Thank you. Um, and also, I think it's a great, I, I think it's wonderful that we're moving forward with, with um, broadband and that that's really necessary for our communities. But there is something that I wanted to mention, and that is that the city of San Jose authorized some homeless uh, sweeps, and uh, they started yesterday. They're continuing today. Digital inclusion expenditure plan. Would you like to speak on the digital inclusion expenditure plan? Well, you know, I, I I'm looking at this in terms of public safety. You know, okay. but that's not this item. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're turning to council now. Uh, I just had a couple quick questions um, for Kip or Jill. If we could just go back to the comparison chart with all the options. I understand that you guys have been negotiating this, I'm sure around the clock, um, not much time. Um, but I, I know that we, but we as a council, of course, haven't had a chance to really poke around and understand it ourselves. And um, <clears throat> with regard to the comparison of the options, I'm just wondering, you know, the commitment term of two years versus one year would seem to be a concern. And um, in addition to, uh, see, I thought I saw a difference on the download speeds, but those appear to be similar. I'm looking at the middle, T-Mobile option, which is the third column. I'm just trying to understand why we would turn down the two years over the one year. Can you help me understand that a little better? Yeah, I'll go ahead, Jill. I was gonna start off just by commenting that um, the, the funding scenario that we have is that we are, um, we only had funding for a period of time associated with the emergency event. Right. And so we were not looking to commit to a longer uh, period than a year, but Kip, you might want to um, elaborate on that. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, Jill. In addition, I just, um, I say a couple of things. One, uh, the, the deal presented uh, last week by uh, T-Mobile is actually a good deal. We, we, we happen to think that the AT&T is a better deal. Um, so we, just a little bit of context, we reached out to all of our partners to engage around digital inclusion. AT&T was the first to respond with a robust offer and we began to work on that partnership with them. So we provided, uh, reached out to provide uh, other partners an alternative, an opportunity to propose. We received T-Mobile and Comcast last week and, and worked rapidly to analyze them. Our analysis determined that, again, in our estimation, that that ATT proposal is the best fit with both the community needs and the constraints of the resources, mm -hmm. the one-time resources that we have available for the city. So just a couple of additional points very quickly on why we, we've recommended the at and One is that we do believe that we will offer significantly higher video speeds, which is an important um, piece. We'll be ground truthing that with the actual device in the field before we finalize an agreement with at and but we expect that given the nature of the network, we can see speeds up to two or three times faster. And with video being one of the primary uh, uses for distance learning, we think that's significant. Also, at and has an existing agreement with us to build out their small cell network in a very impressive way, including a lot of extension of fiber. And they have agreed to 
invest specifically in the areas of that have the biggest need and enhance their connectivity and the speeds in the areas where we have gaps or we have lower speeds. So we have an additional uh, commitment from them to rap more rapidly build out the small cells in the area of highest need. Uh, third point, which we found uh, compelling, was that they are uh, ready to deploy rapidly, um, 60 to 90 day time frame, and have that committed to us. They are also offering up to 50 staff who would come with proper social distancing, PPE, to support a quick and organized hotspot deployment um, in specific multiple locations throughout the city. And finally, uh, their deal gives us the flexibility to distribute additional devices to other vulnerable populations, such as seniors that we've talked about, whereas some of the other packages were uh, uh, focused on students. I do want to note that all of the devices provided to the students uh, in AT&T's plan would be SIPA compliant, which is the regulations governing the internet protection for children. Um, so those student devices would be compliant with that under this deal. So a little bit more than you asked for, Mayor, but, but we believe that while the T-Mobile proposal was was a good one and we were appreciative to get that from them. We believe that uh, uh, hands down the AT&T proposal is the best fit both with the needs and the constraints of our existing resources. Thanks Kip, appreciate all that information. Um, and we were not getting the kind of commitments from T-Mobile around um, schedule in terms of being able to build out within three months. Uh, that was not part of their proposal. Again, you know, given a couple of weeks to go around, they might have refined that proposal, but we were working on a very tight timeline and taking the proposals as offered uh, and working from them. And again, we'd had, we'd had the AT&T proposal first and then had reached out to others to make sure that they had a chance. But um, again, given, given more time, we might be able to refine any of those proposals, but we did not have that commitment from T-Mobile as part of their proposal. Okay. And I'm trying to make sure I keep it all straight. T-Mobile and Sprint merged. So is that mobility now? I, I, I can never. Uh, they are merged. Uh, they've been, we've been interfacing with the T-Mobile folks who also represent Sprint, uh, in the, the entire merged entity. I don't know. I, I'm a little short on their rebranding at this point. But, okay. but the, the folks who identify themselves as T-Mobile also represent the Sprint side of, of the business. They're okay, so we have signed a deal with their parent company on the small cells, right? Yeah, we, we signed a deal with Extinet representing Sprint on the small cells uh, and, and at a much smaller scale deployment than the either the AT&T or the Verizon deal. The AT&T and Verizon were by far the bulk of the small cell work that we're doing, but we continue to engage with T-Mobile around work on macro towers um, and, and hopefully expediting some of that work for them as well. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And then. Finally, on the refurbishment of the devices, I know we've been working with various contractors who refurbish all their devices. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised to see the cost is so high per device, and I don't pretend to know how to do it myself, so I, I, you know, I'm sure that's a reasonable cost. But as we think about the options, you know, you think about the cheapest, I don't think it would be a Chromebook, but whatever it would be that would be the cheapest standard device that we could put in a student's hands that would still enable them to be able to do the work we know they need to do. Um, do you have any sense of what the gap is between that and the up to 250, I'm sorry, $250 per device on refurbishing? I think that it depends, Mayor, um, on the different schools have identified, as you know, the list of different devices. And one of the things that maybe the root of your question is the same question I had, which is we would like to do a little bit of a of a of um, an ROI of on the refurbishment process, so that we can understand if it's uh, more cost effective just to purchase new devices. Right. Than, but but you know we do want to honor the device drive um, model and the fact that we live in a in a valley with people with lots of devices that still function. And perhaps there's a way for us to get that um, individual cost of refurbishment down. Okay, well, I appreciate you wanting to give it a try and I guess I would too. I, um, I just, I would assume that a lot of these schools have great uh, packages with suppliers that probably get them pretty low rates too and hate to think we'd be spending, you know, we could go buy a new device, but I'm sure you, you're thinking through all that. So, and, and we're working closely with uh, Superintendent Juan on that balance. So um, we did want to just put this placeholder in to honor those device drives. Um, but again, we we're, are we're looking at if we can solve for connectivity, which this package is intended to do, 
then to really focus on solving for devices with some of the other resources that you mentioned earlier. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Council Member Rennes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also wanna thank you, Jill and Kip for your leadership in this uh, area. And, um, you know, as we face uh, many different issues uh, because of COVID, one being um, something that already existed pre-COVID and that's access to um, uh, health options for our community as well as the income disparities. We know that COVID has exacerbated those and has just made them absolutely um, difficult for our community to move ahead, to connect with doctors, to um, get another job. Um, and we, we as a council and you as a mayor, um, we saw the value in established in really um, supporting this so that our systems couldn't deepen those di uh, disparities. And I'm really proud of the work that we're all doing together to make this happen. Um, and I'd like to thank um, our school board members that wrote a letter that, that kind of uh, re-engaged all of us in a way that I don't think that they anticipated that, that they, we would. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think most of the school board members already called and so I'm glad that they, am, am I frozen or is the mayor frozen? Um, I might be, I uh, know. Okay, I, I wasn't sure, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm looking at the screen and-, and it, um, We can hear you fine, I'll just say that. We can hear you fine. You're, you're actually blacked out on the screen. Oh, is that? And I have my video on. That is strange. Okay, then I will do yeah, that. We'll... Okay. <laughs> That's so strange. Well, I guess it, it, it's, it proves a point. <laughs> proves a point <laughs> for digital inclusion. All right. So, so uh, I, you know, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I know that this is you, we're creating um, uh, an opportunity for a lot of our communities to one have health access, two access to education, and three access to to a future job and hopefully a quick recovery for for them and for their families. And so I know that it came with a lot of lot of work um, that presented at a time where you already had. Uh, a full workload. And so I, I appreciate the additional time that you spent here, um, Kip and uh, Jill, and I know many members of your office, um, Mayor. I also want to thank um, my staff um, because part of, part of uh, making sure that we're not duplicating efforts was getting on these uh, eight o'clock um, meetings, uh, Zoom meetings every Saturday morning to make sure that County wasn't duplicating and Office of Ed wasn't duplicating what we were doing. Um, and so I want to thank my staff, uh, in particular, Monica Rodriguez, and of course, uh, my chief of staff, Patrick McGarity, who also um, were very mindful of a lot of the details. And as we were uh, uh, traversing through this, we realized that we could have a very complementary role to, to the um, to the county and and we are actually seeing that they're they're going to hopefully you know knock on wood they're going to approve 11,000 devices we're going to approve 11,000 hotspots and so that really goes hand in hand with our efforts and in making sure that these this uh, this kind of access um, is provided to our community and so um, I'm really grateful that I think uh, a further end result I think this is this is proof that we can really uh, coordinate with our county counterparts and bring the most that, uh, possible to, uh, for our communities. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud of the effort that, that has resulted in all of this. And so it, it is absolutely comprehensive. And I'll start with what um, the mayor, where the mayor left off, and that was with the device refurbishment. Um, as I, I was just stating that the county is already set to purchase 11,000 devices. And at one point, I know they were not going to include the city of San Jose because they thought that we had the money, um, but they are inclusive of the city of San Jose. Wouldn't this really address uh, our device need, uh, Jill or Kip, um, instead of spending so much on the device uh, refurbishment? I agree with, with uh, the mayor that um, you know, 250, you might as well buy a new Chromebook. I get that 
older students need laptops and they're more sophisticated. And of course they don't, they start at 250 and maybe that's even not possible anymore, but um, can we create a cap for maybe the different type of devices so that we don't refurbish an item, we don't spend too much money on, on particular items? Certainly. I mean, you know, I don't think we've discussed that before, but we can look at an itemized list of the costs. Uh, what you have is an estimate based on one um, large project that was done, is my understanding. And so um, we could uh, set a cap. That, that would be great. The funds could also redirect to new Wonderful. And I think, um, I think you already recognize that Dr. Dewan has, um, uh, she has a, the ability to, to purchase items at a, at a mass level. So I think um, when we compare that with, with what we're spending on a refurbished um, uh, device, I, I think it makes more sense. But I absolutely, you know, we, we produced, I think, 120 devices in our device drive. And so I want them to be used, but if it makes sense, only if it makes sense, that it's what the, our students need. So thank you for, for uh, considering that. I heard loud and clear um, a lot of our uh, the members, uh, school board members, and just community said that they wanted to make sure that that our, the connection to the internet was happened a little bit sooner. And so I wonder. I know Independence and Oak Grove is set to um, be completed in 2022. What would it take to have that complete in phase two in 2021? Is that possible? So in the presentation, I know it was quick because we we're trying to get through everything, but the as we as you know, I think for the future attendance areas, we have to go out for an RFP to to find a new provider or to, you know, find it have a new contract with a provider to work with. And so we can put in the RFP our preference that there be um, an, an expedited timeline and then we would find out what it would take. We could answer that exact question. So is it that we enter into contract with multiple providers at once? Is, it, is there a provider who can scale quickly and um, help us implement multiple projects at once? And what's the, the impact to the cost and the city at that time? But that is our intent to put that in the RFP. That's why we really, we don't have the ability to adjust a, a timeline for this presentation because it is dependent on that RFP. Does that make sense? Sure, you cut out a little bit, but I, I believe what you said was that you're going to rely on that RFP uh, to, to better inform you in, in terms of the timeline and just for the sake of this presentation, it's a bit of a placeholder. Well, we, we will have to... Um, you have to work out a timeline with the actual entity that's going to be doing the work. And so as we're um, issuing the RFP, we'll ensure that the expedited timeline is part of the project. Perfect. Perfect. I'm really glad to hear. I'm sure that a lot of folks who are listening are also glad to hear that. Um, and so would that also be true for uh, completing phase three in 2022, which is, you know, those other sites that have not had any real commitment from the Eastside Union High School um, district just yet? We'll be working with Eastside to understand the full timeline for the build out. I know that the largest issue for them still has been the, um, the fiber issues at Mount Pleasant, mm -hmm. um, but they are looking at for that as well. And they, they send their regrets. They weren't able to join us today, but they're supportive of the plan. Well, with that, I'd also like to recognize Chris Funk, even if he isn't on this on the Zoom, um, for his partnership and his leadership uh, for Eastside Union High School uh, District. Um, he's been a wonderful uh, collaborator. All right. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged to hear that this is not an absolute um, uh, timeline, but that it, it can flow depending on the type of feedback that you get on that RFP. Um, the next questions I had were on the Wi-Fi uh, the Wi-Fi hotspots. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the methods that you're looking at in the schools and also with about 3,000 that would be left over for non-student populations. 
what can we do to make sure that we're providing hotspots outside of, of areas with library? Um, can we create checkout processes at community centers? I think, and or reuse sites. Um, for example, maybe having a hot uh, some checkouts for Meadow Fair, um, which is definitely not near a library and some of our uh, uh, trailer uh, park homes that are what a bit away from from our community centers and our libraries. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of options for how to how we get materials out into communities. I think the the concept of checking out through the library just gives us a platform for managing an inventory. And we already have a good infrastructure for that. But as you know, we, we work with a lot of partners to bring materials out to either through our mobile vehicles, through our bridge libraries. We, um, one of the things, I mean, this is a new idea. It's very exciting if it gets approved and we negotiate and execute. Part of that process would be um, understanding and identi working with partners to understand uh, how do we make sure that we get to the right families or the right households that need um, hotspots that aren't going to be covered by the school districts. Uh, but it is an exciting way to to realize, and you know, some of the commenters have have had concerns that the and we know that the issues aren't just on the east side. This is a way to provide really targeted solutions into neighborhoods where there are connectivity issues um, that will not be covered by Access East Side. So um, our our usual process is that we work with partners who have strong relationships in the community, whether it be community centers, um, other organizations, and we would definitely work with council offices to understand that better. I, I appreciate that. I know that you um, began your um, memo making sure that you had an equitable approach in um, using and, and using that data uh, to decide where and how you would um, go about this. And so for me, I think one of the areas that I'd like for you to maybe revisit is some of the com uh, community centers. Mm -hmm. I think there's some that might not be in the area that um, actually need that support um, and, and, you know and I don't I'm not going to point them out at this point but one of the items one of the areas that I was concerned about is the Welch Community Center although it's in the backyard of Overfelt it really is just outside of that coverage area and and it is um, on the backside of a, a trailer home community and um, it also serves a lot of uh, a lot of families who come in across the street from King Road um, in Valley Palms and uh, on the other side of Tully um, in the Meadow Fair neighborhood. And so even though these folks um, go, even though these students attend um, school there, they don't necessarily live around that uh, Overfelt High School. And so they wouldn't have necessarily that access. And so I'm glad that you're you're um, creating another um, strategy to uh, to make sure that there's a safety net for those folks. Um, and so I um, I produced a, a memo to make sure that we considered um, Welch Park last year. Um, I think you you know this because we worked together on making sure that some of that um, fiber was was uh, routed over from from K.R. Smith over to the Welch um, as we considered having a small library checkout uh, center there. And I'm still not, I've not lost hope in that um, because I, our community still um, is yearning for that as, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, that our Barnes and Noble was taken away and that was their, that was their library, even if they had to purchase books, that was their library. Um, and so um, I'd like to move my, uh, my memo, which accepts the mayor's memo, and it also includes, and of course, your, your staff report, uh, Jill, and it also includes uh, um, an ask for the next report on digital inclusion for the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee, um, so we can have an update on, on how we expanded the outdoor Wi-Fi to reuse centers, um, to provide an update on east side access and provide information for a thorough discussion on how we can accelerate the timeline for phase two and phase three, which is something that we have already just discussed. And, and I'm, and I'm uh, in agreement that, that we probably will see some of that change as you um, uh, approach RFPs. Um, 
And then lastly, provide an update on how we're going to ensure that we effectively get 3,000 hotspots for and not set aside for schools into our community to, to our high needs residents and to allocate um, 11,000 from the funding for the outdoor Wi-Fi at libraries, community centers and parks to add Welch Community Center to that plan. That's already approved today. I think, you know, we're halfway there. We already spent uh, um, some money in investment at Welch Park Community Center. I think that this is the uh, opportunity to really um, have some fruition from that investment. Um, and so my motion is to uh, uh, to move all of the all of what I've just finished uh, reading off. Do I hear a second? Second. My motion is second. Um, thank you, Councilman Reyes. Um, if I could just ask for some clarification, because I, I'm not sure I know there are allocations that were made on the in the presentation. It's not all spelled out, I don't think, in the memo. I know that this has all been done very, uh, very quickly. And I'm just trying to understand how the allocation works and whether or not an allocation to a particular community center disrupts um, whatever staff had previously recommended. And it'd be helpful just to understand, if so, who wins, who loses on this. Um, the, the, uh, the 500, I'm sorry, the $457,000 it's allocated either Jill or, or Kip, that's allocated to Wi-Fi at libraries, community centers, and parks. The staff, I, I know I saw a list of some of those parks on, on a, one of the charts in the present. Was that all allocated already? There are, there's a few different lists. The one that we're talking about with the, for the, the, um, the request in this proposal is on, was on the slide, and it's also an attachment B of the memo. Um, it includes nine libraries and eight community centers. Okay, so that's and intact. The I, I think that they, um, the short answer to the question is that there is a much larger need and that is something that we'd probably wanna come back to the city to council um, with more information about, you know, maybe this becomes phase one of a pilot. We see how um, exterior Wi-Fi is utilized. Uh, but the library and parks department, PRNS departments selected those sites based on a number of different factors. It certainly, um, the, the priority index certainly did come into play uh, for the high need, right? But, but it isn't the only factor, I believe, in, in uh, PRNS's selection of community centers, because there are other reasons why a community center needs Wi-Fi, such as if there's an emergency and they need to stand up that you know that's the emergency building that's used for shelter you know there were other reasons that that there were recommendations mm -hmm. and that parks sometimes aren't as easy to add to a list because there may be no infrastructure so um we did look at, so they may be more expensive is what i'm saying um we did look into welch park though and as this the council member said there was an effort this past year, there's been investment there. There is already um, fiber, I guess, or you know, I'm not sure the technical term for what brings internet there in this case, but um, that it would actually not be very costly to add Welch Park to the list if that is the, um, the recommendation. Um, and it, it's likely that it could be, it could might even be able to be done within the existing um, pr proposed budget. But it, we estimated it's about eleven thousand dollars. So it's 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 tremendously minimal for an impact to a neighborhood that is, as a council member said, kind of in between service areas that will be served by the um, the different community Wi-Fi programs. Okay, so you're saying it seems to be a unique case because there's some significant amount of cost that's already been taken care of with some infrastructure that's there. Correct. Okay, and it just helpful for me because I know we're trying to orient our, our spending uh, and ground it in equity and focus on needs. And I just wanna make sure we're not subverting that process here. In other words, there's nothing that's being knocked out by putting this in. And also that neighborhood would qualify with the um, priority dis the index, yes. Okay, so okay. That I, believe, I believe the departments were trying to prioritize you know, sort of higher use facilities, multiple uses for the Wi-Fi and, and the doability and focused on large community centers um, as opposed to taking on, you know, the huge um, 
assets that we own in terms of parks and right. smaller facilities. So does anyone get knocked out if Welch goes in? I guess that's part of what I'm, okay. Because the amount is so small. Correct. Okay, great. That's wonderful. I just want to make sure I understand what the consequences are. Thank and you. additionally, um, Mayor, there are other sites that I think we, sh we should take a look at uh, twice because there's Willow Glen and um, Cypress and they're not necessarily in the areas where um, the need for additional Wi-Fi overlaps. And so um, I think my area does and to overlook it would just be a travesty especially because it's $11,000 to invest in this community so that they could have increased access to the internet. Yeah, I, I'm fine supporting the motion. I just wanna understand what the criteria are and make sure we're all being consistent because obviously um, we know that this is what everyone would want in their park or their community center, or their library. And we are trying to distribute the resource in a, in, a, in a principled way. And I just want to make sure we understand, everyone understands that this is aligned with those principles. Um, okay, Council Member Camus. There, uh, Council Member Camus has stepped out. He has to recuse himself on this item. He owns uh, at t stock. So uh, he has stepped out. Thank you for reminding me, Rick. Thank you. Council Member Carrasco. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I know that this is a, 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 an item that uh, all of us have been, well, some of us have been working on for quite some time. Uh, Council Member Arenas actually asked a few questions that I was really interested in, in terms of uh, expediting the, the timeline. As we know, uh, with COVID-19, we suddenly saw the great need to make sure that uh, our kiddos were, were connected and they had access. Uh, this is something that we theoretically have been talking about for some time, and uh, and we're talking about the digital divide. Uh, at, at some point, we didn't feel such a sense of urgency until COVID-19 hit, and then suddenly we were all uh, finding ourselves in, uh, in, in a sense of desperation, trying to get our, our uh, students connected and, and realizing that half the city uh, was not connected and, and, uh, and many of our students were, were at a huge disadvantage. And, uh, you know, just, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if any of you have had an opportunity to read the latest uh, findings by San Jose State, which are really quite alarming. Uh, it was a study that was done in conjunction with, um, I'll tell you in just a second, I'm pulling it up. Uh, but they call it the Silicon Valley Pain Index. And among, among some of the findings that they, they're reporting, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I had no idea. Uh, it's interesting to, to learn that there's approximately, there's approximately 75,000 millionaires in Silicon Valley. Who would have thought? But uh, the very few of those are African American or Latino, and in fact, in fact, uh, fifty-seven percent of uh, our families are uh, Latino families are living in impoverished conditions, and something uh, like forty-seven percent African uh, American families are living in impoverished conditions, uh, and. Uh, 47% African-American, 57% Latino are not self-sufficient. And so I, I challenge you to read the article. I think it's an interesting article to read. Uh, it, it also talks about the, uh, the um, it also talks about the uh, educational gap. And it talks about the individuals who are still not graduating from high school. Uh, and it's uh, a stark difference when you look at African-American Latino students and then their white counterparts. So uh, making sure that we give our children every possible tool that they can use to, to, uh, to it's not an advantage, it's just really leveling the playing field and giving them the opportunities that they need in order to be somewhat competitive 
in uh, in a rapidly changing workforce is uh, is uh, every bit our responsibility as everything else. So uh, I thank everybody for for working so hard on this. I hope that we can expedite the timeline. Uh, as one of the speakers said, 50 days. I didn't even realize that. I thought I was going to be able to take a little bit of a break with my kids. Doesn't look like it. 50 days goes by very, very fast, especially, you know, when we have to deal with so much, um, you know, steps and processes. Uh, 50 days is a, a blink of an eye. And so I hope that we can expedite some of this and make sure that our kids are, are, are ready to learn with all the tools that we can make available to them, especially those who have been uh, already disadvantaged uh, by so many of already uh, of the stated reasons. I, I don't have a great deal of hope that we're gonna be fully reopened come fall. I don't think that our kiddos are gonna be in a classroom. I think that they're going to be in a staggered situation. I don't even know what that looks like. But I do know that what that translates into is a lot of disadvantage for our children. And so uh, I thank you again. I know that, that this is a, a reality that's starting to really sink in for, for a lot of us. I think uh, for those that were struggling with those realities, we're starting to finally believe it. And I'm grateful for that. I don't care how we got there. I think we're finally getting there, whether it was uh, George Floyd's death whether it was the riots, whether it was the Black Lives Matter movement, but I really uh, appreciate, um, I appreciate uh, whatever it is that has moved us there to finally start to understand that racial uh, disparities and racial systemic uh, inequities absolutely exist, and especially in the city of San Jose, it is in the DNA of our city and there is a difference between the east side and the west side, and definitely in Silicon Valley, which we're seeing article after article after article, that there is uh, a wealth discrepancy uh, where African-American and Latino students and uh, African-American and Latino workers do not get to benefit from the same kind of wealth. And that's for many, many different reasons. And so um, I, I do appreciate that we're finally starting to address it and hopefully addressing it in a very systematic, uh, very uh, strategic, very intentional way instead of, uh, instead of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, no disrespect, but hopefully instead of denying it, really addressing it. So I appreciate again, your uh, help, your assistance in uh, giving our kids a future that they can look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, I was, I was muted, my apologies. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanna say that uh, I spent a lot of time, particularly being up on KIPP. And uh, so I want to have a public acknowledgement of uh, the, the hard work and dedication of not only uh, you, KIPP, but your, your team and Jill and your team and all the people that have been involved with this process. We gave you a challenge of getting something done and overcoming all the obstacles and barriers to get it done quickly. And you have accomplished that. So I really uh, want to acknowledge that. I appreciate, again, all the hard work, focus, and dedication because we were really concerned that our kids were going to miss out on an opportunity to continue their education. And now that we know that they're going to have an opportunity to be connected, to, to continue their studies and not fall further and further behind, I think it's a, a great accomplishment for both the staff and the city. Uh, I wanted to also reference um, the conversation about refurbished uh, products. Um, it really depends on if there's value in terms of processing speed, graphic cards, the amount of memory. So depending on how robust that device is will dictate how um, the value that you're getting for the investment. So if you're spending 150 to $250 for a device that's robust enough for particularly older students to be able to engage in um, 
video production, access other applications that require a lot of uh, processing power, then it would be worth uh, the amount of uh, expenditure that we spend if it's 150 to $250. So I just wanna make that point. Also, I, I'm not sure about um, what type of warranties that we'll have with a refurbished product, but typically there's a, a one-year warranty with that device when it's refurbished. So there's also additional value there. Um, some of the cheaper devices that we can buy, again, do not have the uh, capacity to do a lot of the functions that we're gonna ask the, the students to take on. So again, thank you for all the hard work and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I should note that uh, of course, $2 million uh, as part of this, what, eight point. $3 million package, I think, is coming from CDBG and want to thank in particular the housing department for all their work and their analysis uh, that enabled uh, us to actually free that money to be used uh, for this purpose. We appreciate all their work as well. A lot of hands in this one and we appreciate everyone working so hard. Okay, so um, we have a motion. Uh, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Alice? Aye. Yep. Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Bully? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right, uh, we'll, uh, that passes unanimously. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for all the great work. Uh, we'll move on then to 3.10, which is an extension of proclamation local emergency related to COVID-19. I should note, I believe that there was a memorandum filed by Council Member Carrasco, but I didn't see it online. I just wanna confirm, did that get online, Tony? Um, I need to check. Okay. It's. Um, it's particularly important because it has to do with the extension deadline. Uh, in the meantime, why don't I call on Tessa, who is waiting in public comment? Tessa Wibbensy. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, well, in terms of COVID nineteen, in terms of the emergency declaration, I yes, I I guess maybe the question is, do we keep doing the emergency declaration or not? Or, not sure what the issue is, but we do need to keep doing the emergency. I think my mask off. We do need to keep doing the emergency declaration. And um, because we are in emergency, um, we are in four crises. We have our climate crisis, our ecological collapse, our pandemic pollution crisis, and our housing crisis. And at all time, and then of course we have our, um, you know, our, our, crisis of caring for each other. And that maybe is the root of all of the issues that we're facing in terms of Black Lives Matter is how well we care for each other. And like the sign said in the protest, you know, make America kind again. And that is the basis of how we have to be in all of our, all of our um, actions. We need to really think about it, um, how we care about another person and not to be hypocritical. Because like I said, way back, you know, in terms of even gun violence, how can we tell our children not to take guns to shoot when we, when we drive our cars and we pollute, we are hurting each other. So we have to be authentic in that. But getting back to, you know, climate crisis, yes, we need to really focus on that. Like even PG&E and people were saying that <laughs> we have to be prepared and resilient. And what that means is to live without fossil fuels. And it has to be much more intensive and it needs to be off-grid solar um, battery operated, and we need a lot more resiliency in terms of growing food, food security. These are the issues that we need to be addressing with our community and um, every, in every action that we take, focusing on our, um, our crises and making sure we're resilient and ready for that. And that does come for, you know, in terms Thank of you. creating. Thank you, Blair. Hi. Um... For this issue of talking about uh, the declaration of emergency of COVID-19, um, I wanted to remind, uh, I started talking about this a week or two ago. I brought it up at uh, County Board of Supervisors also. 
there's been some really good ideas with uh, census data collection uh, this past year. And that was a really hard fought battle to, to make sure that there can be good civil rights and good civil protection ideas in what can be census data collection. And uh, I wanted to remind that of yourselves and how data is going to be collected a lot at this time uh, with COVID-19. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's important good stuff to, to, to remember and, and as, as we will be collecting data at this time, what, what are good civil rights and good civil protection ideas that go along with that data that we're collecting. And uh, I hope you can apply your best to that. And um, I, you know, we, we, this is going to be a few years and it's how do we, how do we balance that? And uh, good luck to all, us, to all of us in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Uh, Scott Largent. Oh, sorry about that. A little uh, technical difficulty here on my end. I, I believe we're still on the uh, COVID-19 issue. So if I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, off topic on a lot of this stuff, but I, I think I'm dead on right here. Uh, w when the COVID issue, when the COVID pandemic first hit, I was very impressed, uh, Mayor Licardo, that you stopped the sweeps. I thought it was a good time to do that. Um, I was actually impressed. I, I know I criticized you a lot, but I was like, wow, you know, he's kind of going in the right direction right here. What kind of happened afterwards is the homeless were all kind of left to the side. Um, we have now, and, and you know this, Mayor Licardo, the sweeps have started again. And I believe that our state did something or put something in place that was preventing this. I don't know the exact terminology. Um, I believe your word was basically put right out there on, on the news media stating that these wouldn't happen. Why are we not prepping for this stuff with the homeless community? Why are we not sitting down with them and trying to find options right now? The encampment that is being swept right now under Highway 87 in Santa Clara Street is predominantly, you ready for this, African-American. Of all things an encampment, that, that I, I was shocked going in there yesterday. Do black lives not matter when you're homeless? That's a good question right now. Maybe Mayor Licardo, you can grab your smarty phone, continue with this meeting and walk over there and just take a look. These people have nowhere to go. They're in the middle of traffic. They're sunburned. They're dehydrated. Just everything that they've gone through with the pandemic, the riots, I mean, we chased these people like dogs and thought they were protesters downtown. They need more care. They need more help. You're, you're going with both barrels right now and you're gonna be doing these sweeps. It's not gonna turn out good for the city right now. It's really not. This is just gonna erupt into more riots, more protesting and more problems. Thank you. Thank you. The person with the phone number 4963, welcome. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell, Regional Manager for GSMOL Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, representing mobile home residents. I speak in support of the Carrasco memo, which in its simplicity lies its importance. It only extends- no, I misled you, Martha. I think that um, Councilman Carrasco's memo is on 8.1, I've been told. Yeah. I mistook and believed it was on 3.10, on the extension of the eviction moratorium, not on the extension of the Okay, so I should call back then? Yeah, so we'll be taking that up at eight, uh, later on 8.1. So All eight, right, four, five, thank five. you. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, Robert. Yeah, Robert Aguirre. Uh, I would like to point out that the numbers of reported cases has gone up in the last few days. I think it was 87 or something like that yesterday. Uh, so we're, we're not out of the woods as far as this COVID-19 goes. As a matter of fact, I think uh, we need to really hunker down a little better so that these numbers don't continue to climb. And uh, I don't have a source of where these people were uh, when they contracted COVID-19. It'd be nice if we had that kind of information, some sort of tracking, so that we could figure out, you know, was it as a result of the protest or was it was a result of opening up of restaurants or opening up of whatever. Uh, so we can better understand what the situation is. I appreciate the fact that we're doing much more testing and probably a lot of numbers came from that as well. 
And uh, that's something we should continue doing because we need to be able to have as much light on this problem and not consider continue uh, operating in the dark, trying to guess where things are. Uh, I'd also like to talk about the, the people that are in hotels and motels and uh, they have no idea how long they're gonna be, uh, continue to be housed uh, as the people that were in the uh, trailers suddenly found themselves uh, out of a place to live. Some of them went to hotels and motels but some of them didn't, some went out in the streets. And I don't know exactly how they went down but the fact is that most of those people did not get enough advance warning that this program that they were in that they thought they were gonna be secure in was suddenly uh, coming to an end. Uh, I think it was pretty despicable how that was handled. And uh, I think people need to know uh, very well in advance what's going to happen so that they can plan properly and be able to uh, situate themselves in the best possible manner. Uh, and we need to recognize the fact that there are so many more people that are continuing to live in the streets that have lived in the streets beyond uh, the beginning of this COVID-19 that have remained out there that are uh, at risk and I know there's testing that's been going on in, in those communities. I think we need to continue doing that. And uh, I, I think this uh, should be extended for as long as possible until we at least have a handle on the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Moto G. Yeah, I'm gonna basically follow up a little bit on what Scott and Robert said. Um, I just can't harp enough on the failure of the trailers and how poorly people were treated. Um, we definitely do need to give people in the hotels a couple of months notice or 30 days notice of this is when we expect this to end and this is the plan. Once you get out of the motels, you are going to go here, you know, so that people have a full, you know, knowledge of what their whole plan is. Um, for the people, I know you're trying to tell us that it's this beautify plan. But for the people who are being beautified, they're, they say they're being swept. So they don't feel any prettier, they feel swept. Thank you. I, I wasn't done yet. I got cut off. So I where'd my time go? There's nobody's cut you okay. off. Okay, so um, the people, they just feel like they're being swept. Um, the other thing is, is that the people who are there, the camp under there, a lot of them are elder folks who are probably part of the 2,500 people who have been identified as vulnerable. So we'd really like to see it, sweat, uh, it pick up on getting the 25 most, 2,500 most vulnerable people into shelters and into hotels. We'd also like to see some action on sanctioned encampments right now, because during the pandemic, the CDC said that you shouldn't be moving people, you shouldn't be sweeping people because it would only increase the pandemic and the spread of COVID. So now is a perfect time to get off your butts and work on actual sanctioned encampments, which would save lives. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Um, the other thing is, is that right now, a lot of the stations that have the, the uh, temporary wash stations, they have not been kept up with enough water and enough cleaning supplies. And we'd like to see that. I don't believe that the second wave ever came in. I'm not totally positive on that, but I'm pretty sure it never came in. Uh, we were told that they couldn't find porta potties. I know that the uh, bathrooms have opened now at the parks, but it's still like we've got places where there's 39 people and there's one porta potty and one wash station. Um, and then obviously the folks over at Felipe, there's a hundred of them and there's one porta potty and one wash station. Uh, we'd also like to know what's the plan for the people at Felipe. When you put in those tiny homes, we all know that they're going to get swept because you don't want to have all that dirty people around for your big opening day. So we'd like to know what's the plan for the people at Felipe rather than just making them disappear. Thank you. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending uh, 5140, welcome. Yeah, I, I really think that, that uh, the city needs a, a better plan to just get businesses reopening and and money flowing into the into the public coffers this is going to be able to purchase all these things that are needed for homeless people and kids kids in the schools and it seems as if the priorities aren't straight you know i mean sweeping homeless camps is is great but where are they going to go they just go someplace else it's everywhere it's terrible there needs to be a city county state and federal program 
for a lot of these people who are mentally ill. It's terrible what's going on. And I, I, I've said this once, I'll say it again. Policing the picnic tables is not the answer. Citing people at the Rose Garden for wearing a mask is not the answer. You guys have your priorities all out of whack, and this is not going to stop the, the spread of COVID. And, 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 and for that matter, at the same time, how are you going to shut down the entire economy and then think you're going to have public treasure to spend? You're not. So the bottom line is the homeless people have to be quarantined. The people who are in, in, the, in the care homes have to be quarantined. You guys do not have a plan. It's just wearing a mask. That's all you guys have. You guys really need to focus on bread and butter issues, and, and, and you're not. The public treasury is not going to be there if you, if you decide to keep, to keep everybody down with masks and fining them and everything else. And by the way, non-mask wearing is over $1,000. Don't believe the park ranger who told you that hours ago. I've been listening to this whole program. That guy is a liar as is the people who say they have to obey the county rules. It's wrong, and you guys need to get your priorities straight. Or you're gonna, all of you on city council and sand, you're going to lose the election next time it comes around. And it's not going to be nice. It's going to... Thank you. All right, on item 3.10, is there a motion? So oh, moved. Second. I, I think I heard Council Member Foley first, uh, and I... I guess I'll take vice mayor for the second <laughs> on the motion. <laughs> Tony. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Bully? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Ricardo. Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. Item 5.1 is the Banana International uh, Marketing Strategy and Execution uh, Consultant Services Agreements. Uh, there's no presentation. I have a few questions if no one else does. Um, I'm not sure if John or someone else from the airport might be joining us. There's John. Hey, John. Um, Good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, hey, first, uh, great to see Liquid Agency is in the mix among the five uh, uh, companies. Nice to see a local company there um, and a good one. Uh, I guess I wanted to know how we think is best to keep whoever it is who's doing the marketing for us. How do we how do we keep them accountable for results? I mean, are there, are there OKRs or are there metrics or something so that we can all feel confident that whatever money we're investing in is actually going to get us something? <laughs> well, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, John Aiken, Director of Aviation, it, as we've discussed a couple times because we've done these marketing contracts before, it, it is difficult to correlate directly this advertising ran for a number of days and because of that 12 people bought tickets or 12 million people bought yeah. tickets to travel so it's difficult but we can judge impact uh, uh, hits to our website hits to the social media sites so we can track exposure to the message uh, but it's difficult to correlate that directly to uh, purchase activities of a ticket, but we can track the, the visualization, I guess, of the, of the marketing programs. Right. Like the number of clicks or appear, uh, of, uh, appearances and so forth. Is that, is that exactly? Right? Yeah. So I understand that's, that's output, not so much outcomes, but I understand it's something you can measure. Um, I guess, let me, let me just kind of go to where I, where I think I was going with this. I, I remember, whatever prior marketing consultant we had was pushing this message of go somewhere. I, I, I think that campaign might be wrapped up by now. Was that a couple of years ago, John? It's, it's still out there. It, we're looking to replace it with this, with this new uh, group of consultants, but yes, it still currently is running as the go somewhere uh, with the yellow background, the black writing. You probably okay. remember that. Got it. Yeah. Which seems to be kind of a, a leisure travel kind of focused 
message, I'm guessing, because let's face it, you travel for a business because you have to, not because you're just thinking of going somewhere, which, you know, struggling is kind of odd because I don't think that's really kind of our market unless, you know, we're just driving some flights to Hawaii or that's fine. But what, what I remember just, you know, as I was talking to an international airline about three or four years ago, I know I relayed this to you, around the time we were all just trying to figure out how do we help these airlines, the international flights stay here in San Jose. And they talked about what low market penetration we had around just basic awareness that San Jose had any international flights to any of the general destinations, Europe and Asia, where we clearly thought, you know, this was our critical path was getting those flights up and successful because we know it would drive so much more. And, and yet on NPR every night or every morning, I'd be hearing ads about Oakland with direct flights to Barcelona, Oakland direct flights to Madrid and, and Paris and just scratching my head saying, you know, I never hear or see a great presence that tells Silicon Valley that we've got an international airport with actual international destinations. And it seemed to be kind of reinforced by what I was hearing from this airline, which was saying, hey, we're struggling here because nobody knows that San Jose is a place you can go to get this flight. And so I'm just trying to marry that up with sort of the go somewhere notion, which again, it's, you know, for leisure travelers, I have no idea how effective that is, but I'm guessing not, you know, most leisure travelers will just pick whatever's cheap and local. Um, I, and so I'm, I'm hoping that if nothing else, we could even leverage the airlines themselves, if they're willing, if they're doing the surveys on their own to help us understand what people are seeing or not seeing out there in the in the public, and, and whether or not they see San Jose Mineta as a viable option, um, it would just be helpful if we had some kind of data to be able to tell the the marketing groups, yeah, this money is being well spent or not, and, and then we know whether we need to be be talking to somebody else, um, spending less on this group and spending more on someone else. Um, do we do any of that kind of stuff, any market surveys, or do we have any relationships with airlines that enable us to kind of peek at, at their data? Yeah, I think um, we we do look at that stuff, and we do work closely with our airline partners. Um, you you may not remember, but we have a, a new deputy for our marketing and communication section. He's been here almost, I guess, just under a year now. Um, and we're now getting a new set of marketing consultants to help with that, to drive a new marketing message. And so I think it's kind of uh, uh, starting with a new philosophy from, from that new deputy um, right. all the way through this program. And I think you're right. I think uh, exposure to the destinations that are available to us. I know we talked many times about on the international flights, the airline spending the money on the other end yeah. trying to uh, educate, you know, people in, in Great Britain or, or people in China where San Jose is on the map, right? It's location to Silicon Valley, to the San Francisco Bay, to the wine country, those kind of things. Uh, and, and so uh, we've spent that money on that end too, but you're right. We need to spend a certain amount of our funds locally to uh, make sure our customers in our catchment area realize the, the, the broad range of cities that we fly to. So I think you're on target. Um, that's where our new team wants to go. And, and hopefully that's where these new uh, consultants will, will help us get there. Well, thanks, John. I know you've got a heck of a challenge right now, given where the economy is. So appreciate that you're, you're, you're pushing hard. Uh, happy to support it. Um, is there a motion? So moved. So good. I see that we, we do have now three members of the public would like to speak. Uh, Tessa? Thank you very much. Um, basically, it's very disturbing to hear my, you know, my supposed representatives doing things that are so um, uh, terrible for our community. And, but that's where you know, you're serving the corporate masters and then to have you spending money and on this whole airport fandango, you know, and it will always disturb me when I saw the, the buses that said go somewhere that you're encouraging and I see it, you know, here it is, I'm listening to it, all the money that's going towards marketing and trying to get people to go somewhere. 
and you know you're supportive of it. We know that Mayor Licardo and all the other you know capitalists that have you know almost infected the whole entire council. You know, as we go towards, like Greta Thunberg says, who's a person of the year, but we're not listening to her. How dare you only think about economic growth when we have so many crises going? And how dare you, she says, and she pleads for us to listen to the science and nobody is listening to the science and we are going down the tube and, you know, we'll get there quickly. And, you know, and there, then we have a pandemic that is tied to our air travel. And you, you continue to go in that direction. And we have to start going in a different direction. We have to degrowth. That's the way we have to be. And we're not doing anything. And now they're saying six months. And what six months are saying is he's the environment. He was an energy, an international energy associate from Turkey. And he was telling us that we, if we don't change now, we won't be able to save humanity. Okay, this is what's happening and life on earth. And that we have to not go back to business as usual. We have to do the same thing that COVID-19 beautifully told us, which is to stay home. And that is the message that the universe is sending to us. And then for you to tell us another message is evil. And that's what I say, that there's evil, immoral, selfish, and greedy. That's how the people are. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number 5140. Well, it's real easy for your marketing. Find out where the flights, where the flights go out of San Jose. And it's real easy to call up KQED and, and have, you could even be the spokesperson if you want to do Sam as the mayor of San Jose, telling people where, where you can go to out of San Jose. And as for other markets, well, that's what the marketing department's for, to, to put ads in, in, in those markets. And you should be able to get some sort of, uh, of a spiff or, or seed money from the airline to, to give them to give them mention for, for you to give them mentions trust me you can do it and it's you you have to lean on your marketing people to do a good job because you know the typical thing with marketing is all they want to do is get back to you in two weeks well i mean you could call kqed yourself go have an interview on there and talk about how great the airline is or the airport is because you're going to have competition for people on the east side who want to leave out of oakland they're going to be able to get on fart real easy and have a direct a direct line there. So you better market that airport, or it's it's going to go kaput. At least for the people who live on that side of town who have great access to the new Bart line. So you, you're going to have to. Do, I, I tell you what, forget marketing. Just call KQED and tell them. I mean, you find out what the ads the ad the ads are in the morning and go for it. And 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 when you go to buy the ads, tell them you want to speak a little bit and have an interview. That's that's going to be your the the reason for you to, pur to purchase the ads if you have that kind of advertising budget. So, you know, it, it's good that you that you want to market, but you might just want to just do this yourself and not have to wait around for a marketing team to come up with some sort of solution. I, I don't think they are. And quite frankly, call the people in Oakland and tell them how, and ask them how they're doing it because they're doing a great job. You just said they were. Hey, great artists don't copy, they steal. Steal their ideas. Steal mm -hmm. their... They're, they're marketing. Robert, Aguirre. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this, this whole idea of marketing. Uh, I think one of the things that we have a cultural affairs department here in the city uh, should be promoting uh, the kinds of things that we have available here in San Jose, get tourism here. I know there's a lot of people from all around the world that come here because they want to take a picture themselves in front of eBay or Google or uh, Facebook or any other uh, high-tech companies, they want their picture uh, taken in front of these buildings. And that, that's a big attraction. And, and so are a lot of the other things that we have in our city, Winchester Mystery House, for example. And, there, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of things that we can promote San Jose. And the airlines have an interest in getting their ridership up. And they want to see the uh, airport become much more efficient. So they would be willing to chunk down some funds as long as their uh, airline is mentioned as, as a, uh, uh, a not a destination, but as, as a means for arriving at this destination. And the, all the places where we're telling people that they can go, well, there are people from those areas that would want to come here. And that's something I think we should promote uh, very strongly because we do have a uh, actually a robust economy here compared to a lot of areas uh, throughout the country and even around the world. And there are a lot of people that do want to travel here 
to be able to come and experience some of the things that we have here that make this such an attractive place. Uh, and, and I think as far as getting funds and uh, trying to put together a marketing uh, budget and, and do all this stuff, I think another thing we need to do is start looking at uh, uh, minorities, including women and uh, people of color that would actually help promote this and try to get their marketing input because we have people that we're not really addressing because we're coming at it from a different point of view. I mean, when you talk about going to Paris, you don't really think about the low income people going there, but you wanna have people wanna come here, whether they're low income or, or not, you wanna be able to get people uh, traveling in both directions because that's how funds are generated. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Blair? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, for to, 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 to simply offer a few words about the San Jose airport itself. Um, you know, we're in a, uh, with the new COVID-19 world that we're now in, you know, I, I'm sure you're, you're looking around figuring different deflationary models to follow, uh, you know, and different raises of income uh, of the economy that, that can happen also. Is there a way that the San Jose airport can address deflationary ideas and work towards, you know, airplane or airport prices, airplane prices that are that are cheaper than than and as, as cheap as I would I think they used to be, you know, way back in the 70s and 80s. Um, with the expansion of the SJ airport, I mean, it to me it was a very expensive airport, and it was it was comparable to San Francisco. And it was hard to find good deals at the San Jose airport, I felt. And, and you know, everybody always talks about how great Oakland can be. And, uh, you know, why can't we be more like Oakland and be funky? And, uh, you know, for all the ideas, uh, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, you, you had a bunch of ideas going around, uh, going around about how to, you know, the high rise expansion you know, maybe actually end international travel altogether. And, you know, there's just a bunch of crazy things going all around. And, um, I, you know, how to find, you, you were looking for your niche spot, you know, with the San Jose airport again. And I, I think, you know, to do that with, with lower prices, but to respect what Tessa said, you know, the, how the bug is traveling around, the COVID-19 bug itself, you know, that, makes for difficult questions, but in terms of how to address the economy, uh, you know, to deal in terms of deflationary models uh, can be important at this time in our lives, I feel. And uh, thank you, that's about it. Thank you. Uh, the phone number ending in the, oh, I'm sorry, Scott Largent. Uh, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. The screen's looking a little different, right? Here. Okay, there it is. There it is. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody. Scott Largent. Uh, you know, as, as far as the San Jose Airport, it was uh, my mom and stepdad, they have a place also in Austin, Texas. They were kind of quarantined and they were able to finally fly back into San Jose. I mean, it's, this has been, it's been months. So they wanted to get back to their place in Los Gatos. And what my mom's been doing to kind of in her spare time has been watching the videos I've been putting up online of the crash zone there at our airport. And so normally you kind of fly in, you always kind of look around, you'll see the Apple building, you'll see all these other different attractions, you see the Winchester Mystery House, the mall. Well, all my mom and stepdad looked at was, was the fact that it's a third world country flying into San Jose. Now, this is not just the green light right now to go gas all the homeless people out there because they really have nowhere to go. But we've been having fires out there, um, feces everywhere, garbage everywhere, chaos everywhere. It, it, it's, it's a war zone. Now, if we flew in and, and we could see like some sanctioned encampments, maybe some trailers lined up properly, maybe ones that were constructed properly, maintained properly, not like the ones up at Happy Hollow, that would be neat to see flying into San Jose. And then you'd be like, wow, you know, Santa Clara County, San Jose, they, they really care about their people. They really care about the underdog. But that's not when you see what you see now. You, you really don't. It is a war zone down there, okay? And that's what people see. That's our best foot forward in San Jose. 
why don't we start figuring out how to put in some sanctioned encampments, get on the phone with Robert Aguirre. He's got that stuff mapped out like you wouldn't even imagine. If I still own my electronics business, that guy would be the VP of sales in a heartbeat. Start getting the people that know what they're doing in place. Thank you. Yes, this is LA in District 6. Um, it was very interesting to hear those other individuals speak, but I have to tell you, it's such a weird transition to go from listening to all the kind of depressing things that are going on, and it is depressing, I must say, to listening to you talk about the San Jose International Airport. John talked about exposure, and I thought to myself, exposure to what? Um, it's it's an oddity when you talk about well now you know we're talking about travel and we want people to come into san jose so many people like at apple and facebook they're working from home people come here from other countries because they want to go to disneyland they want to see the mystery house they want to see apple but all we are hearing about and we can't help but hear about is our exposure to covid unless you deal with that and you deal with that first and you deal with your contracting and uh mayor Licardo, you did mention earlier that uh, just before the lunch break that you were going to be getting millions and millions of dollars and that you wanted to invest in the hotels and refurbish hotels and put people in hotels you need to work on those items first before you can even think about people really wanting to come and uh, and and scope out San Jose. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The phone number ending four nine six three. Yeah. Hi, Martha O'Connell. I'm going to be sending the council a bill for my consulting services for this suggestion. Uh, Sam, that's a joke. Uh, I have traveled to Vietnam six times to, to teach English, and I would love to be able to take a plane that goes uh, into South Korea and then transfers to, um, to Saigon or, or even a direct flight to Saigon, but there are no, there are no flights. And as you know, we have the, most, the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam, and I have many, many friends who go back at least once a year, sometimes twice, and they're going out of San Francisco. So I have never been able to figure out why when we have a population in those numbers, plus people like me that go over there to teach English, that we don't have flights to Vietnam. So I think that would, that would increase your traffic. And I'll put my uh, bill in the, in the mail to you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. All right, back to the council. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, Tony, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Amos? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 5.2 is an amendment to design build contract with Hensel Phelps. Move to approve. Second. No presentation. Uh, Tessa, is this specifically about the design build contract with Hensel Phelps? Oh, oh okay. I was I was trying to um, find the um, agenda, but uh, I couldn't hear it. You said it so quickly. I didn't hear what you said that the item was about. Yeah. What'd you say? Uh, it's the amendment to the design building contract with Hensel Phelps. What is that about? I'm not sure. Okay, so I guess I, I'm I'm not sure what that's about. So okay. maybe I don't have any comments. Right? Thanks. All right, back to the council. Uh, council member. Davis. Thank you. Um, I just have, well, my question for John is, um, why are we still building this garage right now? Well, council member, the, the garage is actually about 60% complete right now. And um, I believe that as traffic comes back, as you remember, we were in a parking situation um, in January and February. And so I think as traffic comes back, 
the garage will get utilized. Um, I think currently it's the best time to actually build it because I'm not displacing cars and, and, and customers. So I'm building it while the lots are empty or closer to empty. Um, but I, I still believe that in the next year or two, it will get utilized. And I think that it's still the right investment for the city. It's only 900 net new spaces. So it's not uh, a tremendously large garage, but I think it's the right move for us to continue down this road. So if we approve this today, when will the garage be complete? Uh, the garage is scheduled to be usable before the end of the calendar year. Uh, there may be a few punch list items that draw it into early next calendar year, but in the we were hoping for uh, before the end of this calendar year to have it substantially complete. Okay, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I don't I don't think you're going to need it at the end of this year. Um, I just I I had forgotten this was this was one that was already under construction. So can you um, let us know? Can you just be clear about exactly what we're approving today? Yeah, so basically there was money left in the in the budget appropriation that was not authorized to be spent by public works director. And so we're asking for that money to be usable. We're improving some customer service items on the on the garage, but I, I think it's it's important to realize this is staying within the original budget that we set for it um, over a year ago when we started this project. And if we did not approve this today, you could could you still finish the garage? It we could finish about some amenities. Yeah, we would finish the garage. Um, the elevators would not be um, the elevators that the city would would prefer, and there would only be there wouldn't be redundant elevators. So if you're on the fifth floor parked and an elevator goes down, there wouldn't be a redundant one to get you down. Normally you see at least two elevators together for that reason. So there's there's several things like that that are uh, customer service driven that is what's going on with this, this adjustment here. So it's 60% complete, but there, it has to be redesigned to include more elevators? No, the elevators bolt onto the outside of the structure. Oh, I they're know. outside elevators. Yeah, I should probably okay. let Matt answer more of that technical stuff. But technically, they're outside of the, the garage structure, and then the elevators sit on the outside, and you walk into the elevator, right, as you're, like as in you're Fort getting Street, into it. at the Fourth Street garage. Y yes. OK. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. I just, the reason I was asking is because, you know, it's not a trivial amount of money and a garage, a new garage right now sounds a lot less um, necessary than it did five months ago. And, and so I was just wondering why we were adding to the contract. I understand that it's, it's good to be in construction when, when, you know, before we need something and that we're not displacing cars right now. So that's great. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, if we didn't, if we didn't have this 4.7 million, if we didn't use this for the garage, what else could we use it for at the airport? Well, the money is is marked in this fund for the garage. I, I mean, it would come back to us as as cash in hand for um, capital projects, other capital projects. Well, it would it would be um, unrestricted cash in our books. That's where it came from, so it could be used for any airport purpose. The, the difficulty is when you're building something in a time like this and you're already building it and then you make choices, you sometimes, you know, two years from now, you'll wish, darn, I wish I had those extra elevators for customer service. And it's more difficult to add them then than it is to do the right thing the first time going through the project. So we're trying to build the right garage for the future. Um, and uh, I still, totally believe this is the right investment for us at this time. It's the right size garage. We went through these conversations last year about, is this the right garage, the right size? And I still honestly believe that it is the right, right garage for us. 
Okay, I, I understand. I just, I'm not as certain. Well, I know I asked you a lot of questions about this garage in the in the past and that this is, I think this is the garage that we had talked about there being uh, potential to to change some, if there, if it is not used for parking, that some of the um, floors are able to be used for offices and retrofitted for offices. Is that right? Is this is this that garage? Um, I believe that was our next garage. I don't believe this garage has the floor to ceiling height for um, conversion to office space. But additionally, this garage was placed on the lot in such a way that it could be used for employee parking, um, which remember we went through an issue with the employees being all the way over on the west side. This would allow for opportunities on how we placed it to be public or employee uh, so it's going to be able to be used in a couple different ways, which which helps its flexibility. Um, but I believe it was the next garage that we were talking about having floor to ceiling heights big enough to convert to office space if if TNCs took over the world and you know we didn't need as much parking at the airport. So I believe that was the next one. Okay, thank you. I I appreciate that. I just as we. Um, as we are still in a place where there is, you know, almost an inability to to fly many places, and we don't know how long it's going to be to do that. I, I that's why I'm questioning it because I we don't know how long it's going to take for people to start traveling again, and and I understand your your optimism, and I um, I think that's. I think it's great. I just don't know how long it's going to take to get back to the the kind of air travel that that we would need to to utilize all the parking that we have in addition to this this garage. So I, I appreciate your your perspective, John. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Pros. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I know we didn't show a map on this presentation, but um, to Councilmember Davis's questions. Uh, there were two locations for parking garages. One, which is the one that we're, we're discussing today over at the economy lot. And then the other one was the one that's uh, a little closer to the terminals uh, that we did talk about maybe, right? It, it should have a different use. So this one was, was, a, was a prior one. And in fact, this one will really help with, I know the issues that we've had with the employee parking over the last uh, several months. Uh, well, I guess prior to the, to, to the pandemic, before that for a couple months. Um, and so I do think there is a need for this. I would agree with you, though, that as we had discussed in our prior conversation, uh, as we get to the next garage, um, there may be even less of a need now for that one. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, John, I just want to follow up on the, I guess, the, the point of the question to Councilmember Davis. I know you've certainly, I'm sure you're looking at lots of projections, given how devastated this industry has been. Uh, through the pandemic. And, you know, plenty of smart economists are saying it may be five years before we see traffic levels like we saw five months ago. And I guess the question would be, if you knew that you weren't going to see those traffic levels for five mm -hmm. years, would you still want to invest this four plus million dollars, 4.7? Uh, I know it's contingency money mostly. It's basically money that's already allocated, but would you rather just take that back and have the money to be able to keep the wheels on at the airport? Um, pardon the, the mixed metaphor. Um, I think, you know, as we, a couple ideas on that, as we discussed a couple weeks ago in the, in the budget discussions, the airport actually is positioned fairly well for cash on hand and the CARES money. And so I feel, uh, comfortable continuing this process. Had we not started it prior to COVID, I'd probably be with you on the, you know, should we or shouldn't we do this? But now that we're 60% constructed, I want to make sure we build the right garage because adding these options after the fact, you know, two years from now when traffic gets back, I say, I really want this customer service item. I guarantee you it won't be $4 million. <laughs> it'll be significantly more than that to add it to an existing parking garage. So I think now that we're already invested in this, now that we're exposed to the garage, 
is the right time to build the garage that can serve us for the 20, 30 year lifespan of the garage. And I, I think you're, I think both you and Council Member Davis and Perales are all correct. I'm not gonna need it in December, but I'm gonna need it over the next couple years. I think by summer of 22, we'll be back where we were. I mean, that's me being a little more uh, aggressive than your economist that you were talking about. But I think, you know, it's uh, Silicon Valley uh, is gonna wanna travel. And I just have faith in the economy, faith in our community that uh, they're gonna wanna get out and utilize our facilities. So um, I'm, I'm keeping the positive approach. Thanks, John. Councilor Depp. Yes, sir. So um, thank you. I, I, I uh, agree that I think now is a good time to do this when we have low impact at the to ridership or travelers at the airport. Uh, might as well get out of the way. And, and I appreciate uh, John's long-term planning. I, I, I do believe we won't need it for some time. Uh, although I'm looking and I think Southwest just announced a, a 72 hour sale and out of San Jose in August, you can go to LA, Las Vegas, San Diego uh, for just $39 one way. So I don't, I don't know if people want to risk it, but if you fly out of San Jose, uh, you can you can do it. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, so if you're I, I kind of want to really have you, John. I wanted to ask you about something else, not just entirely related to this, but about the airport. Uh, I, I read in the journal that um, I think we're down at 3% relative uh, of travelers, just essential travel right now relative to this time last year, which is, uh, you know, remarkable. Uh, but we're also doing good because we, we haven't, you know, we're maintaining all the operations at the airport and, and all the concessionaires and everything uh, in large part because of the federal funding. Um, but I think that federal funding is, is slated to expire soon. So I was just curious, you know, um, what your thoughts, thoughts are on that in terms of if people don't come back before the federal funding runs out. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and get to, you had a couple points there, so I, hopefully I'll remember them. But we were down in April, we were down to about four or five percent of our normal traffic. We're now all the way up to about 10 percent of our prior traffic. So we've doubled, um, but it's still dramatically low. You're correct. We're still in a, in a situation, but the numbers are, are changing dramatically and in the right direction. So that's part of my positive approach that we will grow ourselves back out of this. The CARES money for the airport, unlike some of the other CARES money restrictions, we have um, four years to spend it. So um, it's not quite as tightly wound as some of the other CARES money that the city's getting and, and some of the other organizations. So we have a little more freedom to use it over time. And, and our current plan is to use about two thirds of it in FY21 and one third of it in FY22, just so you kind of understand the spending rate that we're anticipating on it. Okay, well, thank you. That that helps um, me understand it better. Um, great, I'll yield, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, John. What's the clawback on those numbers? Are those uh, dollars? I know ours is much more restricted in December of this year. Or, I'm sorry, not the clawback. I'm sorry, the the deadline you got to spend. The the what? The deadline when you need to. Oh, spend. deadline. Is, is four years from when they issued it in March or April. So it, I, I feel that we'll be done within um, a year and a half of that by, uh, by that next budget round, we'll be, we'll be done spending it. Um, mostly we're going to claim it for debt service. So we'll take a chunk of it this September when we make a debt service payment and we'll take the balance of it next fiscal year when we make our debt service payment again in, in the September timeframe would be what my guess is. So we'd be long within the, uh, the recovery time of the, of the money. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, Tony, we have a motion, don't we? Yes, we do. Okay. Let's vote. I'm sorry. It took me a while to unmute. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right. Um, 
Item uh, 5.3 is the delegation of authority to award pavement construction contracts. Motion to approve. Second. second. Motion from Council Member Camus and second Council Member Foley. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, the, the time to build these uh, parking structures is now. You might you probably have maybe more access to uh, workers. We're on the item involving pavement construction. This is pavement. Oh, okay. Well, uh, with, with pavement of construction, I mean, do as much construction as you can now, no matter where it is. Get it. The time is now to get it done. There's you're going to have available workers. If you have the budget, hey, it's the government. Spend it. Get it done. Build it and build it right. Take your time. You're not in a rush. Get, build what you need to get built for built for this city for whether whether it's infrastructure or roads or the airport or whatever you're going to have the access to the workers and i've been in meetings with with, with you sam and you, you've said that there's not enough workers to build a playground the time is now man get it done you you, you have the money look you've already stolen it from all of us i mean you know sales tax and fees and buys everything else hey it's out of my hands now. Spend it and do something with it and make the residents happy for better infrastructure projects. Get it done now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tessa? Okay, good. Well, I did want to thank um, Deb Davis for bringing up the issues about, you know, con being conservative about expanding our airport. Just to make that comment, I know it's off topic but I didn't get a chance to say that because you didn't really clarify when you're talking about the stupid garage. And if I would have known, I would have said something really much more about it, but I didn't have a chance. But I wanted to thank Deb Davis for really bringing up those issues about that we're not gonna be expanding. We shouldn't be expanding. We shouldn't be thinking about garages. And so we shouldn't be thinking about, um, you know, cars in general and economic growth and flying. So anyway, getting back to pavement, but thank you, Deb Davis, for bringing that up. Appreciate it. And um, uh, so I, um, uh, you know, just, okay, about the pavement issues. And, you know, there's been a lot of repaving in our Garden Alameda neighborhood, very nice. But the thing is, is that it's making our streets safe for bicycling and pedestrian. And that has not happened alongside of it. On, on even on our, our streets that intersect Stockton Avenue, there is no zebra striping. The zebra striping really articulates our crosswalk. They were put on the Alameda, very good, thank you very much, but where, where Sheely meets the Alameda, uh, but they're not put on Stockton and our streets are not really designed for safety like we need them to be. And the least we can do in terms of our repaving is to make sure that the zebra stripes are on the corners, on every intersect, you know, every, you know, intersection um, where the streets meet, the, you know, the main streets and the zebra striping is very important. Um, then also, you know, even on Stockton Avenue, we have a very high crown causing a lot of um, problems on our street. Those need to be really addressed. We need to bring the crowns down and that hasn't been done. And so really making it for pedestrian and uh, car safety because the cars are actually running off of our road because of the high crown. Thank you, Blair. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I wanted to compliment, I guess, Tessa and the person before who, uh, you know, uh, I was able to think from what they had said and it, it made me, uh, Want to speak on this issue as well <laughs> um yeah uh i um i'm interested in what can be good infrastructure ideas at this time um you know it, it's it's boring ideas but you know to to rely on and trust government infrastructure building could be a real good way to build the economy at this time uh the use of bonds to me seems like an interesting notion at this time um, you know, a, a, in, in theme with uh, deflationary ideas, you know, these are all, you know, real low cost things that can actually work to accomplish a lot. And uh, so this is just where my thinking is at. I don't know what's developing, but it's, it seems to be a way to, to, to develop things at this time. 
And with what Tessa says, a uh, thank you to uh, Councilperson uh, Davis, who, yeah, it was very nice that she said, you know, we don't have to make, you know, so much of a, an effort towards towards cars and parking garages at this time. And that's nice to hear. And uh, mass, mass transit is really taking a hit at this time and it hurts. And I, I hope that uh, mass transit we can, and whenever we'll be doing for the next few years, a uh, few years from now, mass transit can return. In these next few years, mass transit, we can rely on just, you know, our continual love and good practices we've created for mass transit to, to, to wait out this, this period we're in right now. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Foley. Okie dokie, thank you. Um, this is really exciting to have a transportation schedule of when our streets are going to be paved. Uh, this is one of the top questions we get from our community. When's my street going to be repaired? It hasn't been repaired for 30 years. When is it going to be fixed? And is it going to be stamped? Or what, what's going to be used to make it the best uh, street that it can be? So John Risto, thank you so much for bringing this forward. I'm so excited. A um, couple of questions for you, though, and, and you and I have talked about this, but I noticed the schedule is to do some of the paving in August. Mm -hmm. That's about when we're scheduled to go back to school, if we go back to school as normal. And so what is the plans for making sure that we're not paving around a school site or that we're not cutting off entrances to both to the school site if there is more than one? Thank you, John Russo, Director of Transportation. And it's really a good question, Council Member. And, and uh, if everyone remembers, last year we had a similar sized program that we had been working on. And we did actually have a couple of issues with regard to schools. So it was a big lesson learned to us to actually make sure that when we're coordinating and scheduling contractors in and around schools, that we keep them on the date that they had, had anticipated so that the school knows that. So we learned that lesson last year and we've been really diligent about when we get this happening again next this next summer uh, to be able to make sure that when we're at a school that the school knows the day that we're gonna be there and we stick to that the best we can and we're not gonna cut off multiple ways in and out of that school. Now we have to make sure that, uh, uh, that the schools are back in session. We'll be working with each one of the school superintendents on that, but it's a school by school uh, situation by situation, and that's why we have our inspectors out on each one of these projects trying to work with both contractor to make sure they're following our specifications to notify and then hold the schedule and um, working with the school district and the school superintendent to make sure that we're good with the date and the time frame around each one of the schools. So it is individual by individual, and it's not just schools. It can be other uh, organizations other op, uh, operational places as well. So we've got, we've got that going on all over the city. These are the last three contracts of another really big year. So uh, we will be working on that with each one of the council districts as well to get the word out. Well, and I know, uh, thank you, I appreciate that, John. And, and we're very interested in helping you push out information to our neighborhoods so that they make sure that they remove the cars from their streets so they can get their streets completely paved and not around the, the automobile. So please coordinate with each of the council districts on when you're gonna be out there so we can give a heads up to our community because they all want their streets to be paved, their potholes fixed. And this is, this is a sign that their tax dollars are going to work. Where they, where they want them to go and where they approve them to go. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And, and I know this has already been moved and seconded. So I'll just say that I will support it, obviously. Thank you, will do. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, all right, Tony, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Licardo? Aye. Okay, um, I just want to check in with my colleagues here. We've got three items by my count left. Um, we could be taking a break for dinner at this time. 
or we could plow through. And I just wanted to check uh, everyone's uh, tolerance here for plowing through uh, at this point. Uh, is anybody object to this? Let's just move move through these remaining items. I can plow through. Plow through. All right. So it's Dr. Dillon then. Here we go. All right. Okay, item off 5.4 is the retroactive approval of suspended parking operations and amendments of various parking agreements. On my count, left. Um, we could be taking a break for dinner at this time. Oh. We could please ask everyone to mute their mics. Thanks. Um, there's no presentation on this item. Uh, Move Tessa. approval. Please ask everyone to. Second. Okay, there was a motion from Councilmember Pross and a second, I believe, from Councilmember either Davis or Jimenez. I'm not sure who got Dick Davis. Okay. <laughs> um, Tessa, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Right. Okay, so we are looking at this parking rate schedule. Um, what, I'm not exactly sure all the details of it. However, anything about parking needs to have a lot of costs involved because there's so many costs involved in our cars and our parking. So these rates need to be exceedingly high if we even have any parking. We really shouldn't even have any parking downtown if that's where a lot of our master parking rate schedules usually are occurring. Um, it needs to be very high price for parking. And so that needs to be the, you know, the mantra going forward and you know, eliminating parking completely would be more, would be more in line with our need for what my husband, the biologist says, we're either going to have um, what he refers to as controlled demolition or uncontrolled demolition. And the uncontrolled demolition is coming as we are facing climate crisis. I mean, we're talking about the permafrost melting where you know this is really serious what's happening and it's out of, almost out of human control. You know, it, the, the nature is kicking in. It's called the tipping points are happening already. Many of our tipping points are already coming. So we, what we're doing is very critical as we try to move forward to create resiliency for the, the traumas that are coming. And, you know, having a, any parking should not even be in our, our dialogue. We need to stop thinking about cars and thinking about human life and how we're going to live without cars because we've done it before. And that's the only way we're gonna, you know, get through this bottleneck to survive as a species. So yeah, so if, if nothing else, the prices need to be ex extraordinary so that we discourage it. And, you know, we should have like they do in London and in New York City, you know, even coming into the city should be a big, big charge. Thank you. Uh, Blair, welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, to comment on Tessa's words, you know, she gave me a lot of inspiration uh, over the past year about uh, how to work with the issues of uh, automobiles and fossil fuel use, fossil fuel use, <laughs> I said it again, fossil fuel use, and, um, you know, how we've been in San Jose really trying to work out of uh, fracking and natural gas, you know, patterns, and, um, you know, it was really inspirational to me. I was really enjoying myself, you know, learning how to, you know, what really could be done at this time in the next few years in San Jose. And with the uh, COVID things, you know, my, I, my, I have to recalibrate, re-understand how to view the world on these issues. So thanks for Tessa's words, you know, and, you know, we're trying again what, what we can do. Um, you know, I, I, you know, another example, you know, my feelings about, uh, you know, ALPR technology and, and surveillance technology and, and how that data collection technology that's going to be used in uh, city parking lots these days. And the VTA, you know, they've developed a really good ALPR data collection system where they're, you know, uh, reducing their data collection from 180 days to 90 days and hopefully to 45 days. Now, this was all before COVID-19. So these were plans and promises and hopes and dreams. And, you know, I think things were in motion really well. And it was really interesting how it was, you know, this process that I'm always talking about, the democratic process of civil rights and civil protections was actually happening. And I think it's a very enjoyable thing. And I hope, you know, San Jose will want to emulate these examples and want to practice them in San Jose. And we can really reduce 
you know, an efficient, make it efficient uh, data collection for, for the APL, ALPRs. And Dev Davis should be interested in these subjects. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. And uh, Scott Nees. Welcome, Scott. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and members of the council, Scott Nees, San Jose Downtown Association. Whenever you talk about small businesses or the storefront economy, you're talking about parking, especially in downtown, which is the primary place in the city that we're charging for parking. Just wanna say that the quick reaction of the Department of Transportation to put free parking in place at the onset of the shelter in, in place, the beginning of COVID was a godsend, especially for our essential workers. I know our groundwork staff that was doing cleaning and disinfecting downtown really was grateful for the free parking. This proposal in front of you is full of creative, efficient, and equitable recommendations. It's really important to note that the free parking program that is being proposed here would do away with our 30-year-old validation program. No matter how much we promoted validations over the year to the merchants or the customers, there was always somebody who parked in the private parking garage who couldn't get validated and left frustrated. We're finally scrapping that program and we're putting a 90-minute free parking program in place that is going to save so much confusion and ambiguity. It's going to give us something to really promote. It's a fantastic improvement. We also think the merchant employee parking program for low uh, wage service workers is an excellent innovation. And we agree with giving the city manager flexibility to put the charges in place. Uh, you have a fantastic stellar leadership on the ground uh, in your Department of Transportation with parking division manager, Heather Hoshi, and the dapper parking manager, Arian Collin. So thank you to the whole team for putting this together and you have our support. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I, I would like to um, echo what Scott just said. I, I think it's very important that we have free parking downtown. Uh, one of the reasons is the uh, BTA does not really provide enough coverage throughout various parts of the city. And I know that uh, downtown is the primary area where they um, charge for parking, but people come from other areas of the city into the center city. And uh, since the bus system is not either as reliable as it could be, or running as frequently as it could be, or not as um, inviting, right now they only allow six people on the bus at one time. So the efficiency goes way out the window and uh, people have, are faced with either I take my chance on waiting for two or three buses to go by before I can get on, or I can take my car and go and park downtown somewhere and, and get my business taken care of. And most people don't want to sit around waiting all day for a bus in, in either direction or both directions in order to go and get something done in the downtown area. And a lot of the city um, functions and, and the county functions are all held in the downtown area whether they're closed right now or not, this is going to affect us going into the future. And I think the idea of, of allowing people to have uh, free parking uh, is, is uh, really the best way to go. I would say though, that once the, uh, the city hall opens up again, we start holding meetings in, in our, our old um, chambers that we continue to offer free parking for people that are attending these meetings as, as a, uh, a right to practice government and, and involvement in government. And I think that that should continue. Uh, I also believe that small businesses don't have the ability to have large parking lots like some of the large grocery stores and, and other businesses in the downtown area. And so therefore they require people to be able to park onto the streets to be able to utilize their businesses. And they are the people that are hit most uh, severely whenever there's something that uh, stops people from parking the streets, whether it's street improvements or things like COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending in 514. Yeah, keep, keep up with the free parking. And, you know, if we had Tessa's way, San Jose would end up like Cambodia with a pile of skulls. These kind, these kind of uh, measures trying to increase the parking rates is only going to make it worse for downtown. The downtown is a ghost town. I was there in 2019, the day after Thanksgiving, and it looked like Detroit 
in 1989. And you guys need to really increase not just the parking, but the mass transit, just everything. You need every, you need to have, you need to give the residents every reason to go downtown and spend money because the place is a ghost town. It looks like, I mean, it, I mean, it, it looks like I said, it was the pandemic before the pandemic. And don't listen to Tessa. She, she's, she's completely wrong on everything. She's a Marxist. She wants you to have to, to hitchhike to, to, to downtown on a, on, a, on a truck some, you know, that, that's a delivering rice and beans or something. She's crazy. I don't know how you guys listen to her and think she's so wonderful. Yeah, she's so so you're speaking to the council is not the time to be attacking another member of the public. Do you have anything more to say on these specific parking agreements? Yeah, I do. I, I think that you should keep free parking. You should keep free parking. Thank you, sir. Okay, Moto G, welcome. Uh, just a shout out to Tessa. Um, I agree that we should keep the free parking. Um, nobody's brought up people with disabilities. Um, it is very hard sometimes to find uh, disabled parking in some in certain lots. Um, I know that the county, I knew of that the uh, family courthouse isn't like operating um, like in full capacity, but somehow that place was built with no disabled parking within like a block of it. So Right now, having the uh, free parking is great all around downtown. Um, you guys know I haunt that place. And so it's great to be able to park. I agree with Robert, park in one spot and do what you have to do. Um, it's much harder when you have, um, when you have to pay for it. Um, even though I have a disabled parking placard, somehow SJPD or the uh, parking police like to still give me a ticket for parking in a space longer than two hours. Um, don't know how that's legal, uh, but somehow they do it. So it's just nice still uh, to combat them and still find other places to park downtown, be able to conduct your business um, rather than just driving people out of downtown. One of the reasons that I moved to San Jose initially was because I loved that it was kind of like this quaint downtown area inside of a really big downtown. Now it's got these horrible towers and stuff, and I kind of hate that part. But I still like the idea of that we have a solid downtown feel um, inside of a really big downtown, but a, a solid small downtown feel to some degree. And it's nice to be able to get around downtown and park in one space and get around and not have to hop around to keep changing meters or something like that. So please keep doing that. It's definitely a really nice thing, particularly for us protesters. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Returning to the council. There's a motion. Let's vote. Sorry, I double clicked. I muted and then unmuted. Um, Jimenez? Yes. Rawls? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Mayor Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8.1 is an extension of the eviction moratorium report on legislative updates at state and federal levels and rent stabilization program outreach. There is a presentation. Yes, we have a presentation and I'll go ahead and pull it up on the screen. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start while Rachel pulls up the presentation. Uh, my name is Jackie Morales Brand and I'm the director of the housing department. And as you see, I have Rachel Vanderveen, who's the deputy director of the housing department, who's here with me and the deputy city attorney, Chris Alexander. And we have a special guest, Leslie Carcelia, the director of Silicon Valley at home. Uh, we're here to give you an update on the eviction moratorium, um, and we're going to be giving you some information about legislation and some outreach that uh, Leslie did on our behalf. So as background to this, dis this discussion, I wanted to begin with an overview of the eviction moratorium. The moratorium prevents eviction for all tenants living in San Jose who have been impacted financially by COVID-19. 
The ordinance provides protections for tenants living in all types of rental housing, including single family homes, duplexes, condominiums, and apartment buildings. It also prohibits harassment or retaliation of affected tenants. The eviction moratorium includes a one year repayment period. Following the expiration of the eviction moratorium, the repayment period will begin. Affected tenants who accrued unpaid rent during the eviction moratorium will have six months to repay 50% of their past due rent. Affected tenants will have an additional six months to pay the remainder of their unpaid rent accrued during the eviction moratorium. San Jose's eviction moratorium currently expires at the end of this month. The county eviction moratorium was extended to July 28th based on the state's order, which is also extended to the same date of July 28th. As illustrated by the chart, if the city approves an extension of the moratorium till July 31st, it will better align with the recently updated county, state, and the federal eviction moratorium. The federal eviction moratorium is limited and provides some protections, well, it provides protections for residents of federally subsidized apartments and homes that are covered by federally backed mortgages. The approval of an extension until July 31 will continue to provide protect tenants affected by COVID-19 throughout the month of July. We also wanted to let the city council know that the city council may consider alternate dates for extending the eviction moratorium. As stated in the memo from council member Carrasco, the date may be extended to August 4th, providing protections through the July city council recess. The extension to August 4th will provide protections to tenants impacted by COVID-19 on August 1st, which is a typical date that rent must be paid. City Council may consider an additional extension at the regularly scheduled City Council meeting on August 4th. Uh, the City Council directed staff to review and update the Council on pending state and federal legislation that may mitigate the potential devastating impacts of COVID-19 for both renters and landlords. The California Legislature has proposed several me measures. The bills aim to generate sustainable funding streams to stabilize housing and prevent homelessness. I did want to note that the provision to provide assistance for landlords at 80% of the unpaid rent, which was highlighted in our memo, was removed. However, there is a bill that would provide a state tax credit over time. Um, additional measures include mitigating the consequences of COVID-19 for homeowners and providing renters with eviction protections. On the federal level, Congress has proposed several measures that seek to enhance protections to residents impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. After reviewing selected federal legislation related to housing, the two issues of focus are financial relief of rents and mortgages for impacted tenants and landlords and providing rental assistance to families and individuals at risk of homelessness. Um, the Housing Department has used many strategies to notify and educate landlords and tenants about the eviction moratorium, the rent stabilization program, um, and we focused on digital engagements in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Given our inability to con conduct outreach through the tradi traditional means of in-person community meetings, the rent stabilization program adapted and used other means of outreach, including posting in Spanish and Vietnamese informational videos e-blast, webinars, fact sheets and forms, and information on our website. What you see before you is a summary of the views for each video, separated by platform, whether it was a webinar on YouTube, Facebook, um, or Facebook. Note that the Facebook views are 10 se seconds or longer. Staff found that webinars and videos were the most successful in reaching the Vietnamese community. I would say upon reviewing these statistics that we are not satisfied with the outreach in the Spanish speaking nor English community, and we will need to do more uh, work to increase our efforts and outreach to, to both communities. I would now like to introduce Leslie again, who's the executive director of Silicon Valley at Home. 
The city council directed staff to consider a council led task force to initiate to initiate a convening of stakeholders representing landlords and tenants to explore alternative solutions to addressing the COVID-19 impacts. As an alternative to the task force, the city council accepted the housing department's recommendation that SV at home convene thought leaders in the housing industry to brainstorm about the challenges facing landlords, homeowners, and tenants. Leslie is here to provide a summary of her report. Uh, Leslie, I think we're, we're not hearing you right now. Let's see if I can. Uh, Henry says he's not able to see Leslie in the. In the chat, in the room? Yeah, in the room. Oh, I wonder side. if. Is she, she on oh, the wrong side? Right. No, she's not on the wrong side. Huh. Hmm. I could text her if you like. I'm texting her as well. <laughs> okay. I'll let you text her. Oh, wait, I just popped up. There she is. Ah, Let's here you are. Apologies. My video, of course, uh, went out right when it was about my time. So <laughs> I, I, assume, I assume I'm up. No, you just did Okay, great. Uh, so good evening. I, I think Jackie uh, let everyone know I'm Leslie Corsilia. I'm executive director of Silicon Valley at Home. And uh, pleased to be here today to talk to you about Uh, Leslie, I'm sorry. I think we're losing you. It may help if you turn off the video. Uh, Leslie, we're not hearing you at all. So we may have a connection problem. If you could try turning off your video, we may be able to hear your audio a little better. <clears throat> we're still not hearing you, Leslie. Okay. Um, Jackie, are you still there? I am still here. Okay. So I can just briefly review uh, just high level what uh, hmm. Leslie presented, unless she's, I'm not able to see everyone's face. Yeah, anymore. She rejoins us, we'll, we'll go back to her, but maybe you can summarize in the meantime. Sure. So um, they were able to um, convene both local representatives who, again, represented a broad group of stakeholders, and, and then SV at Home also reached out to regional leaders as well. And so some of the immediate and short-term recommendations include continued uh, funding for rental assistance, and as you know, the Housing Department has moved or will be moving close to $29 million in support of rental assistance in the city of San Jose and to increase our measures to protect the city's affordable housing stock. As for many of the people who are subject to or most vulnerable in our community, access to affordable housing is a huge priority. Um, again, to continue to identify funding uh, to respond to different gaps within the system. Next slide to increase funding for affordable housing, because again, uh, many of the tenants are in unstable housing uh, or risk uh, rent increases or again, inability to respond uh, because they're in market rate, um, unrestricted housing. Uh, also to remove barriers to development in order to take, to take advantage of opportunities that exist today and then finally, responding to segregation within our community. As you know, the overwhelming majority of zoning in the city of San Jose for residential is single family and therefore really prevents the uh, development of multifamily in the overwhelming parts of the city of San Jose. So with that, we will conclude our presentation. Okay, thanks, Jackie. And Leslie, I'm, I'm sorry if we've Lost you, but if you come on back, we'd be happy to continue the conversation. All right, uh, we'll come back now to the council and the community. Uh, Blair. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I hope uh, the woman you brought along tonight can come back. It'd be nice to hear her. Uh, as COVID-19 was slowly growing and developing, there were many other parallel ideas and plans of good practices growing alongside of it. 
I hope this can be a time to begin to practice some of those parallel good ideas based on human rights, civil rights, and a love of peace to work towards our better human ideals. And that can work to end war and long-term social planning based on hurting mass numbers of people as how to accomplish good human ideals. I'm thinking of fossil fuel use and renewable energy uh, practices uh, can be applicable at this time. We can still work towards good ideas in those areas. I hope we can support each other at this time as both owners and tenants have important needs that have to be answered. I hope local San Jose city government can let go and know how to facilitate openness for all sides at this time and how we can all be together and how to discuss the distribution of CARES Act money. We are currently staying, uh, staring directly at the uptight etiquettes that surround modern capitalism. The importance and direness of this issue needs to be considered as an everybody's in and no one's out philosophy and where no one will be hurt. The recent protests have possibly proven with much years of study and good practices, we all should be starting to make well-meaning long-term bureaucratic decisions more easily, openly, and quickly. The city of Berkeley can offer some very good examples to San Jose in, in waiting for rent forgiveness issues at this time. And if, in my final words here, I'd like the digital inclusion ideas. I hope all parts of the community can respect the intention and imagination of what recent protests can offer and what we can all learn at this time, how to have more open, honest conversations with each other. Although it is a stressful time, we are at a time to still create what can be a more positive shared process and what can be peace and better ideas of democracy at this time at the local level for the future sustainability of this earth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 4963, welcome. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell, Regional Manager for GSMOL, Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, representing Mobile Home Park residents. I support the Carrasco memo, which would extend the, morat the moratorium only by four days for your first meeting. I think it makes sense. I need to share with you that I am on conference calls nearly every single day all over the state of California with people who live in mobile homes. And they are reporting to me that people are not social distancing and they are not wearing masks. And why is this relevant to the Carrasco memo? Because I do believe that we are going to have another pandemic. I believe that the governor is probably going to rescind some of the opening of businesses. And that means people are not going to have income. People are not following the directives and this is going to have a huge impact. So I urge you to approve the Carrasco memo and extend it to August 4th so you can deal with it at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jesse O'Malley, so please. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. I am BTA's TOD manager. My name is Jesse O'Malley Solis, and our TOD portfolio is in prime position to assist in the COVID-19 economic recovery by providing development and local jobs in the form of transit-oriented development in the city of San Jose. A couple of other items that I think the city should be focused on during this time is how to better implement and provide further coordination between city departments to make sure that the entitlement processes run, run smoothly during this time, simplify development standards citywide, um, support and approve a commercial linkage fee, maintain the Silicon Valley um, at home affordable housing planner, move towards general plan hearings once a quarter versus once a year, and rethink retail requirements um, at the ground floor and think about ways to put in um, ground floor amenities for activation in this time of COVID-19. Uh, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Robert? Yeah, hey, Robert Aguirre. Uh, yeah, I would, I would like to uh, comment on some of the things that uh, Leslie would have commented on, and that is uh, about uh, segregation. And I think I, I spoke about this when we were talking about in lieu fees. In lieu fees allow the segregation to continue, and I think that's something we need to address. Uh, and so I think right now is an appropriate time to bring that up. 
also would like to talk about representation. I know that we have some people that are quite familiar with what's going on in the uh, building and development uh, and the housing uh, departments. And I think that's great that we had that representation, but I think we need also representation from people that are currently living in these uh, um, environments and these uh, apartment complexes and these uh, various uh, duplexes and fourplexes and so forth uh, to be able to come and talk about the uh, the barriers that they run across and the, and the uh, things that they see that could be improved upon when we do our planning uh, and not look at it just so much from an economic standpoint, but more of usability and how uh, people are uh, being treated when they try to get into some of these uh, these housing situations, including some of the new ones, uh, but especially some of the older ones, the apartments that are uh, much smaller in number of units and the difficulty in people getting housed into these units. And uh, again, even though we don't have a supposedly a source of income uh, prejudice, that it does continue to happen. Mm -hmm. And we do have uh, a lot of people that are uh, being targeted by uh, by bad landlords. And I know it goes on because I hear from people all the time telling me about situations of retaliation and, and they don't really know how to go about uh, approaching the, the uh, housing department to report some of these cases. And I, I direct people to the housing department, but I don't know how many of these people actually follow through with that. We need more information for people and outreach. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Yes, thank you. Um, Mayor, Council, um, staff from the Housing Department, this is Matthew Reed from Silicon Valley at home. Um, I don't know if it's possible. I would be glad to stay on if there are any questions. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties that Leslie's having. Um, but I was in the queue to uh, support the work that this council has done um, to get ahead of this crisis with the eviction moratorium. Um, we strongly support the move to extend it. Um, uh, that was introduced by Council Member Carrasco and, and presented as an option from Housing Department staff. Um, these are really difficult times. We know that it, it's going to be a challenge. People are hurting right now. Um, there are going to be waves and people are going to continue to hurt and new people are going to start to hurt. And we know that the more people we can keep housed, uh, the, the lower the social and economic cost to families in the city is going to be in the future. So we think this is a very important step. Um, we also know that although it's frustrating um, to try to figure out how to, how to get the word out that city staff and the housing department has really leaned in to trying to figure out how to share uh, rights and responsibilities with folks in the city. Um, this isn't gonna be over soon. The information that they've developed is gonna be able to be useful um, in the months ahead. And we're optimistic that their proactive efforts are gonna pay off. And so uh, we urge them to stick, stick with it and um, that you all continue to support them in their efforts. Um, again, if there are any questions about uh, the memo, I'd be, I'd be glad to answer them. I don't know if it's possible to keep me online. Uh, thanks, Matthew. We'll come back to you, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey. Mayor and Council, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of Working Partnerships USA, I uh, would like to support uh, Council Member Carrasco's memo uh, for all the reasons others have stated, um, as we're seeing an uptick uh, in uh, the spread of, of COVID in recent days. It, it just seems like smart practice to extend until after the July recess. Uh, so encourage uh, folks to, to make that consideration. Um, I think the, the work by SV at Home and by the Housing Department highlights a lot of the, the biggest problems uh, that we're still grappling with. Uh, certainly in terms of rent relief, we appreciate everything the city has done to date uh, to invest in that. Um, there's a, a memo before the rules committee that we would encourage, hopefully it makes it to council. And I know the housing department is looking at uh, what to do with the emergency solutions grant dollars uh, from that second round of funding from the CARES Act. We think that's an important opportunity to invest in rent relief for those who are most vulnerable. Uh, in terms of state and federal legislation, a lot of important things that can be done. Uh, SB 1410 that was referenced uh, 
the HEROES Act. Uh, we need to be both advocating for what, what, what it'll take to bring more resources to bring rent relief to tenants, but then thinking also as a city, how to prepare if those resources do come, do come forward. How do we, how do we plan for that? Uh, one area that, or two areas that uh, we're, we're not focused on uh, it, perhaps as much in the report that I, I would encourage council to consider uh, legal services and tenant education. Certainly it's really tough to communicate in this time for uh, particularly for low income tenants. Uh, there are gonna be confusion about what a landlord, what a landlord can do, what, what are our tenants rights. Uh, we know that there are thousands of families who do not have uh, the money to be able to pay for back rent. Come January of next year, we could see a real explosion uh, in eviction. So thinking about what we can do to support legal services for those who do end up facing an unlawful detainer. Lastly, uh, AB 1436, uh, an important piece of uh, uh, legislation that folks should consider thank around uh, protect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and, and City Council. And um, my name is Michael Trujillo. I'm a staff attorney at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. I'm speaking today to, to thank you all for your um, for proactively enacting the eviction moratorium, um, for extending it while this crisis continues, and to urge you to uh, adopt Council Member Carrasco's memo to extend the protections to August 4th so that Council has a chance to come back after its July recess and consider um, extending the moratorium through August. Uh, we think that um, you know the, the indications we've seen of, of the continued threat of the spread of, of COVID, um, whether it be a second wave or a continuation of what's a first wave, um, you know, means that the eviction moratorium is providing a critical public health protection right now. In addition, um, you know, it's protecting the most vulnerable members of our community and um, so repealing it prematurely would, would fall disproportionately on uh, those members of our community. At the Law Foundation, we've fielded over 1,400 calls since the coronavirus pandemic be began. And about two thirds of those folks uh, calling in were concerned about coronavirus and remaining housed are Latino. Another two thirds are women. So, um, you know, repealing this reduction prematurely would fall disproportionately on, on those groups. Also um, appreciate the city's efforts to do outreach and um, all the, the people they've reached so far, we're happy to partner with them as uh, they continue to um, uh, push out information about people's rights. Finally, I appreciate the analysis of state legislation and, and urge city council to do all it can to prioritize money that's coming in for rental assistance. And also look at bills like uh, AB 1436 that would address the underlying issue of the rent debt that tenants have accrued under the moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and, and City Council for allowing me to speak today. I wanted to address the legislation in front of you and the eviction moratorium that you'll be considering as well. As far as the uh, legislation that uh, was reported to you, I do have one change. Uh, 1410 is a bill that we are no longer sponsoring. I'm not sure if that was addressed in the report by housing. I'm sorry, I missed the update, but we are no longer uh, endorsing or we're no, we don't have no, we have no position on 1410 as it was changed dramatically recently. As far as uh, Assembly Bill AB828, um, we are in deep opposition to that. That bill would uh, force a 25% reduction in rents. It would take away additional rent owed by tenants requiring the courts to impair existing contractual obligations in violation of state and federal laws and mandate a rent reduction of 25 percent we just don't see this as a reasonable or feasible bill to uh, make any progress as far as 1436 this bill does not provide for nor is it tied to any funding to help tenants with landlords with the unpaid rent and essentially would there's no way for many rental property owners to keep their building from foreclosure if AB 1436 becomes law. As far as the eviction moratorium is concerned, I would really like to see council, housing staff provide the council with some metric they're using to determine when this moratorium will end. What we've seen is month after month of extensions without any clear uh, guidance or metrics to see when is this gonna be over. 
Um, so we would like to really understand when what the council will, will use to determine the extension or non-extension of the moratorium. So uh, with that, I want to thank you and uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Vince. Hey, Mary and Council, Vince Rocha with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And I just want to thank you and the staff for everything you are doing for our residents in this city uh, during this difficult time. I wanted to comment on a few of the issues represented in SV at Home's outreach letter um, based on the outreach they had done on this issue. I think we have the immediate term uh, crisis, which you are all dealing with. And then we have the long term issues that I want to a, congratulate the staff who's been working with uh, developers of affordable and uh, market rate housing to get those submissions done online. We wanna find ways to continue to house people because overcrowding in San Jose, it continues to be a problem. We are finding that COVID transmission uh, is more um, prevalent in neighborhoods and communities where housing overcrowding exists. So the more we can do to build uh, affordable housing and also uh, I heard earlier in the, uh, today the creative discussion around using state funds to purchase motels, rehabilitate them, and do all the things necessary to give people security and, and permanent housing. And so uh, I wanna commend you on everything you're doing and just weigh in that uh, based on the outreach SV at Home had done, that there's a lot of positive uh, solutions or ideas to pursue in there and that you continue to do so. Thanks. Thank you. Tessa? All right, good. Thank you so much. All right, great. Well, let's see. I wanted to thank you, Mayor Licardo, up front that you were like, not don't let people attack each other. Thank you very much for doing that. Appreciate that. That's so important. Thank you so much. Um, so um, what was I saying? Oh, well, I guess in terms of this COVID-19 um, in our moratorium, uh, the issues with our family is that we've been renting to somebody who was um, you know, pre COVID-19, we rented her, kept her out of homelessness. That was good. But then the issues came when COVID-19 hit and, and she is an essential worker, actually works for in-home supportive services. And the issue that I have to protect the landlords and protect co-living housing, you know, because that's where we're saying, you know, when you live more dense, you're more apt to spread disease. So how, the responsibilities of the tenants, you know, um, that yes, I don't have the issue that she's not paying rent, but the issue is that um, she is highly exposed and as an in-home supportive services worker and a protester and all the other things that she does. And so how do we create, you know, responsibilities on the part of the tenant to protect their co-living inhabitants and that I, I include that they should be required to take a COVID-19 test. They you know, should be able to report that to their co-living um, residents and these type of issues and also other issues that would help bring health and safety to our, our co-living environment that they should be able, they need to participate in that in you know, reasonable demands on health and safety. And so these are issues that, you know, representing the other side of it, which is you know, not the only the economic, but the health impacts that are exacerbated by us having to live, you know, with, you know, these, these scenarios and how the government can protect us from harm, so. Thank you. Returning to the council. Uh, can I ask a question here, Rick? Um, certainly I'm happy to support Councilmember Carrasco's memo, but why wouldn't we just continue this to a later date till, you know, the end of August or something like that? We know this, crisis isn't going to go away. Yeah, and I, and I think you can do that. I, you know, we've historically, we've tied it to the emergency. Uh, so you just approved on the um, four, what was it, three point, extending the declaration of emergency, proclamation of local emergency, 3.10, which runs 60 days from, from today. But there's nothing that says, I mean, there may be, it may make more sense to do it to the end of August anyway, because that covers the full month. So there's no, you know, question about if, if I didn't pay August rent, did I pay August rent? Because, you know, if you, if you end it on the 4th, I mean, it's really a policy call. You can do it on the 4th, that's workable, but you can okay. go as far as the 31st. I think I'd like to keep it within the, I think the, recommend, the recommendation is within the emergency period. 
uh, or closely there too. So if the emergency expires on August 23rd, um, I think you can go to August 31st without a problem. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you've got some flexibility. It's really a policy issue. Okay. Uh, well, Councilman Crosco, I appreciate your memo. I, sounds like you might have a little more freedom. Uh, would you like to jump in? Yeah, well, yes, that's that's great news. Uh, if we, uh, then I'd like to amend my my memo to August 31st. Uh, uh, if that's uh, if if that if that works out, and uh, and more than anything, this is really to give uh, our folks, of course, an opportunity to breathe easily in case anything happens while we're on recess. Uh, we don't think that uh, we're going to be uh, seeing clear skies anytime soon in terms of uh, COVID relief, and so that that's the fear. The fear is that we're not going to be in session. We're not going to be able to uh, convene. Uh, quickly enough in case uh, there's an emergency. So that's, in, in essence, that's the purpose of this uh, of this memo is to be able to give uh, those who, again, don't have any respite. Uh, I'd like to remind you uh, the findings that uh, that that spotlight really highlights based on uh, what San Jose State University came out with the the pain index. I, I just want to just highlight. The, the numbers that speak very clearly, 57% of Latinos, an average uh, of those very low income, make an average of $28,960,000. Uh, uh, and African-American uh, families make $40,886,000 in Silicon Valley, where 76,000 millionaire and billionaire folks uh, live and reside. Huge huge uh, difference, stark contrast. And I appreciate um, uh, Anil, uh, who was here uh, speaking on behalf of uh, those who are providing housing. We appreciate uh, all our landlords and I wanna make sure that we, we don't send them off into foreclosure. And I know that uh, Silicon Valley Strong with Jen Loving is doing a fantastic job of raising a, a great deal of funds so that people can pay their their rent, but it's, uh, we know that families are still struggling and they're having a very difficult time making ends meet, but so are our small businesses and they're, they're losing uh, business as uh, the SIP may, uh, remains in place. And these are small businesses as well. They knew it going into, um, into the business of uh, providing shelter. So, you know, we, we have to spread unfortunately, the pain that we're all experiencing. So it's by no means a punishment. It's just trying to find a way to uh, help everybody because we're all in it together. So I hope uh, my colleagues will support this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Kamis. Thank you, Mayor. And I hope you don't mind that I've left my video off because I don't want to um, um, be interrupted with, uh, with my Wi-Fi spottiness. I, I, I too, I'm very supportive of this and I understand the plight that many people have um, in our city and I, um, and I'm gonna be supporting this, this effort here, but I do want to understand, you know, what metrics is the housing department using to, to determine um, how long the moratorium is put into place and, um, I, for me, for me, I mean, I understand this from a slightly different perspective because I do have one property that I rent. It's an individual house. I don't own a whole lot. I just want to be clear about that. But, you know, um, how, how long, um, you know, if, if, if a tenant can't pay the bills and it, if they keep racking up, where this is not a rent forgiveness, this is a rent mor uh, eviction moratorium, you know, the bills keep racking up. And how long do we, uh, do we uh, hold the moratorium for, and what measurements are we using uh, to evaluate that? So this is Jackie again from the Housing Department, and so we have been talking to the Office of Economic Development regarding the impacts of COVID-19 and how it uh, frankly is impacting our economy. And one of the pieces of information that they said was very critical is that um, the biggest impact to our economy has to 
has to do with the shelter in place order and the prevention of people actually being able to go back to their jobs, especially in the income ranges that council member Carrasco mentioned, because that's where we have seen the greatest impact on people's abilities to work in terms of the number of jobs that have been lost. And so, um, and so the biggest impacts have been to people that have been like cleaners, house cleaners, although they're now able to come back, hair salons, waiters, retail workers. And as they've been waiting for their jobs to come back, they don't have an opportunity to move into any kind of new career path. And so it's made it just very difficult and challenging for people who are in these retail and leisure and hospital um, hospitality jobs where we've seen the biggest impacts. So um, I think really what we're looking at is the shelter in place order and how much of our economy is opening up in terms of thinking about when it would be, when we think it would make sense, but obviously it's a policy call, but for us it's looking at our lowest wage workers and knowing that they will have the the biggest challenge, obviously, and the moratorium basically says if you're back to work and you're no longer impacted, you, um, you know, it's really only people who are impacted by COVID-19 who should be not paying their rent. Uh, other people were always encouraging everyone else to pay their rent. So really the shelter in place is a driving factor for us. So, so just, the just the shelter in place, you're not analyzing, like I, I understand that, um, if people were taking statistics uh, about who's being affected, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but that that just just when the shelter in place ends is when in when you're well of, shelter in place, and then how our economy is opening up and people's jobs are coming back. Okay, so you're also measuring the economic outlooks. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I just want to get I just want to get a gauge of of what you're thinking about when you're making these recommendations. I also, um, you just said this, and I and I'm wondering, you know, so so I know that there's a there's a bad landlords, but there's also bad tenants tenants who have, uh, who have, jobs and are not being affected necessarily by COVID and just are using this moratorium not to pay their rent. What what um, levers or what? How does an owner of a uh, rental unit uh, evict somebody who? who does not have the, the um, who is not impacted by COVID-19, quite frankly, and, um, and it can pay the bill, but chooses not to. Sure, I'm going to start and then the city attorney's office can jump in if I somehow misstate, uh, which is that this, it would just be a normal eviction. So you would send the three-day demand notice, the tenant uh, would have an opportunity to respond, pay the rent, uh, within the three days or not. And if they fail to pay the rent and they fail to answer anything regarding COVID, you would take them to court. And the tenant would have to prove that they were COVID-19 impacted to get the protection. Otherwise, the protection does not exist for them. Uh, I, I don't know if Rick's going to chime in, but are you comfortable no, I mean, with that? That's exactly how it works as in a, what's called an affirmative defense to okay. the uh, eviction. I should also note that the courts have a, essentially a moratorium uh, on uh, evictions and the California Supreme Court or the Judicial Council has issued uh, orders back in April that um, uh, put off uh, courts issuing a summons for uh, uh, an unlawful detainer unless it's necessary to protect the public health. And so that's the cases where you might have, um, you know, a meth lab, or you might have criminal activity taking place on on the premises, uh, but but there's also a uh, an effective uh, we call it a moratorium, but it's not worded as such in, in, with the courts and when they'll hear and when and if they'll hear a case, and that is running. Uh, I believe it's 90 days after the governor's proclamation is over, so uh, there's going to be a backup. So, so, so let me understand this right. So if you, if you do have a bad uh, tenant and you're pretty sure that he is uh, or she is working the system, 
uh, not not necessarily out uh, uh, unemployed or affected by COVID, but just chooses not to pay, um, even if that even if the owner files the proper paperwork, they cannot evict this tenant for. You can't even go to court for three months is what I'm understanding well, a, from you. It's really a, that that's a question for the courts. As far as you're concerned tonight with our uh, with moratorium, it's, um, you know, it's essentially the tenant has to show that, yes, in fact, I was impacted by COVID-19. And it is a, that's the reason I can't make, make my rental payments. But, but does you know, the, the, courts, the courts are regulating themselves. They could rescind that rule as well. So. Right now, they're not hearing. There's, there's, they're not hearing unlawful detainer cases unless it's to preserve the public health. Okay, that, that you know, I mean, I, I don't know how that works. I, I just don't know. That this doesn't sound like uh, an owner with a bad tenant has much options at this point, uh, and. Anyway, I, I, so Jackie also mentioned that there was $29 million that we're gonna to go to rental assistance. And, uh, and is that rental assistance going to the owners directly or is that gonna be given to the tenant? So it really depends on the program that we're funding. All the programs that the city of San Jose is funding through federal and some of the state money requires that the rent be paid directly to the tenant. However, there are some programs that we're funding, and I believe it was the, with the City CARES Act money that is running through a separate program where the funding is being provided to tenants directly. Okay. So, so, so every funding goes directly to the tenant, because I think you just said... No, 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 no. The major, the overwhelming majority of programs that we are funding through the housing department, we are requiring that the funding um, be used to pay for rent, and so that fun, those funds must go directly to the landlord. Okay, because I, I don't think you said that, but, but I appreciate you right. clarif clarifying that. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for clarity in the next time. If, if we're being asked to extend the moratorium the next time, um, I'd like to have some, some real measurements because it is, um, it is going to, it is impacting our a smaller uh, mom and pop owners who can't afford to have no rent come in for three to six months while they're trying to legally uh, evict a tenant. And I think it's important for us to, um, help those who need the help. Uh, so in, in the future, if we're going to be um, asking for uh, extensions, um, I, I'd love to see like, you know, okay, it's not just the, um, the, well, I think shelter in place is a good, is a good measurement, but um, I'd love to see more statistics on how you make that decision uh, and, and, and more, you know, more, um, statistics and, and something something more hard fact factual than just just the shelter in place that's a great uh, feedback for us and we will absolutely start our next presentation with that information thank you so much for your efforts and appreciate all your hard work member Foley. thank you i think i ask this question every time uh it comes up that we're looking at extending the eviction moratorium on residential property and and I'm going to support the motion when it gets made if it if if it hasn't been made already but the question I always have is we we have an eviction on, or a moratorium on small business evictions too from commercial properties but that isn't included here is there any reason that we could not include it that could we not add this in to the motion to make sure that they align together because I'm, as council member Carrasco mentioned, small businesses are really important. And if they can be evicted right now, um, that would be a concern to me as well. We need to figure out a way to keep, keep the moratorium extended for commercial tenants as well, small business tenants. Yeah, and let me chime in on that. From a Brown Act standpoint, it hasn't been agendized. Um, so if I'm a member of the public, I think the conversations about residential uh, 
uh, evictions and not, I have no reason to think they're going to be talking about commercial evictions. So that you can't take that action tonight. You can direct staff to come back uh, contemplating uh, doing something like that. Uh, but um, right now, it's not on the agenda, so you can't take action on it. Is it too late to direct? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I opened up a can of worms that can't be discussed right now. So now is the time to request that staff come back. Can we come back by June 30th with, uh, or is it too late? Uh, because doesn't the moratorium end on commercial property at the end of this month? Uh, I think it's July 28th. I mean, the end of July. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's it, it tracks the county's, um, uh, the county's, uh, unless the county extends it. And that's July 28th. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the best you can do is, quite frankly, um, ask for the matter to be placed on next Tuesday's agenda and with all the way the sunshine waivers and see if the rules committee will accommodate. Okay, uh, so I have to do that at rules tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I was on mute that time. Council Member Yep. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to follow up on what Councilmember Foley was talking about. My my recollection says that we didn't actually pass one. We because of staff time uh, focusing on COVID, we just deferred to the county and said, "Yeah, we will do what the county does." So we actually don't have a moratorium on uh, for businesses in San Jose. We're just basically saying, "County, take care of it." Yeah, that's so why I reference. That's why I reference the county. It is we are following the county's lead on that. So I guess my basic point is even if short of council member Foley, uh, you know, asking us to draft one and implement one on the last meeting, we don't have one to extend, right? I was just going to say we, thank you. I appreciate we that. We don't have current, we don't have one have currently, but that doesn't mean you couldn't enact one. I mean, we That's just right. followed the county because it was simpler and it was really to save the staff some time. Sure. Okay. Nice one. Duplicative. Clarification on that. All yeah. right. Thank you, Rick. And of course, this is a great motion, and I appreciate Councilmember Carrasco's um, addition, and, and I will be supporting what's on the floor. Thanks. Thank you. I know that uh, Leslie has since re. I'm yeah. Leslie has reemerged. Is that right? I have, but I'm I'm nervous now. <laughs> okay. But I'm on. So we'll, we'll keep your video off just to make sure we got your audio. <laughs> I'm not sure how much you were able to hear, Leslie. Did you want to offer any supplemental information to the council this time? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Jackie went through it all. I didn't hear her presentation, but I, I did want to say that we, we did come up with a lot of different recommendations and we hope uh, that they were helpful to the city and that the city uh, will, will follow through with some of them. We're happy to continue to be a resource. And, and secondly, I, because this was done in a, in a fairly quick time frame, uh, we, we understand that more voices are needed. I really appreciate the comments from Robert Aguirre uh, because one of the groups that we do believe should be at the table are, are some of the, the people who are impacted uh, by, uh, by the COVID-19 and, and uh, the rental crisis. Uh, so our hope would be that we would continue to be able to have conversations uh, and, and bring, bring those ideas forward to the housing department. Okay. And just in terms of your own regional experience and what you're seeing going on with, you know, the governor's push to see how local governments can purchase more motels. Are there any particular strategies or insights that you know are working out there uh, to pry those things loose from <laughs> from hotel owners that we could utilize to really uh, expand inventory of housing for homeless? Well, I, one of the things that I think is a constraint uh, is that a lot of the hotels are small. And so uh, a lot of our nonprofit developers are not necessarily interested in them because their business model doesn't uh, include small projects. So I do think that that some of it is is really working with those developers to see where they may be able to uh, to have some economy of scale. Uh, and so we do have that as one of our recommendations is really uh, working with the affordable housing 
community, and I should say affordable housing community, not nonprofit, uh, working with the affordable housing community to try to see uh, what kind of product would work. Um, but as far as getting uh, owners to sell, that's one that we would need to look at and see who else might be having having success there. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate all that you're doing. Councilman Carrasco. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I had I had actually moved my my memo since uh, uh, Councilmember Foley had uh, had asked about it. Just wanted to make sure it was on the floor and had moved it with the 31st of August as the, as the deadline or the extension, I'm sorry. Second. Uh, the second from Vice Mayor, okay. Mayor, can I, can I chime in here? Yeah. Um, and this is for Council Member Foley or, or anybody else who wants to contemplate it. I was reminded that uh, commercial rent controls, uh, generally not legal in California, would, would change that was the governor's order uh, declaration of emergency, which um, suspended those rules. So right now the eviction moratorium for commercial uh, properties can't go beyond the state's uh, emergency declaration, which is July 28th. So whatever we do uh, would have to track, and it could only be go as far as whatever the state uh, declaration, uh, how, whatever that, goes and right now currently it's uh july 28th thank you for that i appreciate it okay any other comments councilman kroska you have your blue hand up i assume that's from before no that was it thank you all right let's vote then on councilman kroska's motion jimenez jimenez prowess yes aye Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Arenas? Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. I'm going back to Arenas. Okay, I'm marking is absent. Uh, yes. yes. Sorry. Thank you. All right, she's in there. Okay. Um, we're on then to item, uh, I believe the final item, we don't have a consent item, I don't think on 10.1, do we? Let me just confirm. We do 10, 10.1A. Oh, we do, forgive me. Okay, 10.1A, so on consent? Thank you. Okay, and this is the conforming rezoning conditional use permit, uh, the double tree. And uh, all right, uh, Alex Shore. Alex, you're on mute right now. There you go. Starting Alex, there the you go. We got you. Mayor, Mayor, point of order I think we need to vote on the consent item first. Yes, I'm calling Alex Shore on that consent item. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm for 10.2. Pardon me. All right. Very well. Thanks, Alex. We'll come right back to you. All right. Uh, on the consent item, then 10.1. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there anyone opposed to the consent item? I right, hearing none. That passes. We'll move on then to item 10.2, which is plan development rezoning and PD permit for real property located on the west side of Meridian Avenue, uh, north of West San Carlos Street. And I believe, Rosen, are you presenting? Yes, Mayor, I'm here to present just a few slides. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council, members of the public, Rosalind Huey, Director of the Department Department of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. The 259 Meridian Mixed Use Project implements the vision of the West San Carlos Urban Village Plan, which was approved by the City Council in May 2018. This is a 1.39 gross acre site located mid block on Meridian between Park Avenue and West San Carlos Street. 
The plan development rezoning and plan development permit allow a four to seven story mixed use building with 226 residential units, including 34 on site affordable housing units. 1400 square feet of commercial space is included on the ground floor of the project. And the project provides transportation demand management measures with the 45% reduction in parking that results in 162 parking spaces, 71 bicycle spaces, and 42 motorcycle spaces. The applicant has also committed to provide an on-site bike share program and a monthly stipend program for each occupant for ride share and bicycles. Two community meetings were held for the project uh, last year and key concerns that residents brought up include height and building massing, impacts to parking and traffic, and issues regarding privacy, noise, and shade and shadow impacts. The Planning Commission heard the item at its May 27th meeting and voted unanimously that the City Council approved the project uh, with a staff uh, deletion of condition number 36 M Roman numeral four regarding emergency access driveway, which per the fire department uh, determined was not necessary. I would like to acknowledge the several emails and comment letters from stakeholders and Catalyze SV that uh, the city has received in support of the project. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank the planning project manager, Tracy Tam, and staff in Public Works, Transportation, and Fire for their work on the project. Uh, and Mayor, I believe the applicant's uh, representative, Anthony Ho, is on the call for a presentation as well. Great. Thank you, Rosalind. All right. Then we'll hear first from the applicant. Welcome, Anthony. Hi. Hi. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Anthony Ho, representing LPMD Architects, the designer for the project. Uh, we will not make a separate presentation tonight. We just want to take this opportunity to thank staff for working with us for almost three years to make sure we comply with the urban village plan. And we thank them a lot. And uh, we're here to answer any question you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for bringing a great project to our city. All right, we'll go to uh, the community first. Uh, Alex Shore, welcome. Hey, Alex Shore here, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. We first evaluated this excellent project in 2018, and we want to thank Anthony Ho and Jerry Strangis for developing it and incorporating so many of our ideas for improvement. Like this city council, Catalyze SV wants more housing to be built, more people moving around outside of cars, and a lower environmental footprint. As you know, developers range on how forward thinking they are on these goals and how responsive they are to the community on achieving them. Strange's Properties has been both. So while only they can say what truly made them make these changes, I'll aim to be an accurate advocate here and say there's a high likelihood that Catalyze SV's long-term in-depth engagement on this project played a huge role on the quality project before you tonight. We count at least six improvements we called for that Strangis Properties made along the way. As far as we know, not one of them caused any delays in the project. A few examples. On affordable housing, we asked for 15% affordable housing to be built on site. A few weeks ago, they committed to that. On encouraging transit versus more car traffic, as Rosalind mentioned, they talked about the monthly mobility stipend for things like transit passes. On environmental sustainability, Strangis Properties increased the number of trees and adopted native landscaping. On vibrancy, they added public art and made the plaza a 24-hour space for the neighborhood. Tonight's project is the best example we've seen on what happens when community members and developers find consensus on designing the best projects possible. This is Catalyze SV's yes and approach. Today, we're seeing a simple conclusion about it. 
it works. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next up is Tessa. Good. Uh, the concern I have um, with this in my neighborhood on, um, on, on San Carlos and Meridian, which is close to our Garden Alameda neighborhood, is that, um, like, well, the one thing I'm concerned is the setbacks because that was something, um, I mean, I'm not that familiar with this project, but this was a project, you know, in terms of what happened at the corner of Meridian and, and Stockton where the neighbors really worked on it and asked for setbacks. And we never got that at the Chase building across from Safeway. And so it's like right there. And this, I've seen this with a lot of our developments is that there isn't any setbacks. So that's a concern. The other concern I have is the traffic in regards to, you know, they're saying, oh, they're gonna allow transit passes. That's not enough. And what we need again is government over business. And the thing is, is that we don't have the bus rapid transit on, um, on, on San Carlos, you know, and that's a mess. It's a mess on San Carlos. And even if they are taking the bus, it takes longer because we don't have separated bus lanes. Like we've decided, you know, like we've been trying to get with the El Camino. So it's like developing this intensity and increasing the intensity in our neighborhoods. And even if, you know, you're saying that, you know, we're throwing a, a fig leaf to say that they're going to take the transit when the transit is so slow because, the, you know, we don't have bus rapid transit, which we need on San Carlos as well as El Camino. And now with COVID-19, the kind of buses that we need because transit is becoming a problem in our community because of uh, COVID-19, we really need open air buses, electrified open air buses like they have, you know, trolleys, like the old trolley. And so that we keep the air flowing and we, you know, those kind of issues to make it, you know, bring transit as an acceptable way of getting around again. And, but we really need to make it move, especially when we have all this density coming and we're not doing anything for transit. And this is what we have to focus on first is transit first. Thank you, Tessa. Robert? Yeah, again, speaking, uh, I'd like to, Robert Aguirre, I'd like to say that um, I, I appreciate what Catalyze SB has been doing, not just to this project, but many projects across the, the city. Um, so I fully support them in every way. I'd also like to talk about um, the, the lack of parking. I think that's, that's probably a good thing because uh, there's already a number of very large developments apartment developments in that same neighborhood in that area and uh, all of them are uh, very tall very high uh, capacity high density housing units and if this unit is going to be built this development rather is going to go forward I think they should build it as high as they possibly can because that would increase the amount of density uh, also increase the number of units that would be available for uh, low and uh, extremely low very low income people which is something that we definitely need. Uh, again, we need to push forward the idea that we need to increase density, uh, increase uh, the, the number of people that are using public transportation. We need to increase the public transportation. And if anything, this might drive uh, better transportation uh, requirements from BTA if we have a lot more people that are willing to pay and ride on the, uh, on the uh, buses. And we can also increase the number of um, the uh, uh, 523, which is the express bus, so that we can carry people much faster. And until we actually start looking at this whole thing, the Bay Area as, as a one region, we're not going to ever solve the problem of transportation because we're going to just do little bits and pieces here and there. But the mass transit is something that needs to be looked at uh, at a much larger scale. That goes beyond what we're talking about right now, but uh, I just want to mention that, that we have a much bigger problem than we do on San Carlos uh, throughout the entire region. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Blair Beekman? All right, can you hear me? I sure can. Thank you. Uh, those were nice words by Robert Aguirre. Uh, this is Blair Beekman. Um, yeah, uh, I'm hopeful that mass transit issues can, can return in full swing in the next few years. And with that in mind, uh, you know, with um, with the the plans for the San Carlos Avenue area, um, it's very high income levels. It seems like it's very high brow at this time. They're really building it up in those terms. And I'm I'm, I'm guessing that affordable housing issues are you know 
like seventy and eighty thousand dollars. Um, is there a way to learn how to bring in a bit more uh, in the next few years, a bit more, you know, very low and low income housing, you know, in the thirty to fifty thousand dollar range? I think, you know, you, you have your established plans and, and to, to offer the very low income and low income uh, and extremely low and low and very low would bring ideas of a uh, just a bit more character and a bit more, uh, you know, real life <laughs> to the situation. I think I think we're trying to, you know, not separate ourselves so much anymore. And, you know, I hope I hope you can learn to address that. And you are addressing that. And I'm just I'm pretty much stating the obvious, hopefully, and just kind of just uh, you know, good ways we, we need to practice. And yeah, it's just important that the San Carlos area, it's being built up really expensively right now. And I, and I, and I wouldn't want that to lose its, its an original character. And, you know, for, to, to invite different income levels is important. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Okay, we're gonna bring it back to council and uh, council member Davis. Thank you. I just want to address the, the last comment. Um, there are a number of active projects on the San Carlos corridor, and they are definitely uh, mixed income all the way from extremely low income to market rate, and including this project, which is uh, has 15% on-site affordable. So with that, I will move approval of this project. Second. Motion second. Uh, any other comments? Congratulations, Councilmember Davis. It'd be a great addition to the uh, to that quarter, which is quickly becoming very vibrant. All right, let's vote on that motion. Menez? Yes. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Arenas? Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Hamas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you, Arun. We're on open forum. Tessa? Okay, thank you so much. Well, like we heard in the last development, they were talking about like it took three years. And so what we're having trouble with in our neighborhood right now is development at 615 Stockton Avenue. And we came to council because our neighborhood was up in arms with the general plan um, change in our community. And the thing is, is that our general, the, the original plan for the west side of Stockton, as witnessed by our home, which is, was originally a bar, was to go residential. And that, that was the general plan up until 2010. Well, after that, it changed for economic growth for the city and without notification of our community. And this has been a real problem that when you're doing these general plan changes, it shouldn't just be meetings that are held behind closed doors. You have to go on the website and, and all these things. The neighbors that are affected by it should be carded. We need to get a card in the mail and explain, how would you feel having 25 stories across from your home? Or how would you feel having a five-story hotel? And the, these were not brought to us. So now we're having to deal with this owner of this property who now is going to live in the beautiful Victorian, he too wants to be housing next to him. But it can take many years. And based on a lot of the abuse that has happened to this developer, you know, asking him to pay $60,000 to get a hotel contract right before we had it, you know, going to council to deny the hotel. So we really need to move quickly based on our housing crisis and make adapt adaptations to move this property to be housing because that's what our neighborhood wants. We're a historic neighborhood. And then the other issue we're looking at is moving historic homes from Autumn Street onto this property. But all of these things need to be moved quickly to address our housing crisis and to address the issues with this development to create um, a livable community. And that's what I would like in our community is for this to be an example of a very eco village. Mr. Beekman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I hope this summer and fall, everyday people and city government can have simple, honest conversations, trust each other, and want to work together. 
With all the years of study and good practices, we should be open in important new concepts around policing and community, and that good community ideas can be easier and quicker to understand and develop. Our respect and love of the US democratic process can remain the same and constant in learning new concepts of care and better reasoning at the local community level. We are taking our first steps in how to better address and to end the future of war, the military industrial complex and long-term social planning needs based on disaster capitalism. And that more holistic ideas for local communities and ideas of peace can become important examples to the future of this earth. Thank you for the meeting today. Um, you know, I hope my accountability ideas can, uh, you know, with technology can really take root with the community and everybody will want to like address them. It'll be part of the future of how to address, you know, demilitarization issues in San Jose. That is a, it's a balance and I think it can be done with, with asking for good public policy ideas. It has to be a stronger demand for that, I feel. Um, with however much time I have left here, I have 37 seconds. I wanted to quickly offer that it sounds like you worked out a plan today for your council meetings to each uh, council person can have 15 minutes to speak. Uh, I feel that's a good idea. I wanted to add the addition that if they wanted to uh, speak uh, further than 15 minutes that you can have a motion process uh, and ask for an extra five minutes for each 15 minutes, uh, you know, for, for the 15 minutes, uh, an additional five minutes uh, after that in a motion process. And uh, that's about all. And um, thank you for the meeting today. Thank you. Eric Dill. Thank you. On behalf of Santa Clara Unified School District, I want to thank Mayor Licardo and Council Member Diep for responding to our superintendent and board members recently regarding the imposition of an inapplicable fee. As the mayor and council know, the district is building three new schools to serve the children in North San Jose. Just as you decided earlier in this meeting to build a parking garage for when the travelers come back, we're building three new schools in San Jose for when the kids come back. As part of our environmental impact study, the district committed to spending millions of dollars to improve the traffic conditions near the school, including lane widening, stoplight, and intersection improvements. Now the city appears to be holding up our interagency permit by attempting to charge a traffic impact fee on top of improvements we agreed to make when it did not require it of us during the CEQA process. When the city chose not to challenge our EIR, the window for the city to impose additional traffic mitigation strategies uh, closed. Under Also under your North San Jose development policy, the traffic impact fee is only applicable to residential and industrial building permits. We're a public agency like you, and uh, we are not requesting a building permit. If we're forced, forced to pay this fee, our district will be unable to upgrade our school facilities in a way that we promised our taxpayers. We're reaching out to, your, to you uh, to ask for the same stability that you recently provided to San Jose's development community as inapplicable and unnecessary fees have dire consequences in our ability to serve children. We look forward to the city staff responding to our request as soon as possible so we can break ground by July 3rd on these vital traffic improvements that the district committed to perform for the people of San Jose. If we're not allowed to begin breaking ground, this entire project is jeopardized. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I'd like to... Um... Uh, point out that we, we still have a lot of issues that we need to be talking about. Uh, for example, the trailers that were over at uh, Kelly Park, we should probably be working together with the state and the county to try to find a property where they can be moved and people can continue living in them. I think it was a great expense. It was made to, uh, was meant to last a lot longer than, than the time that it's been there uh, and for people to be able to take advantage of that. Um, and um, also like to push forward on the uh, the idea that, that I have pushed forward many times on the idea of sanctioned encampments and would like to open up discussion about how that could happen and how uh, beneficial it would be, not just to the unhoused community, but to the house community as well, and the city of San Jose in general. I think we need to uh, start looking at these um, as, as possible solutions to our major problem that existed prior to COVID-19 that had become perhaps more obvious during COVID-19 and will continue to exist long after COVID-19 
unless we start planning on how to handle that, that particular situation. I know we're spending a lot of money on uh, the police department and, and that's in preparation in case something happens that they're prepared to be able to handle it. Well, we have a situation that exists right now and we have done uh, in, in retrospect very little to try to resolve this problem. And um, I, I know I speak about this often and I know you probably, I don't know if you're tired of hearing about it or I don't know if you just don't know what to do about it, but there's certainly things that we need to have. We need to have open discussion about it. And we also need to have representation in the government from the people from the unhoused community. Uh, for far too long, decisions have been made for them, not by them. Um, and they are the ones that are directly affected. I think they definitely need to have a voice in what's going on in our government. Uh, just like anyone else can call in, it makes it very difficult for them to be able to do that. And we need to have a voice on uh, council or a voice on um, a committee of some sort so that they can uh, contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Stella Kemp. Good evening, uh, Council, uh, Mayor Licardo. Uh, I'm Stella Kemp, Superintendent of the Santa Clara Unified School District. I'd like to read into the record the uh, letter that I sent to the mayor, and I want to uh, thank him for responding to me. For years, our district has been working in close coordination with the City of Santa, the San Jose's Department of Public Works in preparation for street improvements related to the construction of three new schools on Zanker Road. Recently, the city has informed us that the only way by which our district will be able to begin building is through the finalization of an interagency revocable encroachment permit and a $6 million payment of traffic impact fees. As a district, we are prepared to sign the final draft of the encroachment permit immediately. However, in relation to the $6 million traffic impact fees, we have very strong objections. These fees are not applicable to a public agency, even if the underlying zoning of the area is industrial. I understand that the city of San Jose is in deep financial constraints, and, but to seek relief uh, from these constraints at the expense of public school district, its taxpayers and its children is problematic as we too are financially impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. If we are forced to pay the inapplicable fee, our district will not be able to upgrade our school facilities in a way we promised to our taxpayers. In the era of COVID-19, these upgrades are of crucial importance as our district schools throughout California are seeking to modify physical specifications of their facilities to keep their students safe and staff safe. Also wanna further state that as much as this letter is about your intervention, it is equally about our disappointment of the fact that a $6 million fee is being introduced as a condition to a public school district. As a public agency, we are seeking the same economic stability you provided to San Jose's development community as unexpected fees have dire consequences on our settings. I thank you for your time and uh, wish you guys the best and hope that we can meet soon to resolve the situation. We'd like to open. Uh-oh, we just lose. Superintendent, if you can hear us, I'm sorry that uh, we seem to have lost you. I'm, I'm and Okay, there we go, you're, you're back me. now. We lost you in the last sentence, I think, as you're wrapping up. <laughs> My apologies. Would you like for me to say the last sentence? Sure, yeah, if, if you're, yeah, that'd be fine. It is our hope that you intervene as we must begin groundbreaking on these vital traffic improvements that our district's committed to performing by July 3rd, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Look forward to communicating on this. Uh, the person at the phone number ending on 1367. Yes, this is Lillian, District 7, excuse me, District 6, Deb Davis. Um, the housing authority and the people in the housing department came on again and they said they did not have enough rooms. Uh, we talked about that approximately maybe a few weeks ago. Um, and they stated that uh, the, the small nonprofits only wanted to deal with bigger hotels or motels. Once again, we're back to that issue of housing people and how do we do that? Um, you could have an ad hoc committee. Uh, I would nominate Deb Davis. She is chair of finance. She has a degree in economics. She represents my district. She serves on the smart cities innovation. Um, and she's a liaison to the emergency uh, area council. You really need to have somebody on a committee who can oversee the millions of dollars that are going to come in um, with the CARES bills and some of those 
other bills that are going to be passed that can deal with some of these issues. Uh, we do not need another fiasco like we just had recently. It puts a really, really bad mark on the city of San Jose with the homeless and uh, what happened recently. When you're going to have um, millions of dollars come in, you need to have oversight so that doesn't happen again. And the other thing I just want to state is for Ms. Carrasco, uh, Councilman Carrasco, good luck on your commission of uh, equality and equity. I can't wait to see what happens with that, and I'd love to have input on that. Thank you. Thank you. Amro Gonzalez. Mayor Licardo and uh, council members, as you've heard from our CBO and our uh, superintendent, Santa Clara Unified is building three new schools there in North San Jose to uh, meet the needs of our, of our students there in North San Jose and El Viso. And in doing that, um, this project has been in the works for more than a dozen years, and uh, even before I got on the board. And uh, as far as uh, the work that we've done together, at times we've been at odds with Belarus is trying to be passed and other things, but I think now we're working con in conjunction with, with you all and um, it just seems that with these uh, fees that are trying to be imposed on us, um, we just re really want to, to make sure that the students there in North San Jose have the opportunities, the educational opportunities that they require. And um, these fees that uh, are being imposed on us are not things that would be even under our, our purview and uh, definitely want you to help us address those fees. Um, obviously, we're gonna have to make a mitigation uh, to the uh, road there to make sure that the, the traffic and those those issues are uh, are well in order with the school being there and the uh, the number of students that are going to be attending the school, but we definitely need uh, the city council and you, uh, uh, Mayor Licardo, to help us with those mitigation fees because uh, the six million dollars is just uh, an astronomical fee that we had not entailed and is not part of our budget, and um, obviously for for reasons of. Uh, of those capital improvements that we're going to be making to the street already, we feel that we've already uh, will be addressing the the issues that the school is going to be causing. So, definitely, you know, I'm glad that you're uh, going to be having a conversation with our uh, our staff and our superintendent, and uh, hopefully, we can uh, find a uh, a positive, meaningful solution for the students there. And uh, you know, those students that are there that are attending middle and high schools are having to be bused across the district to the other side of Santa Clara, and uh, these schools are going to be uh, right at their footsteps to help them, uh, you know, meet a, a world that uh, is gonna ha have them uh, need to have all the education and, and the resources that they can have. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Look forward to, to working with your team. Uh, thank you everyone, the meeting's adjourned.